provinces in Canada abide by the law. In this uh, case, yes, we're talking about a prosecution. The line around, you know, big corporations, for example. How, what, what is the support on this leader? Well, really, what this what this scandal really points to is an ongoing trend that we've seen with this government. In this case, this government met with lobbyists and then changed laws to help executives at a massive, powerful corporation. A corporation, mind you, that has deep ties to the Liberal Party. In addition, we've seen similar actions when it comes to the pharmaceutical company. This government promised to make simple changes that could have saved Canadians up to 20% on the cost of medication, but after hundreds of meetings with pharmaceutical company lobbyists, they abandoned that commitment. Another example of this government working for the powerful, the well-connected, instead of everyday Canadians. So this scandal is an example of another proof point of this government working for those who are powerful and well-connected instead of everyday You're Canadians. You're listening to Jagmeet Singh, the leader of the NDP, but this is a live look inside the Justice Committee's room. You can see that the former Justice Minister, Jody Wilson-Raybould, has taken her seat. We are awaiting her testimony uh, before like the Justice Committee. A uh, lot of media attention. Obviously, you can see the room is packed. Uh, we are expecting Ms. Wilson-Raybould to give a 30-minute opening statement, which is quite a bit longer than normally at a committee like this. You'd normally get somewhere between 5 and 10 minutes. She asked in a letter to the chair a few days ago if she could deliver that 30-minute opening statement. And then she said also that she would stay as long as necessary to take as many questions as members of the committee wanted to ask. There's a little bit of uh, variance, a little bit of uh, unpredictability about how long that will take. I think there's about two hours scheduled for the entire committee meeting. But there could, if, if opposition members want to ask for more time, they can do so. They can introduce a motion and it would then, uh, there would have to be a vote and, and things along that line. But, uh, but at this point, we expect her to take questions for at least an hour after her testimony. Some members of the committee have taken their seats as well. I think before she sat down, Ms. Wilson-Raybould shook hands with uh, Lisa Wright, uh, one of the conservative MPs who sits on the committee. Uh, and we're just waiting for for people to take their seat. Once again, the, the matter at hand is allegations that first came to light uh, back in the beginning of February through the Globe and Mail's reporting that Jody Wilson-Raybould, as Justice Minister, fell under heavy pressure, and once again, it's just an allegation, fell under heavy pressure from officials in the Prime Minister's office to intervene in a criminal case against SNC-Lavalin. SNC-Lavalin is a big engineering and construction firm that's based in Quebec, headquartered in Quebec, but employs about 9,000 <clears throat> Canadians. The allegation is that she was pressured to intervene to uh, to encourage the director of public prosecution to pursue what's known as a DPA, a deferred prosecution agreement. It's kind of like a plea bargain. It allows the company to avoid criminal prosecution. There she is talking to NDP MP Charlie Angus. Um, it, it allows the company to avoid prosecution and instead either pay a big fine or um, show that they've made changes in accordance with what they're being charged with. And they then avoid the criminal charges and they're also allowed to uh, to then continue bidding on federal infrastructure projects. What we've heard so far has largely been from the Prime Minister's point of view, from people in the Prime Minister's office, uh, including the Prime Minister, who has at many times said that he did not direct Ms. Wilson-Raybould to do anything in this matter. Uh, he has insisted that if she felt that she was under that pressure, she had an obligation to raise the issue with him. We've also heard from Michael Wernick, the clerk of the Privy Council, basically the top public servant in this country, who testified last week in a, in a lengthy and... Uh, uh, unique testimony about uh, his involvement in all of this, a series of meetings that he had both with the Prime Minister, a call that he made uh, to Ms. Wilson-Raybould in December, months after the decision not to pursue a DPA was made by the Director of Public Prosecution. In that call, he said he raised the fact that there would be consequences for the company, for jobs, for Canadian jobs, and that there was concern among uh, members of, of, uh, of the government about those potential consequences. That has been the focus point ever since uh, for a lot of members of opposition, for a lot of critics of the government who are trying to get to the bottom of whether or not any kind of pressure 
heavy pressure, undue pressure, inappropriate pressure was applied to the minister. That timeline in and of itself has led many to speculate that that was a form of pressure, that because it that call occurred after the initial decision was made by the director of public prosecutions, after Jody Wilson-Raybould said that she did not want to pursue another course, that she did not want to uh, intervene and have the director of public prosecution reverse that decision, that because the call from Michael Wernick happened two months after that, it could constitute pressure. Of course, members of the government, and there's Anthony Housefather, the chair of the committee, speaking to Ms. Jody Wilson-Raybould right now. Uh, members of the government have uh, defended the government and Michael Wernick and the prime minister's interactions with her and said that they are simply uh, worried about protecting those 9,000 Canadian jobs and that pursuing the, the DPA could have uh, could have amounted to that kind of protection. And they have insisted that no inappropriate pressure was applied. Right, Chris? I think you summed it up really well. It's been a very layered, uh, complex uh, discussion around uh, what that means, about what, what does cabinet, well, first of all, we waive cabinet covenants and waive solicitor general or solicitor client privilege, uh, something we haven't heard before. The, the, the clerk of the Privy Council, although does appear before committee gave a, a, a performance I think most people hadn't expected, a full-throated defense of, uh, of the Prime Minister's position, that there was no uh, undue influence or pressure being applied uh, in any of the conversations that were uh, took place with Jody Wilson-Raybould after the decision of the Department of Public Prosecution uh, not to allow uh, SNC-Lavalin to take part in one of these deferred prosecution agreements. And, and as you pointed out, we haven't really heard from Jody Wilson-Raybould, which is why there is so much attention being paid to this appearance. Um, she is warning that she she may not be able to answer everything because her time as Veterans Affairs and why she resigned may not be covered uh, by this waiver that the Prime Minister and Cabinet uh, gave. Uh, even so, it, it is really a, a critical moment, I think, because of the politics behind this, uh, because of who she is, uh, because this is an election year, because it involves a company in Quebec that's very iconic and very large and has an outsized influence on the economy of that province. There's lots to dig away at here because of this, uh, this particular controversy, and we're just waiting to hear what she has to say. Yeah, I I think the symbolism of the shot is really impressive here. Often when people go to committee, uh, particularly on contentious issues, they have people sitting up there with them. Yeah. There's, no There's no Thomas Cromwell, yeah. her attorney, the former Supreme Court justice, probably a couple of staff people behind her. But to me, it reinforces the message of somebody who is strong, somebody who is confident in what she's about to say, and somebody who can uh, offer a compelling narrative. So much of this stuff is about how you look when you present, I think she's starting the right way with this little bit of symbolism. And we see that many, I think many of the committee members have taken their seat. What usually happens here is uh, the media has a chance to, they're kind of moving around. Okay, we're going to take you right to the committee right now. It's like beginning. Let's take a listen. Today, the Honorable Jody Wilson-Raybould, our colleague from Vancouver Granville, who has agreed uh, to come before us today. As opposed to our standard practice of allotting witnesses 10 minutes, we're uh, agreed, we all have agreed to afford Ms. Wilson-Raybould 30 minutes in order to be able to more fully uh, tell her story. Uh, she is at the center of the events we're studying and I think it's really important uh, to give her that time. I would of course advise other witnesses that that will not be the normal practice of the committee. Before we begin Ms. Wilson-Raybould's testimony, Mr. Rankin has advised me he has a point that he wishes to raise and I don't want to hurt to eat into Ms. Wilson-Raybould's time. So I'll ask Mr. Rankin to give his point. Two kind of related points. The first is that when she accepted our invitation, Ms. wilson Rabo wrote us, and I quote, I will remain before the committee to answer questions for as long as the committee wishes. Now, you'll recall, Mr. Chair, that when we extended, uh, we also extended time for Mr. Wernick, the clerk of the Privy Council office, and he was willing to stay longer as well. So I'd like to move that the committee accept her offer and allow her to spend longer with us either today or at some subsequent meeting. That's my first point. And the second was, since she's going to do a very lengthy statement by, uh, by, by in terms of how we've proceeded in the past, I'd like to ask if there is a written statement, if it could be distributed while she's speaking, because, of course, we will have even less time for questioning than usual as a result, and would give us, I think, more efficiency in asking questions if we had that statement before us in advance. Those are my two suggestions. Thank you, Mr. Rankin. As to the first suggestion, I'm wondering if Ms. wilson Rabel does indeed have a statement that she would like to be distributed to the committee, or would she prefer, because I think this is, I, I would like to go to her preference, what would, what would she prefer? Uh, I do have a statement. It's been provided to the translators, and if uh, it is the will of the committee, they can uh, distribute that to members. So as soon as then copies are ready, Mr. Sure. Clerk. Um, 
Uh, the committee agree to have that statement in English only? Okay. We need, we need, on va le fournir dès que c'est possible. We'll provide it as soon as possible, Mr. Fortin. We will provide it to you in French as soon as possible. You don't have it available right now. No, that's why I asked for unanimous consent from the committee to distribute it. And uh, as I'm not a member of the committee, I can't vote. But I'd like to have a copy in English and a French one as soon as possible, as soon as it's ready. As soon as, so I think I have unanimous consent so the clerk can distribute that. Mm -hmm. Um, and as to, to the proposal, um, I very much appreciated Ms. Wilson-Raybould's offer to stay uh, longer uh, for questions. Our standard is two rounds. Um, so but we, I think there's agreement that we'll go longer than two rounds, and then let's take it round by round after round three. We went for three with Mr. Wernick, then let's talk round by round if we need, if you have more questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, would you like Mr. Mr. Rankin to get the statement before Ms. wilson Rabel begins, or can we begin? That would be my preference if it could be made available. How long will it be? Well, I think it's five, ten minutes. Uh, oh, it'll be five or ten minutes. So I, I think it's only fair to the witness to, to let her begin. Ms. wilson Rabel, the floor is yours, and when we get to 30 minutes, I'll just give you a sort of sign to let you know that it's there, okay? Thank you so much, Ms. wilson Rabel. The floor is yours. Well, Gaila Kasla, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the members of the Justice Committee for providing me the opportunity uh, for extended testimony today. I, I very much appreciate it. And starting off, I would like to acknowledge the territory, the ancestral lands of the Algonquin people. For a period of approximately four months between September and December of 2018, I experienced a consistent and sustained effort by many people within the government to seek to politically interfere in the exercise of prosecutorial discretion in my role as the Attorney General of Canada in an inappropriate effort to secure a deferred prosecution agreement with SNC-Lavalin. These events involved 11 people, excluding myself and my political staff, from the Prime Minister's office, the Privy Council office, and the office of the Minister of Finance. This included in-person conversations, telephone calls, emails, and text messages. There were approximately 10 phone calls and 10 meetings specifically about SNC, and I and or my staff were a part of these meetings. Within these conversations, there were expressed statements regarding the necessity of interference in the SNC-Lavalin matter, the potential of consequences, and veiled threats if a DPA was not made available to SNC. These conversations culminated in December the 19th of 2018 with a conversation I had with the Clerk of the Privy Council, a conversation that I will provide some significant detail on. A few weeks later, on January the 7th, 2019, I was informed by the Prime Minister that I was being shuffled out of the role of Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. For most of these conversations, I made contemporaneous notes, detailed notes, in addition to my clear memory, which I am relying on today, among other documentation. My goal in my testimony is to outline the details of these communications for the committee and indeed all Canadians. However, before doing that, let me make a couple of comments. First, I want to thank Canadians for their patience since the February 7th story, which broke in the Globe and Mail. Thank you as well, specifically to those who have reached out to me across the country. I appreciate the messages and I have read all of them. Secondly, on the role of the Attorney General. The Attorney General exercises prosecutorial discretion as provided for under the Director of Public Prosecutions Act. Generally, this authority is exercised by the Director of Public Prosecutions, but the Attorney General has authority to issue directives to the DPP on specific prosecutions or to take over prosecutions. It is well established that the Attorney General exercises prosecutorial discretion. She or he does so individually and independently. These are not cabinet decisions. I will say that it is appropriate for cabinet mem or colleagues to draw to the Attorney General's attention what they see as important policy considerations that are relevant to decisions about how a prosecution will proceed. What is not appropriate is pressing the Attorney General on matters that she or he cannot take into account, such as partisan political considerations, continuing to urge the Attorney General to take her or his mind four months after the decision has been made, 
or suggesting that a collision with the Prime Minister on these matters should be avoided. With that said, the remainder of my testimony will be a detailed and factual delineation of approximately 10 phone calls, 10 in-person meetings, and emails and text messages that were part of an effort to politically interfere regarding SNC, the SNC matter for purposes of securing a deferred prosecution. The story begins on September the 4th, 2008. My chief and staff and I were overseas when I was sent a memorandum for the Attorney General pursuant to Section 13 of the Director of Public Prosecutions Act, which was entitled, quote, whether to issue an invitation to negotiate a remediation agreement to SNC Lavalin, end quote, which was prepared by the Director of Public Prosecutions, Kathleen Roussel. The only parts of this note that I will disclose are as follows. Quote, the DPP is of the view that an invitation to negotiate will not be made in this case and that no announcement will be made by the PPSC, end quote. As with all Section 13 notices, the director provides the information so that the Attorney General can take such course of action as they deem appropriate. In other words, the director had made her decision to not negotiate a remediation agreement with SNC Lavalin. I subsequently spoke to my minister's office staff about the decision and I did the standard practice of undertaking further internal work and due diligence in relation to this note, a practice that I have had um, for many of the Section 13 notices that I received when I was the Attorney General. In other words, I immediately put in motion with my department and minister's office a careful consideration and study of the matter. Two days later, on September the 6th, one of the first communications about the DPA was received from outside of my department. Ben Chin, Minister Morneau's Chief of Staff, emailed my Chief of Staff and they arranged to talk. He wanted to talk about SNC and what we could do, if anything, to address this. He said to her, my Chief, that if they don't get a DPA, they will leave Montreal and it's the Quebec election right now, so we can't have that happen. He said that they have a big meeting coming up on Tuesday and that this bad news may go public. This same day, my chief of staff exchanged some emails with my minister's office staff about this, who advised her that the deputy attorney general, Nathalie Drouin, was working on something and that my staff were drafting a memo about the role of the attorney general vis-a-vis -vis the PPSC. It was on or about this day that I requested a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the prime minister on another matter of urgency and as soon as possible after I got back into the country. This request would ultimately become the meeting on September the 17th between myself and the prime minister that has widely been reported in the media. On September 7th, my chief of staff spoke by phone to my then minister or deputy minister about the call she had received from Ben Chin and the deputy stated that the department is working on this. The deputy gave my chief a quick rundown of what she thought some options would be. On the same day, I received a note from my staff on the role of the Attorney General, a note that I also shared with Elder, or that my office also shared with Elder Marquez and Amy Archer at the PMO. Same day, staff in my office met with the Deputy Minister. Some excerpts of the Section 13 note were read to the Deputy Minister but the Deputy Minister did not want to be provided with a copy of the Section 13 note. September 8th, my Deputy shared the draft note on the role of the Attorney General with my Chief of Staff, who subsequently shared it with me. And over the next, next day, clarity was sought by my staff with the Deputy on aspects of the options that were laid out in her note. A follow-up follow conversation between Ben Chin and a member of my staff, Francois Giroux, occurred on September the 11th. Mr. Chin said that SNC had been informed that the PPS, or by the PPSC that it cannot enter into a DPA. And Ben again detailed the reasons why they were told that they were not getting a DPA. Mr. Chin also noted that SNC's legal counsel, Frank Iacobucci, and further detailed what the terms were that SNC was prepared to agree to, stating that they viewed this as part of a negotiation. To be clear, 
Up to this point, I had not been directly contacted by the Prime Minister, officials in the Prime Minister's office or the Privy Council office about this matter. With the exception of uh, Mr. Chin's discussions, the focus of communications had been internal to the Department of Justice. This changes on September the 16th. My Chief of Staff had a phone call with Mathieu Bouchard and Elder Marquez from the Prime Minister's office. They wanted to discuss SNC. They told her that SNC had made further submissions to the Crown and that there is some softening but not much. They said that they understood that the individual Crown Prosecutor wants to negotiate an agreement but the Director does not. They said that they understand that they can't direct but that they hear that our Deputy of Justice thinks we can get the PPSC to say we think that we should get some outside advice on this. They said that they think we should be able to find a more reasonable resolution here. They told her that SNC's next board meeting is on Thursday, which was September the 20th. They also mentioned the Quebec election context. They asked my chief if someone has suggested the outside idea to the PPSC and asked whether or not we were open to this suggestion. They wanted to know if my deputy could do it. In response, my chief of staff stressed to them prosecutorial independence and potential concerns about the interference in the independence of the prosecutorial functions. Mr. Bouchard and Mr. Marquez kept telling her that they didn't want to cross any lines, but they asked my chief of staff to follow up with me directly on this matter. To be clear, I was fully aware of the conversations between September the 4th and 16th that I have outlined. I had regularly had been regularly briefed by my staff from the moment this first arose and had also reviewed all materials that had been produced. Further, my view had also formed at this point. Through the work of my department, my minister's office, and work I conducted on my own, that is what was inappropriate, um, that it was inappropriate for me to intervene in the decision of the Director of Public Prosecutions in this case and to pursue a deferred prosecution agreement. In the course of reaching this view, I discussed the matter on a number of occasions with my then deputy so that she was aware of my view, raised concerns on a number of occasions with my deputy minister about the appropriateness of communications we were receiving from outside the department, and also raised concerns about some of the options that she had been suggesting. On September 17th, the Deputy Minister said that Finance had told her that they wanted to make sure that Kathleen understands the impact if we do not do nothing in this case. Given the potential concerns raised by this conversation, I discussed this later with my Deputy. This same day, September 17th, I have my one-on-one -on -one meeting with the Prime Minister that I requested a couple of weeks ago. When I walked in, the Clerk of the Privy Council was in attendance as well. While the meeting was not about the issue of SNC and DPAs, the Prime Minister raised the issue immediately. The Prime Minister asked me to help out, to find a solution here for SNC, citing that if there is no DPA, there would be many jobs lost and that SNC would move from Montreal. In response, I explained to him the law and what I have the ability to do and not do under the Director of Public Prosecutions Act around issuing directives or assuming conduct of prosecutions. I told him that I had done my due diligence and had made up my mind on SNC and that I was not going to interfere with the decision of the, of the director. In response, the Prime Minister reiterated his concerns. I then explained how this came about and that I had received a Section 13 note from the DPP earlier in September and that I had considered the matter very closely. Further, I further stated that I was very clear on my role as the Attorney General and that I am not prepared to issue a directive in this case that it would not be appropriate. The Prime Minister again cited the potential loss of jobs and SNC moving. Then, to my surprise, the clerk stated or started to make the case for the need for a DPA. He said, quote, there is a board meeting on Thursday, September the 20th, with stockholders, end quote. 
quote again, they will likely be moving to London if this happens, and there is an election in Quebec soon, end quote. At that point, the Prime Minister jumped in, stressing that there is an election in Quebec, and that, quote, I am an MP in Quebec, the member for Papineau, end quote. I was quite taken aback. My response, and I vividly remember this as well, was to ask the Prime Minister a direct question while looking him in the eye. I asked, quote, are you politically interfering with my role, my decision as the Attorney General? I would strongly advise against it, end quote. The Prime Minister said, no, 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 we just need to find a solution. The clerk then said that he spoke to my deputy and she said that I could speak to the director. I responded by saying, no, I would not. That would be inappropriate. I further explained to the clerk and the Prime Minister that I had had a conversation with my deputy about options and what my position was on the matter. As a result, I agreed to and undertook to the Prime Minister that I would have a conversation with my deputy and the clerk, but that these conversations would not change my mind. I also said that my staff and my officials are not authorized to speak to the PPSC. And then we finally discussed the issue that I had asked for the meeting in the first place. I left the meeting and immediately debriefed with my staff about what was said with respect to SNC and DPAs. On September 19th, I met with the clerk as I had undertaken to the Prime Minister. The meeting was one-on-one -on -one in my office. The clerk brought up job losses and that this is not about the Quebec election or the Prime Minister being a Montreal MP. He said that he has not seen the Section 13 note. The clerk said that he understands that SNC is going back and forth with the DPP and that they want more information. He said that, quote, Yakabuchi is not a shrinking violet, end quote. He referenced the, sec the September 20th date uh, and that they don't have anything from the DPP. He said that the Prime Minister is very concerned about the confines of my role as Attorney General and the Director of Public Prosecutions. He reported that the Prime Minister is very aware of my role as the Attorney General of Canada. I told the clerk again that I instructed the dep my deputy um, is not to get that my deputy is not to get in touch with the director, and that given my review of the matter, I would not speak to her directly regarding the DPA, ADPA. I offered that if SNC were to send, I offered to the clerk if that SNC um, were to send me a letter expressing their concerns, their public interest argument, it would be permissible, and I would appropriately forward it directly to the director of public prosecutions. Later that day, my chief of staff had a phone call with Elder Marquez and Mathieu Bouchard from the Prime Minister's office. They wanted an update on what was going on regarding the DPAs since, quote, we don't have a ton of time, end quote. She relayed my summary of the meeting um, with the clerk and the Prime Minister. Mathieu and Elder also raised the idea of a, quote, informal reach out, end quote, to the DPP. My chief of staff said that she knew I was not comfortable with that as it looked like and probably did constitute political interference. They asked whether that was true if it wasn't the attorney general herself, but if it was her staff or the deputy minister. My chief of staff said, yes, it would, and offered a call with me directly. They said that they will regroup and get back to you, to you on that. Still on September the 19th, I spoke to Minister Morneau on this matter when we were in the House. He again stressed the need to save jobs, and I told him that um, engagements from his office to mine on SNC had to stop, that they were inappropriate. They did not stop. On September the 20th, my Chief of Staff had phone calls with Mr. Chin and uh, Justin Toe, both members of the Minister of Finance's office, about DPAs and SNC. At this point, after September the 20th, there was an apparent pause in communicating with myself or my Chief of Staff on the SNC matter. We did not hear from anyone again until October the 18th, when Mathieu Bouchard called my Chief of Staff and asked that we, I, 
look at the option of seeking an external legal opinion on the DPP's decision not to extend an invitation to negotiate a DPA. This would become a recurring theme for some time in messages from the PMO that an external review should be done of the DPP's decision. The next day as well, SNC filed a federal court application seeking to quash the DPP's decision to not enter into a mediation agreement with them. In my view, this necessarily put to rest any notion that I might speak to or intervene with the DPP or that external review could take place. The matter was now before the courts and a judge was being asked to look at the DPP's discretion. However, on October the 26, 2018, when my chief of staff spoke to Matthew Bouchard and communicated to him now that given that SNC has now filed a federal court, filed in federal court seeking to review the DPP's decision, surely we had moved past the idea of the Attorney General intervening or getting an opinion on the same question. Mathieu replied that he was still interested in an external legal opinion idea. Could she not get an external legal opinion on whether the DPP had exercised their discretion properly? And then, on the application itself, the Attorney General could intervene, seek to stay the proceedings, given that she was awaiting a legal opinion. My Chief of Staff said that this would obviously be perceived as interference and her boss questioning the DPP's decision. Mathieu said that if, six months from the election, SNC announces they're moving their headquarters out of Canada, that is bad. He said, quote, we, have, we can have the best policy in the world, but we need to get re-elected, end quote. He said that everybody knows that this is the Attorney General's decision, but that he wants to make sure that all options are being canvassed. Mathieu said that if, at the end of the day, the Attorney General is not comfortable, that is fine. He just doesn't want any doors to be closed. Jessica, my Chief of Staff, said that I was always happy to speak to him should he wish. In mid-November, the PMO requested that I meet with Mathieu Bouchard and Elder Marquez to discuss the matter, which I did on November 22nd. This meeting was quite long. I would say about an hour and a half. I was irritated by having to have the meeting as I had already told the Prime Minister, etc., that a DPA on SNC was not going to happen, that I was not going to issue a directive. Mathieu in this meeting did most of the talking. He was trying to tell me that there were options and that I needed to find a solution. I took them through the DPP, DPP Act, Section 15, Section 10, and that and, and talked about the prosecutorial independence as a constitutional principle, and that they were interfering. I talked about the Section 13 note, which they said they had never received, but I reminded them that we sent it to them in September. Mathieu and Elder continued to plead their case, talking about, if I'm not sure in my decision that we could hire an eminent person to advise me. They were kicking the tires. I said no. My mind had been made up and they needed to stop. This was enough. I will briefly pause at this moment to comment on my own state of mind. In my role as Attorney General, I had received the decision of the DPP in September, had reviewed the matter, made a decision on what was appropriate given a DPA, and communicated that to the Prime Minister. I had also taken additional steps that the Prime Minister asked me to, such as meeting with the clerk. In my view, the communications and efforts to change my mind on this matter should have stopped. Various officials also urged me to take partisan political considerations into account, which it was clearly improper for me to do so. We either have a system that is based on the rule of law the independence of prosecutorial functions and respect for those charged to use their discretion and powers in a particular way, or we do not. While in our system of government, policy-oriented um, discussion amongst people at early points in this conversation may be appropriate. 
that consistent and enduring efforts, even in the face of judicial proceedings on the same matter, and in the face of cl a clear decision of the Director of Public Prosecutions and the Attorney General to continue and even intensify such efforts raises serious red flags in my view. Yet, this is what continued to happen. On December the 5th of 2018, I met with Jerry Butts. We had both sought out this meeting. I wanted to speak about a number of things, including up, bringing up SNC and the barrage of people hounding me and my staff. Towards the end of our meeting, which was in the Chateau Laurier, I raised how I needed everybody to stop talking to me about SNC as I had made up my mind and the engagements were inappropriate. Jerry then took over the conversation and said how we need a solution on the SNC stuff. He said I needed to find a solution. I said no and I referenced the preliminary inquiry and the judicial review. I said further that I gave the clerk the only appropriate solution that could have happened and that was the letter idea that was not taken up. Jerry talked to me about how the statute was a statute passed by Harper and that he does not like the law. I said something like that is the law that we have. On December the 7th, I received a letter from the Prime Minister dated December 6, attaching a letter from the CEO of SNC Lavalin dated October the 15th. I responded to the Prime Minister's letter on December 6, noting that the matter is before the court so I cannot comment on it and that the decision re a DPA was one for the DPP, which is independent of my office. This brings me to the final events in the chronology, the ones that signal, in my experience, the final escalation in efforts by the Prime Minister's office to interfere in this matter. On December 18th of 2018, my Chief of Staff was urgently summoned to a meeting with Jerry Butts and Katie Telford to discuss SNC. They wanted to know where I, me, am at in terms of finding a solution. They told her that they felt like the issue was getting worse and that I was not doing anything. They referenced a possible call with the Prime Minister and the clerk the next day. I will now read to you a transcript of the most relevant sections of a text conversation between my Chief of Staff and I almost immediately after that meeting. Jessica. Basically, they want a solution, nothing new. They want external counsel retained to give you an opinion on whether you can review the DPP's decision here and whether you should in this case. I told them that would be interference. Jerry said, quote, Jess, there is no solution here that does not involve some interference, end quote. At least they are finally being honest about what they are asking you to do. Don't care about the PPSC's independence. KD was like, quote, we don't want to debate legalities anymore, end quote. They keep being like, we aren't lawyers, but there has to be some solution here. Mojag, I text. So where were things left? Jessica, so unclear. I said what of course let you know about the conversation um, and they said that they were gonna kick the tires with a few people on this tonight. The clerk was waiting outside when she left, when I left. But they said that they want to set up a call between you and the prime minister and the clerk tomorrow. I said that of course you'd be happy to speak to your boss. They seem quite keen on the idea of you retaining an ex Supreme Court of Canada judge to get advice on this. Katie Telford thinks it gives us cover in the business community and the legal community and that it would allow the prime minister to say we were doing something. She was like, quote, if Jody is nervous, we would, of course, line up all kinds of people to write op-eds saying that what she is doing is proper, end quote. On December the 19th, 2018, I was asked to have a call with the clerk. It was a fairly lengthy call, and I took the call from home, and I was on my own by myself. Given what occurred the previous day with my chief of staff, I was determined to end all interference and conversations about this matter once and for all. Here is part of what the clerk and I discussed. The clerk said he was calling about DPAs, SNC. He said he wanted to pass on where the prime minister is at. 
He spoke about the company's board and the possibility of them selling out to someone else, moving their headquarters and job losses. He said that the Prime Minister wants to be able to say that he has tried everything he can within the legitimate toolbox. The clerk said that the Prime Minister is quite determined, quite firm, but he wants to know why the DPA route, which Parliament provided for, isn't being used. He said, quote, I think he is going to find a way to get it done, one way or another. So he's just kind he's he is in that kind of mood, and I wanted you to be aware of it. End quote. The clerk said he didn't know if the Prime Minister was planning on calling me directly or if he if is thinking about getting somebody else to give him some advice. You know, he does not want to do anything outside of the box of what is legal or proper. He said that the Prime Minister wants to understand more, to give him advice on this, or give you advice on this if you want to feel more comfortable you are not doing anything inappropriate or outside the frame. I told the clerk that I was 100% confident that I was doing nothing inappropriate. I again reiterated my com my confidence confidence in where I am in my views on SNC and the DPA have not changed. I reiterate this is a constitutional principle of prosecutorial independence. I warned the clerk in this meeting that he was in this call that he, that uh, we were treading on dangerous ground here. I also issued a stern warning because as the attorney general, I cannot act in a manner and the prosecution cannot act in a manner that is not objective, that isn't independent. I cannot act in a partisan way, and I cannot be politically motivated. This all screams of that. The clerk wondered whether anyone could speak to the director about the context around this or get her to explain her reasonings. The clerk told me that he was going to have to report back to the prime minister before he leaves. He said again that the Prime Minister was in a pretty firm frame of mind and this, on this, about this, and that he was a bit worried. I asked what he's worried about. The clerk then made the comment about how it is not good for the Prime Minister and his Attorney General to be at loggerheads. I told the clerk that I was giving him my best advice and that if he did not accept that advice, then it is the Prime Minister's prerogative to do what he wants. But I am trying to protect the Prime Minister from political interference or perceived political interference or otherwise. The clerk acknowledged that, but said that the Prime Minister does not have the power to do what he wants. All the tools are in my hands, he said. I said that I was having thoughts of the Saturday Night Massacre but that I was confident that I had given the Prime Minister my best advice to protect him and to protect the constitutional principle of prosecutorial independence. The clerk said that he was worried about a collision between the Prime Minister, because the Prime Minister is pretty firm about this. He told me that he had seen the Prime Minister a few hours ago and that this is really important to him. That is essentially where the conversation ended, and I did not hear from the Prime Minister the next day. Well, I'm just letting everybody know that I've just, as Chair, I choose to give you more than 30 minutes. You've exceeded it. I'd like you to be able to finish your statement. Is there anybody that has any objection to that? Uh, no. Okay, so please continue. I don't think anyone in the audience does either. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On January the 7th, I received a call from the Prime Minister and was informed I was being shuffled out of my role as Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. I will not go into details of this call or subsequent communications about the shuffle, but I will say that I stated I believe the reason was because of the SNC matter. They denied this to be the case. On January the 11th, 2019, the Friday before the shuffle, my former deputy minister is called by the clerk and told that the shuffle is happening and that she will be getting a new minister. As part of this conversation, the clerk tells the deputy that one of the first conversations that the new minister will be expected to have with the prime minister will be on SNC-Lavalin. In other words, 
um, that the new minister will need to prepare, be prepared to speak to the prime minister on this file. The deputy recounts this to my chief of staff, who tells me about the conversation. <laughs> my narrative stops here. I must reiterate to the committee my concern outlined in the letter to the chair yesterday. That is, Order in Council number 2019-0105 addresses only my time as the Attorney General of Canada and therefore does, not, uh, does nothing to release me from my restrictions that apply to communications while I proudly served as the Minister of Veterans Affairs. And in relation to my resignation from that post or my presentation to Cabinet after I resigned. This time period includes communications on topics that some members of the committee have explored with other witnesses and about which there have been public statements by others. The order in council leaves in place the various constraints, in particular cabinet confidence that there are on my ability to speak freely on matters that occurred after I left my post as attorney general. Even with those constraints, I hope that through my narrative today, the committee and everyone across the country who's listening has a clear idea of what I experienced and what I know of who did what and what was communicated. I hope and expect the facts speak for themselves. I imagine Canadians now fully understand that in my view, these events constituted pressure to intervene in a matter and that this pressure or political interference to intervene was not appropriate. However, Canadians can judge this for themselves as we now have the same frame of information. Lastly, as I've, pre I've said previously, it has always been my view that the Attorney General of Canada must be nonpartisan, more transparent in the principles that are the basis of decisions, and in this respect, always willing to speak truth to power. In saying this, I was reflecting what I understood to be the vital importance of the rule of law and prosecutorial independence in our democracy. My understanding of this has helped shape, help, has been shaped by some lived experiences. I am, of course, a lawyer. I was a prosecutor in the downtown east side of Vancouver. <coughs> So I come to this view as a trained professional and committed to certain values as key to our system of order. But my understanding of the rule of law has also been shaped my, by my experiences as an Indigenous person and as an Indigenous leader. The history of Crown Indigenous relations in this country includes a history of the rule of not, law not being respected. Indeed, one of the main reasons for the urgent need for justice and reconciliation today is that in the, country, in the history of our country, we have not always upheld foundational values such as the rule of law in relations to Indigenous peoples. And I have seen the negative impacts for freedom, equality, and a just society this can have firsthand. So when I pledged to serve Canadians as your Minister of Justice and Attorney General, I came to it with a deeply ingrained commitment to the rule of law and the importance of acting independently of partisan, political and narrow interests in all matters. When we do not do that, I firmly believe and know we do worse as a society. I will conclude by saying this. I was taught to always be careful what you say because you cannot take it back. I was taught to always hold true to your core values and principles and to act with integrity. These are the teachings of my parents, my grandparents and my community. I come from a long line of matriarchs and I'm a truth teller in accordance with the laws and traditions of our big house. This is who I am and this is who I always will be. Gala Kusla, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilson-Raybould, for uh, sharing your perspective with the committee. It's much appreciated. 
So, um, folks, I'm just going to lay out the rules for the questions. Um, I'm usually a very flexible chair in terms of time, but as we've done for the meetings on uh, on this issue, uh, we're going to stick to the time limits. And as a result, I would ask uh, if the witness, where somebody is asking for a, a quick answer, is, is it could be a little bit succinct. Uh, but I'll, I'll obviously want you to be able to finish your answers. So we're going to start. So uh, the first round is six minutes conservative, six liberal, six NDP, six liberal. And I'll let everybody know in advance of every round what the what the time limits are. We'll start with Ms. Wright. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilson-Raybould. I appreciate your patience on getting here today. It hasn't been an easy path, but I know that Canadians really appreciate it and they appreciate your testimony today. And I just want to start off by saying that I believe every word that you said today. And I appreciate your honor and I appreciate your honesty and I appreciate your integrity and grit in coming forward in the way you have. So I do have some questions though and I'd be grateful for your input and your point of view. Um, First and foremost, uh, I'd like to know, the Prime Minister has said that you will be able to discuss all relevant information, but do you believe that there is relevant information that you are unable to include in your 30-minute statement that would be helpful for the committee? Well, thank you for the, the comments and, and the question. Um, as I said in my letter to the committee yesterday, as I said in my remarks, today, the extent of the order in council and the waiver of privilege and confidentiality extends to January the 14th when I was sworn in as the Minister of Veterans Affairs. So it does not include any conversations that occurred thereafter. It does not include conversations that I may or may not have had with the Prime Minister. And it does not include the conversation that I had with my former cabinet colleagues um, after my resignation from cabinet. Do you think those would be relevant to our considerations? Well, I believe that having heard some of the deliberations and questions asked by the committee over the course of the meetings that you've had, um, some of the questions would um, be answered if that information was made available. One of the, one of the important pieces of your, of your testimony today what were the, the number of names that you provided for us, giving us a different list of characters that have been involved in this situation since it began in September. I'm wondering if you'd be so kind to provide us with a full list of those names. I've jotted down a few of them, but I don't have the complete listing. Would that be something you'd be willing to do for us? I, I believe the full list of names is contained within the remarks that I think are being distributed. Um, okay. But if I um, counted incorrectly, I will provide all of the names. I appreciate it. Just on page 14, you mentioned that there were various officials that came forward at the time. If you have any recollection of who the various officials were, that would be helpful for us in terms of making sure we have a complete list of all the, of all the um, witnesses. Um, on January 7, you you've pointed out to us that you were told that you were being removed as the um, Attorney General. Um, as well, you posted a very lengthy Facebook post after your movement to the Minister of Veterans Affairs, but I would assume that you thought a lot about what you would include in a note like this during the time when you were actually Attorney General. And as such, I, I think and I believe that the statement that you made, even though it was on when you were Minister of Veterans Affairs, technically did come to light and, and was part of your thought process when you were Attorney General. And I just wanted to ask you a couple questions about, about your Facebook post. The first one, and I quote, it's where, you, and you mentioned it in your remarks, it has always been my view that the Attorney General of Canada must be nonpartisan, more transparent, and in this respect, always willing to speak truth to power. Do you believe, for the record, that you were removed as the Attorney General because you spoke truth to power on the topic of the SNC ongoing prosecution? Well, uh, thank you for, for the question, and I um, am going to have to be very careful what I say. I understand. Um, I believe that I am able to speak to my thought processes um, uh, from January the 7th up to and in, up to the time that I was sworn in as the Veterans Affairs Minister. Yes. Um, I think it's apparent from my remarks that I was uh, concerned that the reason why I was being shuffled out of the Minister of Justice and Attorney General um, possibly was uh, because of a decision I would not take on SNC and the DPA. I raised those concerns with the Prime Minister and with Jerry Butts. 
Um, and as I said in my remarks, um, those were um, denied. Um, I cannot speak to anything that I thought about after that point. I, I appreciate that. Second, um, second part of this letter, you say that the unique and independent aspects of the dual role of the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada are even more important. I know Canadians across the country expect such high standards to continue to be met, especially in the uncertain times in which we now live, and I expect this to continue. I'd like to know if you are concerned that it's possible that the independence of the Office of the Attorney General is being eroded now, given what you've told us in your testimony today, your understanding that the current Attorney General was to be briefed on the SNC-Lavalin deferment uh, decision. Well, thanks for the for the question, and I w will not comment on the current Attorney General, um, but I will comment on um, when I was the Attorney General and the thoughts that I had um, when I was on vacation in Bali um, and when I received a, a call from the Prime Minister. Um, while I was the Attorney General through these four months, uh, leaving aside all of the very inappropriate political pressure, uh, interference, um, I was confident in my role as the Attorney General that I was the final decision maker on whether or not um, uh, an, a directive would be um, introduced on the SNC matter. So I knew as long as I was the Attorney General, this would not occur. Um, I had concerns that when I was removed as the Attorney General that this potentially might not be the case. I decided that um, I would embrace this new role, a very important role, and I really want to say publicly that uh, the role of Veterans Affairs is an incredibly important role, and I took it very seriously. Um, but I had decided to take on the role um, requested of me by the Prime Minister, but I had concerns, and I knew that in my new role, still sitting around the Cabinet table, if there had been a directive that was placed into the Gazette, I would have resigned immediately from Cabinet. Thank you very well much. Uh, Ms. O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being here today and for providing your notes. I think they're helpful. Um, my set of questions, I want to kind of get a, a general sense of some timelines. I know you've laid it out here, but just in trying to keep up a little bit. Um, would you say, or is it fair to say that in and around, and if I have the wrong date, please correct me, September 17th, I think is when you first met with the Prime Minister uh, on which, where it wasn't the, the purpose of the meeting wasn't at first for uh, the SNC Lavalin, but it was brought up. And is it fair to say, was it at that point that you felt the questions of um, your role in, on this matter that you were uncomfortable at that point? Or would you say you were uncomfortable from the initial? feedback that you heard that your chief of staff had been contacted by Mr. Chin. So let's kind of start there. So there's a couple of questions yeah. in there. Um, if I don't answer them, please let me. Yeah, uh, no um, uh, so the, the reason for the, I requested the September 17th meeting, as okay. I said, on a, on a different equal, on an important matter. Um, uh, as I said, the Prime Minister um, brought up SNC and the Deferred Prosecution Agreement. And uh, with the clerk present, we had conversations about SNC. Um, well, he brought up SNC about jobs and the potential of job loss. And I will say, um, entirely appropriate conversations for the prime minister to bring up. Um, what I will say is that the conversations turned to be completely inappropriate when there was discussion about um, the Quebec election about the fact that the Prime Minister was a member of Parliament uh, in Quebec. It was at that point that um, I immediately um, 
became concern. And because I was the attorney general, um, sought to um, have a conversation with the prime minister about the law, about the role of the attorney general and the necessary independence that the attorney general must have in exercising their discretion, in this case around a prosecution. Um, the political concerns that were raised prompted me to ask the question of the Prime Minister directly if he was politically interfering with my role as the Attorney General. So at that point, my senses were heightened. Um, the Prime Minister assured me that that was not the case. Um, but um, soon thereafter, um, I instructed my staff and myself as well to uh, ensure that we had a very detailed chronology of all meetings um, and uh, conversations about SNC and deferred prosecution agreements. Thank you. So you wouldn't say that it was a red flag um, necessarily on the topic or the conversations um, with Mr. Chin on September 7th because it was those conversations about businesses. It was once the conversation in your mind changed to uh, any politics? Or were you equally concerned on September 7th? On the September, on the earlier meetings prior to the meeting with the Prime Minister, um, Ben Chin had conversations with my Chief of Staff. And again, in terms of public policy, in terms of having discussions about impacts of decisions uh, and loss of jobs, um, that was appropriate. Okay. Um, but I will say, um, in those calls, and I don't have my notes in front of me, but I have a pretty uh, uh, generous memory, um, Mr. Chin raised the Quebec election. And I will say, it's okay to talk about job losses. It's okay to talk about it in initial conversations. But when those topics continue to be brought up after there's a clear awareness that a decision has been made, it becomes inappropriate. Thank you for clarifying. And um, sir, I just want to clarify on that point because you mentioned you have notes and a pretty good memory. Um, but in the uh, written submission or your verbal remarks, any conversations, at least from September 7th, 8th, I think 11th, um, at least involving Mr. Chin, were with your staff, not you directly. Did you leave out conversations that you also had, or was it just notes that you had from your conversations with somebody who had a conversation with Mr. Chin? I just want to clarify. Yeah, sure. Mentioned. No, I'm happy. I'm happy to answer the question if you'd permit me just to um, speak about how ministers, at least my minister's office, works. Um, I have an incredibly close relationship necessarily so with my chief of staff. I also at that time had and a very close relationship with my judicial affairs advisor who throughout some of this period of time was acting as my chief of staff given that we were out of the country. Um, whenever my chief of staff has a conversation, um, she takes notes on the conversation and immediately relays the conversation to me, particularly in cases where there's concerns about the conversations that were had. Um, so the close relationship and the necessary closeness of the relationship um, makes it um, that she and I um, uh, are um, sharing important information and proceeding on the same basis with respect to the meetings, telephone calls, and emails that she would receive. It is her obligation, and it was my instructions for her to provide me with all of these details. Thank you. And um, Ms. O'Connell, your last question. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Uh, and then it was in here, I'm sorry, I don't remember, I don't recall, but it did say somewhere in these conversations that either you or your staff related on behalf of you that you would be in this at least September time frame open to having further conversations on the SNC-Lavalin matter. Is that not correct? Or in September you had felt comfortable and confident that the decision was made? Well, I, during that time frame, I had uh, commenced conversations and had asked for briefings 
as I regularly did when I received a Section 13 notice. Um, I think it's fair for me to say that there was a heightened awareness about this Section 13 notice that came in with respect to SNC. These conversations were all internal to the Department of Justice and I was exercising with my Attorney General hat on um, what was appropriate for me to consider based on what I read in the Section 13 note from the Director. Um, we did not reach out externally. Um, we, um, the Minister of Finance's office, reached out to my department and then these conversations began. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rankin. Well, thank you. <coughs> Mr. Chair, I have to say that I am very shaken by what I've heard here today. I, I've, I've been a lawyer for over 40 years. I've taught a generation of law students about the rule of law. And what I've heard today should make all Canadians extremely upset. Now, Ms. Wilson-Raybaugh, we're both from British Columbia. We've known each other for many years, and I need you to know that I believe you entirely. I need you to, I need you to know that. And I, I want you to know as well that I, I'm ve I, I very much admire your courage in being here and, and telling Canadians what you have experienced. Because I believe, if we believe you, which I do, that there is no other conclusion that one can reasonably draw, but that there was a sustained, consistent effort to interfere politically with the critical role that an attorney general must play in our legal system. You have said, to, go, to say what, to quote back what you said, I experienced a consistent and sustained effort by many people within the government to seek to politically interfere in the exercise of prosecutorial discretion in my role as the attorney general of Canada in an inappropriate effort to secure a deferred prosecution agreement. You talked of 10 phone calls, 10 meetings specifically about that. And then you talked about what I would call the consequences and threats if you didn't knuckle under. You said the potential co for consequences and veiled threat if a deferred prosecution was not available to the SNC were, made, were, were brought to your attention during those conversations. So my question is this, how can Canadians, if they believe you, as I do, draw any other conclusion but that there was an attempt to politically interfere with your role as our independent Attorney General. Uh, well, thank you for, for the comments and, and the question, albeit I think the question is somewhat rhetorical. Um, I sought in my testimony today to state facts and in my testimony, I came to the conclusion and throughout the four months um, that there was a sustained um, effort, an attempt to politically interfere with my discretion as the Attorney General of Canada. It was inappropriate. And um, on January the 11th, uh, you said that the Friday before the cabinet shuffle, your former deputy minister was called by the clerk and told that the shuffle was happening and that the deputy minister said one of the first conversations that the new minister will be expected to have with the prime minister would be on SNC-Lavalin. So it appears to a person, a reasonable person, looking at that, that you were removed from your role because you would not change your mind, despite these persistent and consistent efforts to have you do so, and that because you didn't change your mind, you were fired from the role of Attorney General. That's what I take from the material. In other words, it, there appears to be a direct link from that conversation the day before the Cabinet shuffle and what occurred, your removal from your role as Attorney General. That would appear to be what's said. Now, I have a question. After this what you call consistent and sustain, sustained pressure to reverse your decision. I'd like you to tell us a little bit more why you did not change your mind. I did not change my mind to enter into or to issue a directive to the Director of Public Prosecutions on the matter of... At, 
putting out an invitation to negotiate a, a remediation agreement with SNC because I had the benefit of reading the Section 13 note of conducting my own due diligence around the appropriateness of entering into a deferred prosecution agreement with SNC. I had the benefit of um, feedback and briefings from my departmental officials as well as my political staff. Um, I made my mind up prior to the September 17th meeting and for those people that know me, uh, my decision-making process takes into account many views, and I welcome many views on public policy issues. And having taken into account many diverse views, um, knowing confidently um, my role, my independent role as the Attorney General, and the need to make a decision, and I know you are studying the Shawcross principles, and I don't want to get into talking about the Shawcross <laughs> principles, but as the Attorney General, you make decisions with your judicial hat on, um, leaving aside political considerations or otherwise. Mm -hmm. I had determined that I was not going to issue a directive. It was inappropriate to interfere with the discretion of the Director of Public Prosecutions. Um, and having made up my mind, taking into account all of the information, um, again, for those who know me, I was not going to change my mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. O'Connell. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so following up on some of those timeline questions, I just want to, um, it looks like in the response, you didn't uh, meet again with Jerry until December 5th in terms of uh, raising your specific concerns that you felt this was interference. So just given that how long you've known Jer Mr. Butt, sorry, and um, I, I believe it's been widely reported, uh, he was someone who rec recruited you, so you had known each other even prior to politics to run for the Liberal Party. Um, I'm just curious if it is fair to say that it wasn't until the December 5th meeting with Jerry, Mr. Butts, that um, you hadn't messaged him about your concerns about the what you described as uh, constant pressure. If you had communicated with him in any way via text, email, whatnot, prior to that December 5th meeting to say that you felt um, these conversations needed to stop. Well, I'm, I'm not going to comment on the nature of, of my relationship um, with Mr. Butts. That's fine. Um, I, but I will say that uh, um, it was the Prime Minister, the then leader, that uh, recruited me okay. into the party. And, of course, uh, there were ongoing conversations between uh, him and, and Mr. Butts. Sorry, um, can I just say then, is it fair to suggest, though, that you had known him and you were comfortable with him, you had talked to him, I would assume... Regularly. Yeah, of course. Okay. I I had a uh, I had fairly regular conversations with uh, with Jerry. In fact, Jerry said um, to me many times, and I don't think this is a secret that I talk to you more than I talk to most ministers, and I appreciated that relationship. Um, to your the second part of your question, um, as I said, there was sustained efforts at communications, not only with myself but with my office. Um, from various members of the Prime Minister's office, including Mathieu Bouchard and Elder Marquez, both of whom are policy advisors and legal advisors to the Prime Minister, as well as to um, Jerry Butts and Katie Telford. It would have been, in my view, um, not uh, a secret um, that these were concerns that I had. But if it, it, just following up on that, if it wasn't a secret that those were your concerns, why unt not until December 5th did you communicate with uh, Mr. Butt specifically about those communications? Um, it, it was somewhat stated that you would be willing to or someone in your office would look at the matter back in September. So if it was constant um, and you acknowledge that you spoke to Mr. Butts on a regular basis, why not raise it 
earlier in September or October about those ongoing conversations with anyone in the in the PMO or other ministers' offices? Or did you, I guess this is a fair point, did you communicate prior to that um, about those concerns? Yeah, I with appreciate Mr. the question Butts. and then being able to clarify again the timeline. I absolutely communicated in September, um, not to Jerry Butts, but to the Prime Minister of the country, mm -hmm. the concern that I had. I communicated um, to the clerk of the Privy Council, who has as everybody knows, is the deputy minister to the prime minister. I communicated um, to uh, Elder Marquez and to Mathieu Bouchard. I communicated to the deputy minister of justice and the deputy attorney general of Canada. Um, and when the efforts, the sustained efforts of um, political interference continued, I felt, and I have text messages when I requested the meeting with Jerry, mm -hmm. um, that ultimately resulted on December the 5th, that it was time um, to reiterate my concerns uh, to him uh, about the inappropriate nature of these conversations, as I did to Minister Morneau uh, in October, I believe, or September, I might be getting the dates wrong, um, so about the inappropriateness and that they had to stop. So then you didn't mention Ms. Telford. Um, so is it fair to say you didn't speak with Ms. Telford, um, I guess, between those September dates? Uh, or did you ever mention it to Ms. Telford about uh, or have communications via text, emails, and writings that what you um, say were continued pressure? Uh, I, just to correct, um, it was mm -hmm. September the 19th that I had the discussion with Minister Morneau. Mm -hmm. um, to your question, most of the conversations that I have with the Prime Minister's office at the highest level, either uh, Katie or Jerry, would be with Jerry Butts. Okay. Um, but, to be clear, my Chief of Staff uh, had direct conversations with Mr. Butts and Ms. Telford, as I described in detail on December the 18th. So early, um, and then after September 19th, that meeting with the Prime Minister, did you speak to him again about the continued uh, pressure that you felt? Uh, the meeting I had with the Prime Minister was on uh, September the 17th. And um, after September the 17th, I did not directly talk to the Prime Minister until January the 7th. But um, in between those dates, there were, as I described, numerous meetings uh, with the Prime Minister's office senior staff, as okay. well as the Clerk of the Privy Council. And you mentioned earlier in my first round that um, you felt it was entirely appropriate to have the conversation about the jobs and, and those types of impacts I'm, I'm paraphrasing here but and then you mentioned Ms. Uh, Minister Morneau and the conversation you had you referred to on the 19th which was in the house I believe you said in the testimony and you said that he mentioned job losses so what made you feel that that conversation was then inappropriate was inappropriate yes so to the first point about mentioning jobs and job losses, as I said in my in my evidence, I, including the conversation I had with the Prime Minister, I do not believe it is inappropriate right. to have conversations about job losses, about um, SNC, in the early stages where ministers can raise these issues with the Attorney General. Um, what is inappropriate is the long sustained um, discussions about the job losses after it is very clear that I had made my decision and was not going to pursue a DPA. Um, but leaving aside job losses, um, the conversations that I had, where they became um, very clearly inappropriate was when political issues came up, like the election, in Quebec, like losing the election if SNC were to move their headquarters. Conversations like that, conversations like the one I had with the clerk of the Privy Council who invoked the Prime Minister's name throughout the entirety of the conversation, spoke to me about the Prime Minister being dug in, spoke to me about um, his concerns as to what would happen. Um, in my mind, those were veiled threats, and I took them as such. 
um, that is entirely inappropriate. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we move to the second round. In the second round, it goes six minutes to the liberals, six to the conservatives, six to the liberals, five to the conservatives, three to the NDP. So that is round two. We'll start round two with Ms. Sahoda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'd like to first go back to uh, the September 17th meeting with the Prime Minister and the Clerk of the Privy Council. Um, you mentioned that it was here where you had specifically asked the Prime Minister whether he was interfering, and his answer was that the decision was always yours. Is that correct? Uh, that's not what. That's not exactly w what I said. Um, I had raised the background about comments that were made by the prime minister and the clerk, and I know that that has been what has been reported in the media. But that's not what was said. I asked the prime minister a direct question after having comments around elections and being the member of Papineau. Um, are you interfering with my role as the attorney general? My decision. Um, and I advised him strongly not to do that. So it was my direct question to the Prime Minister. And he said the decision was always yours, correct? He did not say that. He said, no, no, no. no That's no. not what I'm doing. Okay. Okay. Um, but you did mention in your opening statement that throughout the whole time you were Attorney General, you did uh, recognize that the decision was always yours. I 100% understand my role as the Attorney General, and it is my decision and my decision alone um, whether or not to issue a directive. Okay. Um, so this uh, September 17th meeting, um, you had asked for it earlier in September, and you said at that point you had gone on vacation, and was did you receive this request for the meeting quite quickly? I didn't say that I went on vacation. I was oh, actually in uh, uh, down in Australia for a Five Eyes meeting and happened to thankfully have a couple of days off okay. um, when another very important issue arose. Uh, and I, at that point, had requested directly to Jerry Butts via text message that I wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the Prime Minister. That was in and around September the 6th. Okay, and then on September 17th, you received the meeting after you came back into the country. I got back into the country on September the 12th mm -hmm. and uh, was able to meet with the Prime Minister, yes, on September the 17th. Okay. Uh, so the main purpose for this meeting, uh, what, what was the main purpose of the meeting? Uh, I am at, not at liberty to discuss that as meetings and discussions between the Prime Minister and myself, other than what's covered in the waiver with respect to SNC and deferred prosecution agreements is covered by Cabinet confidence. Okay. When the Clerk of the Privy Council testified here before committee, he had mentioned uh, that the main purpose of that meeting was the Indigenous Rights Framework, uh, and that SNC-Lavalin was a subject matter that was touched on briefly. Would you be able to say if that was correct or incorrect? Um, I will say that the clerk of the Privy Council is at liberty to say whatever he wants. Um, I have indicated that um, the meeting of September the 17th had to do with another extremely important matter, but that the Prime Minister raised the issue of SNC and deferred prosecution agreements at the outset of that meeting. Okay. Um, my next question is about uh, the, the fact that you had mentioned uh, the appropriateness or inappropriateness and where the line has kind of been drawn. You've indicated that uh, when talking about jobs, the Prime Minister or the member from Papineau was completely in, uh, in an appropriate space. Uh, but when you said he had spoken about the headquarters moving out of Montreal, that was inappropriate. Is that correct? No, I didn't say that. I said that um, where and I didn't say alarm bells, but where my alarm bells went off was when the clerk of the Privy Council talked about the fact that there was a board meeting for SNC coming up on Thursday, September the 20th, that there was an election in Quebec, and then the Prime Minister interjected and said, I'm a member, or I'm an, an MP from Quebec, the member for Papineau. That is... Um, Poli entirely political and entirely inappropriate, which gave rise to the question that I asked the Prime Minister. You had mentioned, uh, just in some of your answers to the questions, about him mentioning he's the member from Papineau, correct, uh, that he was 
talking about the election, and then he had mentioned that uh, if we don't find a solution, the company might move from Montreal. And, I mean, in my view, when a company picks up and moves uh, from a city or from a country, that means job losses. Is that not correct? Well, that's your, that's your view. Of course, I was aware of the potential for job losses. Okay. Um, so, and that is a legitimate conversation for a prime minister to have. Well, again, um, at the time, I didn't see it as being entirely inappropriate. Of course, ministers of the Crown can approach the Attorney General and raise public policy concerns about decisions that the Attorney General will make. Where it became inappropriate was the sustained discussions after I had made my decision and made my decision known. On uh, <clears throat> September 18th, I believe you... Oh, on... Uh, you should be your last question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, on September 19th, you had both met with the clerk and you had met with uh, Minister Morneau in the House. In your discussion with Minister Morneau, I believe you had said that uh, it's inappropriate and he should stop talking about it when he had talked about saving jobs. But in your discussion with the clerk on that same day, you had offered that if SNC-Lavalin were to send a letter to you expressing their concerns and their public interest arguments, you were open to looking at that letter. Is that correct? That's not correct. I did. It's here um, in your statement, opening statement. If you allow me to answer, I can just clarify where that part wasn't correct. I had had discussion with the clerk of the Privy Council, recognizing the conversation that I had um, just the day before had with the Prime Minister, where he asked for solutions, recognizing I had already made my decision. I had indicated to the clerk of the Privy Council that if SNC were to send a letter to me as the Attorney General expressing their concerns, um, their national interest concerns, their public interest concerns, um, that having received, if I were to have received a letter, I would have immediately forwarded it on to the Director of Public Prosecutions. I would not have list looked at it because it is entirely within the purview of the Director of Public Prosecutions and any involvement I would have in that letter would be inappropriate. So what I said was is I would immediately forward it on to the Director, not consider the letter. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wright. Um, Ms. Wilson-Raybould, when you speak to Jerry Butts or Katie Telford or the Clerk of the Privy Council, do you believe that they are speaking with the full authority of the Prime Minister in their discussions with you? Yes. I'm wondering um, some specific questions, if I may. Um, do you believe that the Prime Minister or anyone in the Prime Minister's office had any lawful authority to tell you to direct the Director of Public Prosecution on what to do? <laughs> No, I was the final, and as the Attorney General, is the final decision maker on whether or not, as the top prosecutor, um, to do anything with respect to a specific prosecution. Yeah. Um, is it fair to say that, given your testimony and everything you've told us, that you suffered from repeated communications with you, either directly or indirectly, with, um, with the intent of changing your mind? It was repeated communications, directly or indirectly. That's fair to say. Okay. Um, I'm wondering as well, given the number of times in the final part of your of your statement, um, Mr. Butts indicated to you in your conversation that you needed to find a solution to the issue. Um, the clerk of the Privy Council, or sorry. Um, in the statement that you received, in the text that you received from your chief of staff, uh, there's details about um, not wanting to debate legalities anymore. There's no solution that doesn't come from some interference. Um, the clerk indicating that uh, I think the he, meaning the prime minister, is going to find a way to get it done one way or the other. Um, you reference as well that it's the prime minister's prerogative to do what he wants. You said you were having thoughts of the Saturday Night Massacre. The clerk said he was worried about a collision between you and the Prime Minister. You mentioned a few minutes ago that you thought they were veiled threats. Um, this all seems to me, if I may, that there was an intention from all of these comments and this continued pressure to make you fear for your job. 
at the end of the day that there would be a shuffle or that you would be removed from your position. Is, is that a fair assumption that I'm making? Well, I, I'm not going to speak to the intention of other individuals. Fair enough. Um, I will um, speak to the very heightened level of anxiety that I had that increased and culminated in my discussion with the clerk on December the 19th. And I remember distinctly ending that conversation with the clerk by saying, I am waiting for the other shoe to drop, which I believe that reflection or my comments um, can speak for themselves. And I'm not trying to split a hair here, and I apologize if you take it that way and you can give me the same answer as you did on intention. But do you think the purpose of those comments were to cause you to have a second look at the issue because you were worried about whether or not you'd remain in cabinet? Can you ask, ask the question again? I certainly can. Do you think the purpose of those comments that were thrown into your conversations um, either with you, with your chief of staff, directly with the clerk, through Jerry Butts, through Katie Telford, or even the clerk indicating how anxious the prime minister was and you didn't want to be at loggerheads. Do you think the purpose of those comments that they threw in their conversations was to put pressure on you and make you think about whether or not you would be remaining in cabinet? I am confident that the purpose of those discussions the December 18th and the December 19th discussions were to put extraordinary pressure um, on me to change my mind yeah. as to the intention of the individuals that um, spoke to either my chief of staff or myself. Um, I can't reflect on their intent. Yeah. No, fair enough. I have. Okay, um, if I may, um, on January 7, you received your phone call that you were going to be moved in positions. I've had that phone call in the past as well, so I know what it's like. But I'm wondering if there was any conversation that you can tell us about in terms of who told you that you were going to be moved from Attorney General to Veterans Affairs, and if there's anything pertinent to SNC in that conversation. Well, I... I did state, and this is within the the order in council and the waiver that was provided me with respect to cabinet confidence, with respect to SNC and deferred prosecution agreements. I had a conversation with the prime minister on January the 7th, and he um, spoke to me about my being shuffled out as minister of justice and attorney general, provided rationale of which I won't get into, um, and then I said to him, I can't help but think that this has something to do with a decision I would not take. I had a subsequent, very um, close in time, conversation with Jerry Butts where I specifically said, um, I know this has to do with SNC and a decision that I wouldn't take. To which he said, are you questioning the integrity of the Prime Minister? To which I didn't say anything. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will now go to Mr. Sassi. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Uh, Wilson-Raybould. Um, uh, good to see you here before uh, committee today. Uh, now, I won't be uh, delving into facts. I, I will be talking about uh, context, uh, if you will. Now, uh, you recall that in your capacity as uh, Minister of Justice and Attorney General, uh, that remediation agreements were uh, considered and approved by cabinet. Is that correct? That is correct. And you were also a Minister of Justice and Attorney General on June 6th when Parliament voted in favor of Bill C-74 and you yourself voted in favor of correct. Bill C-74. Thank you. Now, uh, you would agree with me that the uh, concept of uh, alternatives to prosecution is not a novel uh, concept in the landscape of various areas of law. Uh, for example, uh, in the area of international law, there are guidelines, you know, going back to the 1990s about alternatives to prosecution. Uh, we see this quite often when, when it comes to our own criminal code, when it comes to uh, diverting cases through the Youth Criminal Justice Act. We see it with respect to white-collar crime. Would you agree that it's uh, 
that this concept has been around for quite some time. I will say this. Um, we now have in our criminal code um, tools that are provided to the prosecutors on whether or not to enter into negotiations around deferred prosecution agreements. This um, is, uh, these are tools that um, other countries have utilized. Uh, speaking of other countries, as, as you noted, um, and you did reference uh, the Five Eyes, uh, to the best of my understanding, with the exception of uh, New Zealand, the United States has had uh, deferred prosecutions, the United <laughs> Kingdom has had it, uh, France has a DPA-like uh, mechanism, Australia is in the process of adopting it. Uh, so given all these, these developments, uh, would it be fair to say that many commentators are of the view that we are now leveling the playing field um, and that we are p playing catch up with those jurisdictions? Well, I'm, I'm not gonna comment on what other commentators are saying. And I will say this, um, I am not going to make further comments on deferred prosecution agreements. Um, I recognize my responsibilities as a member of parliament, and I recognize that there are two uh, court uh, cases that are currently um, in play. So perhaps I, I understand you don't want to speak to that issue, uh, but you would uh, agree that there, are, there were extensive pu public consultations on the issue. There were consultations that were conducted in advance of uh, the um, passage of the legislation. Yes. Now, uh, I understand in, in your uh, remarks, uh, you were suggesting that some people were approaching you and asking that you uh, obtain legal counsel. Um, would it be fair to say as a routine uh, matter of work that your department does receive legal advice from various uh, firms? I'm sorry, could you clarify what yes. you meant by people were approaching me to obtain legal counsel in what context? Yes, I, I understand uh, that you referred um, uh, that there was one discussion uh, with uh, Mr. Bouchard, and he asked you whether you would consider the option of seeking an external legal opinion. So in the context of deferred prosecution agreements and SNC, yes, I had that conversation with Mathieu Bouchard, Elder Marquez, and a number of other individuals. Um, at that time, all of those individuals knew that I was firm on my decision not to uh, interfere with the discretion of the Director of Public Prosecutions. And having conversations <coughs> about hiring external legal counsels in that environment is entirely inappropriate. Uh, but you've uh, worked on some very difficult files um, during the period you were serving as Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Would it be fair to say uh, that routinely uh, you would ask for outside counsel uh, just to have a better understanding of various pieces of legislation? In my role as the Minister of Justice, and having had the opportunity, as people here know, coming before this committee on various pieces of legislation, um, we would engage uh, with external counsel. Um, but let me be clear. My role as the Minister of Justice, shepherding legislation through the House of Commons, is entirely separate from my role as the Attorney General. Where suggestions of obtaining external legal counsel after I had made my decision as the Attorney General on this matter, that was entirely inappropriate. Um, Keep your and last question, Mr. Assassi. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, before I, I leave this section, uh, would you mind explaining to us what your misgivings were about DPAs? I do mind. I'm not going to have that conversation. I think it's inappropriate as a member of parliament, recognizing that there are two matters before the court. Thank you very much. Monsieur Paulus. Merci. Mr. Paulus, thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Raybould, for this very important testimony for Canada and for democracy. Before I begin, I just wanted to give Ms. Raitt a few moments. Uh, Ms. Wilson-Raybould, first of all, having heard it all, I have to ask you the question. Um, going from being uh, your first appointment and going through the last four months, and although having comfort going into Veterans Affairs, which is a, a wonderful portfolio, and I agree with you fully that you, you served there. How did you feel at the end of this? Like, what's the emotion that you felt out of all of it? I mean, you're giving us wonderful facts, but surely there must be some level of disappointment or, or sadness out of how everything has un unfurled. Generally or with respect to being moved Just, as minister? No, in general, in general, how you've been treated. Um, I have serious concerns about how things are reported. Mm. I have concerns about what people generally call smear campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, it makes me very sad when, um, and this isn't about me personally, it's about the work that I was able to do with an extraordinary group of people when I was the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General, being impugned publicly, recognizing the commitment that my public servants then, and I know to this day, have to ensuring justice in the country and moving forward with legislation, as well as my political staff. So how do I feel? How did I feel? Um, I have to say that I, I loved being the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General. I can't imagine any lawyer not loving being <laughs> yeah, the Minister true. of Justice <laughs> yeah, and the Attorney agree. General. Um, and I believe that I, I served in that role with, um, um, with hard work and with integrity. And I'm proud of um, the legacy that uh, we left. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't want to make anybody think that um, I wasn't sad when I was shuffled out of that role. Of course sure. I was. Um, but I understand um, that it's the prerogative of the Prime Minister mm -hmm. to make those shuffles. And um, how I conduct myself um, is to uh, embrace other opportunities, which I sought to do in the unfortunate limited time that I was the Minister of Veterans Affairs. Thank you. And my colleague, Pierre Paulus. Merci. Uh, Oui, merci. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Wilson-Raybould, the Minister of National Revenue, Ms. Le Boutier, mentioned that this question was raised during a cabinet meeting. In his testimony, Mr. Wernick said it's never been discussed in cabinet. You can't have two different versions. I don't want the details. I just want to know which of these two people is right, Ms. Le Boutier or Mr. Wernick? Well, I'm I, um, not going to comment on which of those two people were right, but what I can tell you is what I know, recognizing that I'm able um, to speak about um, SNC and deferred prosecution agreements. Um, we had discussions at Cabinet about um, creating a new tool for prosecutors, um, remediation agreements. Um, there were conversations, but not central to the conversations. There were peripheral, co peripheral comments about um, SNC, but it was not the heart of our discussions. Um, our discussions were about creating the tool um, for prosecutors. Okay, Prime Minister Trudeau said that you could talk about information that's relevant on this affair. Do you think there is relevant information that you cannot discuss with us? Um, I answered a similar question um, to this one. I, as I said, um, as I said in the letter and as I said here today, um, and recognizing some of the questions that uh, members around the table have asked. I um, have an inability to speak about um, the time frame between January the 14th when I was sworn in um, through to um, 
meetings that I may or may not have had with the Prime Minister, my resignation, and um, the conversations that obviously has been widely publicized that I had um, with my former colleagues um, around the cabinet table. I am not able to speak to those issues. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Mr. Rankin, uh, this is the three minute time for, for you. On February, on February 12th, uh, Madam Wilson Raybo, the Prime Minister said this quote, if anyone felt differently, they had an obligation to raise that with me. No one, including yourself, did that, close quote. But you've testified that you met the Prime Minister on September 17th. You've testified that on December the 5th, Jerry Butts and you uh, got together, and you've told us that he speaks with the full authority of the Prime Minister. On December the 18th, your Chief of Staff was, uh, had a meeting with uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Butts and uh, Ms. Telford. So isn't that, at, at the very least, a misleading statement by the Prime Minister? You did speak with him. Your people spoke with him. You spoke with his people. Isn't it, in fact, mis misleading to say you did not do that? Well, again, I'm not going to speak directly to comments that the Prime Minister made. Um, I believe that um, the chronology and the facts that I presented here before the committee um, and the testimony that I've given um, speaks for itself. Okay. I'd like to, your comments on something that was re referred to earlier. You t uh, in your testimony, you said on December the 19th, you had a call with the clerk of the Privy Council Office, Mr. Wernick, who testified here before. And referring to the Prime Minister, the clerk said this, quote, your words, he's going to find a way to get it done one way or the other. So he is in that kind of mood, and I wanted you to be aware of that. What do you understand by those comments? Well, as I said, I had, um, during this conversation with the clerk, I had a heightened level of anxiety. Um, again, this was the culmination of many meetings and telephone calls with either myself or my chief of staff that continued to escalate. Um, this was the top of that escalation. And I, uh, and I said, um, there were three times in this conversation where I felt um, that the clerk invoking the prime minister's name was um, acting in a threatening manner. Mm -hmm. Do I have another? All right. Uh, on... Um You've told us, and the ordering council precludes us from talking about things after January 14th. Apparently, that's the rules. We can't talk about that. But on February the 18th, Jerry Butts, the senior advisor to the prime minister, resigned. Uh, we had all these meetings about SNC Lavalin. In his letter of resignation, he referred specifically to you. Do you know why? I have absolutely no knowledge. Um, other than what everybody has read in the statement by Jerry Butts, why he um, resigned, if there was any other reason. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Rankin. That concludes the second round. We now have already agreed that we're going to do a third round. So just uh, for, the, for Ms. May had mentioned this to me, and I saw Mr. Fortin putting up his hand. What the committee has done in the past is in the very last round of questions, when we realized we were in our last round, We've asked for consent for the Bloc Québécois that was here to ask a question. When we get to what the committee agrees is its last round of questions, I will ask the committee members at the end if they agree to that. And the you know that that's where we'll go. But we won't do it each each and every round. Um, so we're now in our third round. The third round is six minutes to the Conservatives, six to the Liberals, six to the NDP, six to the Liberals. Ms. Rait. Um. Given the testimony that you provided for us today, Ms. Wilson-Raybould, I have to ask the question about whether or not you were approached by the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister's office, the Clerk of the Privy Council, and given any directions, directives, or suggestions on the conduct of the Mark Norman trial or any other trial that was within your bailiwick as the Attorney General. Uh, I'm not at liberty due to confidences to discuss any matters beyond SNC and deferred prosecution agreements. Thank you. And for clarity, can you tell us what you discussed with the Prime Minister at your meetings in Vancouver on February 11th? I cannot. 
And can you tell us why you've resigned from Cabinet? I cannot. And can you tell us what was discussed with the Cabinet on February 19th? I cannot. If those, if the issues surrounding uh, your ability to communicate these conversations to this committee were in fact um, resolved and you were able to be released from Cabinet confidence or from privilege, would you be willing to return to this committee and give us testimony again? I would be. I'm wondering as well, Ms. Wilson-Raybould, that when the clerk was speaking with you in those communications, I know I've asked you already, but I want to just be crystal clear that when the clerk was speaking with you, he was speaking with the full weight and the authority of the Prime Minister, and it was your understanding that the Prime Minister was speaking through the clerk to you. I can only go by what the clerk said to me in those conversations, in that conversation where he invoked the Prime Minister uh, in terms of relaying messages from the Prime Minister. Okay, and if I may clarify in your statement, you have delineated these for us in terms of going through what the things that the clerk was saying on behalf of the Prime Minister, it's contained in your statement before us today. That's correct. Okay. Um, a couple of times you have mentioned about your January 7 phone call with the Prime Minister about not going to be the Attorney General all, any longer. And you've indicated a couple of times that you didn't want to talk about what the contents of the conversation were. I respect that. I'm not going to ask you a third time. Can you tell us why? Under what um, authority are you saying that you don't want to disclose the conversation just so that I can understand whether or not you were bound by something else so that we can perhaps take that roadblock out of the way to get your full testimony? Well, I'm not going to provide legal advice to the committee, but um, I am going um, by the order in council and the waiver that was provided um, around SNC and deferred prosecution agreements and any conversations around those topics when I was the Attorney General are, uh, I am able to speak about. Your, your Chief of Staff, her name is Jessica Prince, correct? That's correct. Um, was well, she, former Chief of Staff. Former, I'm sorry, my apologies, correct. Your former Chief, I understand fully the relationship between Chief of Staff and Minister, and, and it was pretty awesome that she decided to move with you to Veterans Affairs, just saying, it's very nice. I thought it was totally awesome. Yeah, very awesome. Um, what I would like to know, though, is in her conversations with uh, Ms. Telford and Mr. Butts, did she indicate to you, and I know it's hearsay, but you do have testimony talking about her text to you, did she have fear about whether or not she would still have a job as a Chief of Staff if she didn't convince you to review the decision on interfering with the trial that was ongoing? Uh, I, of course, don't want to speak for, for Jessica on this, about the specific question on fear. Yeah. Um, I can say that in my conversations with her and in my text messages, but particularly in my conversations with her after that, um, she was quite upset after the meeting. And I will say now that I have this opportunity, and I think some people are watching, um, to Jessica Prince, who was my chief of staff um, at the Department of Justice and came with me to Veterans Affairs. She is an extraordinary human being and an extraordinary lawyer. Incredibly well-educated and very professional in everything she does. I would agree with you on that, and I think everyone will appreciate that you give kind thoughts to your chief of staff. That's always extremely nice. Um, one last thing, uh, if I may. Can you remind us that, well, it, it's my understanding, and it was in the case when we served, that chiefs of staff are, are hired and fired essentially by the prime minister's office at the end of the day. It'd be difficult for you as a minister to retain a chief of staff that was not in favor with the prime minister's office. Is that true in your case? I am not going to comment on the interactions between my office and the prime minister's office. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. thank you very much, Ms. Reid. Ms. Cal Ms. Khaled. Thank you, Chair, and, and uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Wilson-Raybould, for, for appearing today and, and sharing with us uh, your, your viewpoints on this. Um, I've, I've always felt that you've been a very vocal advocate on, on issues that you genuinely believe in, um, without regard to 
uh, to other viewpoints. You've been vocal at Cabinet. You've been vocal uh, to the Prime Minister. You've been vocal uh, to Canadians. In fact, you've gone on the record uh, at many public events, and, and you've really expressed your, uh, your viewpoints on issues that you genuinely believe in, such as the Indigenous file. Um, and and uh, just going through uh, your your testimony um, and 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 your your chain of events, I, I see that there hasn't been um, communication uh, between you and the prime minister himself from September up until the time when he called you for the shuffle. Why is that? Why didn't you uh, speak out to the prime minister when you've been so vocal on issues um, such as the indigenous file? And, and you know that you have the access, why did you not speak out to him when you had these concerns? And, uh, and, and did, did you, did, do you feel that you had an obligation to do so? Well, I need to say a couple of things with respect to your question. I completely reject your characterization of... that I didn't, I do not have regard for other people's opinions. And you talked about the cabinet table and with respect, you would have um, no ability to know about discussions around the cabinet table. Um, I don't apologize for being vocal um, with my opinions. That doesn't mean to say that I don't value other people's opinions because um, for the entirety of my professional career and how I was raised um, in terms of consensus-based decision-making, it is incredibly important to take into account the views of other people. Um, that's how we make good public policy in this country. Uh, you talk about Indigenous issues. I'm a proud Indigenous person from the West Coast Absolutely. of British Columbia, and I will not apologize for being a strong advocate um, pursuing transformative change for Indigenous peoples in this country. I have worked um, in uh, the Indigenous world as a politician for a significant amount of time and have a very in-depth um, understanding of the issues that Indigenous peoples face. That's not to say everybody agrees. Ms. Wilson, and I appreciate to hear other people's opinions. And to your question with respect to the Prime Minister, I believe I've covered that ground. I had a direct conversation with the Prime Minister as I had direct conversations with the people in his office and the clerk of the Privy Council. Please excuse me, uh, Ms. Wilson-Raybould. I was referring to, to your vocal advocacy as a sign of strength, um, you know, as a... Uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a member of parliament and your colleague, having worked with you, I acknowledge um, your effectiveness in, 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 in advocating for the issues that you genuinely believe in, and, and we appreciate that. Thank you uh, for, for your service. Um, I, I, I do want to, uh, to just understand uh, here, um, you, you mentioned the, the political interference um, being cited as the Quebec election. And the Quebec election was over um, at the beginning of October. So if you can please help uh, Canadians understand from October to, uh, to December, what was the, um, what was the context of, uh, of, of the inappropriate pressure? Sure. Um, yes, the Quebec election was something that was brought up um, uh, on the September the in the September the 17th meeting. Um, there were many other inappropriate um, uh, conversations and attempts at political interference that occurred after that date. Um, an example, which I've already um, talked about, was after I had made my decision as the Attorney General, which is entirely within my discretion to make, there were repeated attempts by people in the Prime Minister's office to get me to hire external legal counsel to evaluate my decision. There were further conversations about the election coming up, and if um, SNC were to move, um, this would be detrimental um, to the election. Um, I further said that when we're talking about jobs and job losses, and of course I don't think there's anybody around this table that doesn't want to prevent job losses, um, that it was appropriate in the initial th phases. But after I had made my decision as the Attorney General not to enter into 
um, or issue a directive. The successive and sustained comments around jobs became inappropriate because I had made my decision and everybody was fully aware that I had made my decision. <laughs> I believe where it got even more heightened were what I described as the veiled threats that came towards the latter part of this time frame around December the 18th and December the 19th. There were many different occasions where the appropriateness line was crossed. So just to clarify, Ms. thank you. Just to clarify, Ms. Wilson-Raybould, um, all right, so from from uh, uh, from after the Quebec election up until the end of December, um, as as per what you've just said, are, are, are you stating, and I, I'm just seeking clarity here, are you saying that it was inappropriate because you had expressed that your mind had already been made on this issue? My decision not to issue a directive had occurred prior to the September 17th meeting. The Quebec election, any partisan considerations um, before or after are entirely inappropriate, not relevant to me at the time wearing my judicial hat as the Attorney General in terms of considerations about whether or not I was going to exercise my discretion and issue a directive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Rankin. Thank you. Just a technical question at the front end, uh, Ms. wilson Rebo. I wonder if you could provide the committee with a copy of all the text messages and emails that you referred to in your testimony? Um, I hear the question. I'll take it under advisement. Thank you. Um, you were, in referring to your conversation with Mr. Wernick, uh, the top public servant in the country, the clerk of the Privy Council, in an answer to a question, you said something about waiting for the other shoe to drop. What did you mean by that? Well, as I, I said before in questions, this was a very tense conversation. I had a high level of anxiety. This was the combination, or the culmination rather, of many um, phone calls and face-to-face -face meetings. Um, what I meant by I was waiting for the other shoe to drop um, at the end of the conversation, that's how we closed out our telephone call, um, was that I was under the understanding based on what the clerk had told me that he was going back to talk to the Prime Minister before he left, um, recognizing what he had also told me, that the Prime Minister was dug in, that he was firm, that it's not a good space to have an Attorney General at loggerheads with the Prime Minister. I had a heightened level of anxiety that I would um, be getting either a call from the Prime Minister the next day, which the clerk indicated might happen, and that there may be further direction or um, another outcome um, for me as the Minister of Justice and Attorney General. In other words, consequences for you doing your job as an independent AG and, and saying you'd made your decision up, that was it. It could be consequences of what you inferred from that conversation. That is a fair assessment of how I interpreted the conversation. Now, You've told us about a lot of officials in the Prime Minister's office, a senior clerk, clerk of the Privy Council. Do you not think that Canadians, because we're doing our job for Canadians to get to the bottom of this, that we would have a better understanding of the situation if we heard from the, the officials that you've referred to? Well, I, I can't speak to whether or not you have a, have a better understanding. I. I believe that um, it is important to hear from um, as many individuals that have direct um, connections or interactions in this case, um, which is why uh, I am, I don't know if pleased is the word, but I'm fine to be here and having this conversation um, because I, know that it is important for me to put the facts 
before this committee for your consideration. Thank you. Um, you said, uh, wrote something very interesting on in your remarks, and I'd like to read it to you. You said, the history of Crown Indigenous relations in this country includes a history of the rule of law not being respected. Did this, in your history, your experience that you've referred to, did this inform or strengthen your resistance to any potential perversion of the rule of law, that history to which you referred? I, my lived experience is incredibly important for um, my my background, my upbringing, how I think about the world. Um, it's that lived experience, not only as a professional, but being rooted in my Kwakwakiwa culture and the values that I was taught by my father and mother and my grandmother um, that brought me to my role as the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. And... I believed, and I still believe today, that it is incredibly important to have a diversity of perspectives and background and to have a country, and we live in the greatest country in the world, that respects every individual with um, a recognition of the need for equality, of the need for justice. And in the case of Indigenous peoples, that we continue to work hard to create the space for Indigenous peoples to find their place and see themselves in the mirror of our Constitution. Well, I, I understand that I, my time is almost uh, at an end, and I just want to sincerely thank you. I want to thank you because you've presented a list of facts that I believe a reasonable person listening to this and believing you as I do would have to conclude, demonstrate a, sustain, a sustained pattern of political pressure and interference with the independent role that you swore an oath to fulfill. And I cannot uh, but think that we have more work to do as a result of your testimony. So I thank you sincerely, not just on my behalf, not just on our behalf, but on behalf of Canada for your courage in being here and telling us what happened. Thank you. Next we go to Mr. Bossano. Mr. Bossano. Thank you, much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and Ms. Wilson-Raybould. It's, um, I really appreciate that you're here today. You and I have worked on a number of files together on a number of projects, and so I want to um, acknowledge your land acknowledgement as well. And if I were back in Treaty 6 territory, I might say something like Mio Totaku and Tatawa, which is Cree for guests. You're welcome. There's room here. So I appreciate what you've done. Uh, and that uh, reconciliation and uh, reconciliation with Indigenous peoples is, is all of our responsibility and the responsibility of all Canadians. I just want to ask a question because um, we all have our different ways of, of working and I, I think it's it's known to people who've worked with you that you're a texter and so I just want to know I'm if a what? Sorry? You, you like texts, you communicate oh. well by texting. And did you ever express any concerns to Jerry Butts in writing via text message when you were Attorney General? Were there any concerns expressed to him at all? about this matter? I would have to check, but I can't think of one off the top of my head. Okay. Did you ever speak or write with Miss Katie Telford at all about the issue of SNC-Lavalin uh, or other issues while you were AG? Yes. Did you ever speak about the issue of SNC-Lavalin, particularly with Miss Telford? Not that I recall. Thank you very much. Now, you see the Prime Minister regularly. You're in, you're in the House daily, the cabinet meetings, there are committee meetings, um, cabinet room, caucus, other meetings, other events. You've talked about the September 17th meeting, and, and I have your document here, and I appreciate that you've provided a written document for us here. Uh, that meeting is with the clerk, was with the clerk and the Prime Minister. My question for you is, is this, as Attorney General, and given all of the interactions that you detailed uh, on that morning that played out over the course um, that you detailed with us this afternoon, everything that played out over September, October, November, and December, including the meeting with Ms. Prince, did you not have an obligation to raise these concerns with the Prime Minister, to call him or write him or st stick up for your, your personnel or indicate that you felt that inappropriate pressure was being applied? 
So I did raise the inappropriateness of the conversations. I raised it with many individuals within the Prime Minister's office. I raised it with the Prime Minister on January the 7th. Let me say this. When, and again, I am confident and know my role as the Attorney General, and I know and understand that I am the final decision maker on this. Mm -hmm. When faced with sustained pressure from, or um, attempts at interference from September the 17th up to and including December the 19th um, by the Prime Minister's office, by the Clerk of the Privy Council, by the Clerk of the Privy Council invoking the Prime Minister's name, um, I had concerns, well, I had beyond concerns. I, um, uh, why would I go to the prime minister to raise these concerns when I knew for certain that this, the DPA with SNC would not occur because I am the final decision maker. And I'll get other back to that issue of final in decision the prime making. minister's office that were putting pressure on me to change that um, included by virtue of the conversation with the clerk, the prime minister. So I appreciate that. January 14th, you accepted a new appointment to cabinet as the mm -hmm. minister of veterans. And you know what it's like in caucus. There are people, I mean, people run, they want to be MPs and people want to serve around the big table. And that's part of being in this role. And it's a great honor to serve as, as a minister in any portfolio. Uh, and I can't imagine uh, the great honor that it would be uh, to serve the people who've served this country and who now live after having served. And so after you reaffirmed, on that day, accepting that position, you reaffirmed your confidence in the government. Is that the case? I was incredibly um, honored to be the Minister of Veterans Affairs. It was a very different position from the one I had, but I embraced it. And I had a lot of um, considerations to make on a personal level over um, the time of Christmas and into the new year. And I'm getting to answer your, your question. Um, I had serious concerns, as I said, that if I was no longer the Attorney General, that there would be a deferred prosecution agreement entered into and that it would be posted in the Gazette. As I said, I would have resigned from Cabinet at that time. I decided um, a very conscious decision to take on the role that the Prime Minister offered me, and yes, it is an incredible honour. I don't want anybody to misconstrue that. Um, I decided that I would take the Prime Minister at his word. I trusted him. I had confidence in him. And so I decided to continue on around the Cabinet table with the concerns that I had around SNC because I took the Prime Minister at his word. Thank you. So that oath that you took today, that oath that you took on January 14th, reaffirmed your confidence in the government. Do you have confidence in the Prime Minister today? I'll say this, and I'm not going to get into any conversations about why I resigned. I resigned, other than to say this, I resigned from Cabinet because I did not have confidence to sit around the table, the cabinet table. That's why I resigned. And my question wouldn't be why you did resign. My question would be why didn't you resign before? Folks, um, I, we, we are now, um, we've completed three rounds. Do we have people that wish to go to a fourth round? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we will go to a fourth round. It, is, is the, would, would the witness like a break, a bathroom break? I don't or even know what time it is, so. <laughs> We, we, Ms. Well, I, I, it, I can tell you it's uh, 5.53. Um, would you like a break, Ms. Wilson? No, I'm good. You're good? Okay. So the fourth round, uh, just so that I have it correct, um, starts with six minutes to the Liberals, six to the Conservatives, six to the Liberals, five to the Conservatives, three to the NDP. Uh, so, Mr. Boissonneau, I, are you continuing? I am. Mr. Boissonneau. Chair? I would be happy to. So, okay, it's going to go red. Okay. So, Ms. Wilson-Raybould, you know that I come at these things from uh, a non-legal perspective. I was in business before this, and uh, I'm learning what it's like to be on the Justice Committee. And so it often leads me to seek to understand certain legal principles. And so we've heard 
here today and in testimony from other witnesses, including Wendy Berman, Kenneth Jull, and the clerk of the Privy Council, that the AG has a role to play uh, in remediation agreements. And you mentioned in your in your document here the concept of prosecutorial discretion. And one of the duties of a prosecutor is to dis determine whether to prosecute or not, correct? Okay. So from the, from the Public Prosecution Service of Canada handbook, which is available on the Justice Department website, if anybody wants to look at it, it says very clearly, when deciding whether to initiate and conduct a prosecution, counsel must consider uh, two issues. Is there a reasonable prospect of conviction based on evidence that is likely to be available at the trial? And if there is, two, would a prosecution best serve the public interest? So with this in mind, would you agree that the two questions for a prosecutor are reasonable prospect of conviction and public interest? Those are definitely questions that the uh, prosecutors take into account. Okay, so then to go back to the handbook, on the basis of the available material, Crown Counsel must continually assess at each stage of the process whether the prosecution is in the public interest. So I look at this from outside of the legal community and with the need to continually assess in mind, wouldn't it be fair to say that a decision to continue with the prosecution is never final and is subject to reevaluation in the light of the reasonable prospect of conviction in the public interest? So the AG should have an open mind to new information coming in all the time. And really, the decision is never final because it's still active. Like, you have to continually assess new facts and new information. Is that not the case? Are we talking broadly or are we talking with specifically to SNC and the DPA? Well, broadly first, and then I'll get to SNC Lava. Well, I recognize that it is entirely within the prosecutor's ability and discretion uh, to continue to evaluate prosecutions. I was a prosecutor proudly um, for almost four years. Okay, thank you very much. So then I also saw that in the Justice Department material um, issued last year in September uh, that a goal of remediation agreements, one of the goals, is to reduce harm that a criminal conviction of an organization could have for employees, shareholders, and other third parties who did not take part in the event, in the offense. So if we then look at the criminal code, uh, section 71531 sub F, it says that a, remedia a remediation agreement is to quote, reduce the negative consequences of the wrongdoing for persons, employees, customers, pensioners, and others who did not engage in the wrongdoing while holding responsible those individuals who did engage in that wrongdoing. So I think it's fair to say that with the the extent of the company, its, its, its history, the fact that it employs almost 9,000 people in the country, 52,000 globally, there's a local impact uh, on the communities, home to many innocent pensioners, suppliers, and customers. In your consultation, you said you, you did a due diligence. How did you take into account the public interest uh, and the impact on the thousands of innocent employers, pensioners, and suppliers if a DPA would not be entertained? So, Mr. Chair, I believe we're treading on dangerous ground here. I um, fundamentally um, uphold my responsibility as a member of parliament in the subjudiciary rule and do not feel it's appropriate, one, for me to answer questions with respect to um, remediation agreements, the criminal code, or in relation to SNC and DPAs. I believe that's the nature of the question, and I think that members of this committee should tread lightly on interfering with active cases before the court. I, Mr. Chair, I appreciate the warning, but Ms. Wilson-Raybould, my question is about the public interest. It's not about a particular... It's not about a particular matter, and the clerk and perhaps the chair can uh, clarify the sub matter, but how could an AG make a decision, and in your words, have a final decision without taking this information into account? It's clearly in the public interest. Again, and I would appreciate some comments from the chair on this, but I will say, and it's entirely appropriate, and I said it in my testimony, 
as the attorney general, all attorney generals get section 13 notices from the director of public prosecutions. The contents of that notice are between the director of public prosecutions and the attorney general of Canada. I will not go into talking about any of the, any of the situations, scenarios, conversations about the national interest with respect to SNC Lavalin and I would appreciate hearing from the chair on this. Thank, thank you very much. So what I would suggest is is to keep it to general or a hypothetical of, of a situation and not to deal with the SNC question specifically as to her decisions on SNC. That's my suggestion. Members, of course, have the absolute right to ask questions here. And the witness has the absolute right to answer or not answer based on her own inclinations. And then the committee, should they decide that they want to ask her to answer regardless, has that power. So my request is to try to keep it general or hypothetical um, to the extent you can. I appreciate that. Let me ask this question then. Um, what, on what legal, um, what legal doctrine or what legal principles uh, led you to the conclusion that the conversations that you were having with members of the PMO and other colleagues had, in your words, constituted inappropriate pressure? What, on what basis did you make that assertion, what legal basis, because we heard from legal scholars that the, the bar is really high and the bar is very close to, to direction and having a conversation, a robust conversation about the public interest or about saving 9,000 jobs or 52,000 jobs is completely legitimate and appropriate conversation. So what's the legal basis on which, what's the doctrine you used to say that your decision was final and you were done taking in new information? Uh, well, I appreciate the question and I can reiterate what I've said earlier. Um, I recognize that um, when I was the Attorney General and certainly Attorney Generals before me and after, um, it's entirely appropriate to consider discussions around the public interest. And I um, had discussions with colleagues um, with respect to SNC and deferred prosecution agreements about the um, potential losses of jobs, the potential of SNC moving, um, but having taken into account everything that I did when I was the Attorney General, including having conversations with my department, my Minister's Office staff, and doing my own due diligence, I had made my decision that I was not going to exercise my discretion and issue a directive, either a directive under Section 10 or under Section 15 mm -hmm. and take over the prosecution because I believed it was inappropriate to do so, recognizing that the Director of Public Prosecutions had made their decision. Thank you very much. We're Thank you. Go to Ms. We go to Ms. Raitt. Thank you. Just back on the directives for a second, Ms. Wilson-Raybould, my understanding from taking a look at reports, these directives are very rare in practice. I mean, I think there have been three substantive ones in the past 13 years, two from yourself, one on HIV positive uh, prosecutions, one on, I believe on Indigenous prosecutions as well. I think that was recent, but it didn't make it onto the list. And one from our government uh, on terrorism. Other than that, my recollection is that there really aren't any other directives uh, of a significant heft on policy. Uh, so if I may. Yes, please. I, um uh, yes, there was a directive around, um, I can't remember the exact thing, yeah. um, around terrorism. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a directive that I uh, issued and was pleased to work with uh, the, the member, uh, yeah. um, Mr. Boissonneau, on the HIV directive, which um, I had to um, follow the process that's outlined. Yes. It was a general directive, as mm -hmm. the terrorism one was, um, to provide guidelines to the public prosecutor. Uh, in issuing that directive, I had to follow procedures, including um, putting the directive into the Gazette. Prior to that, um, I had conversations with the Director of Public Prosecutions, Kathleen Roussel, about the HIV directive, mm -hmm. as is entirely appropriate. Um, so that directive uh, came in uh, in early December. December. Uh, the other directive, I believe you're referring to um, the Indigenous Litigation Directive. Yeah. This was not something that I issued through the gazetting process. Ah. This was a directive, an internal directive that I am really happy to have issued um, 
uh, internally within the Department of Justice in terms of indigenous litigation. Um, this did not go through the gazetting process because it was a directive to the litigators in the Department of Justice. That helps me very much. Now I know why it's on the list, so that's good. But rare. Uh, these things are rare. They're, they're very unique and special. They're, they are very rare. That's not to say that it's not a tool that an attorney general can utilize. Um, general directives, the two that we've spoken about, um, have been issued, but there has never been uh, a specific directive issued on a particular case mm -hmm. before the courts, nor has there ever been utilized under Section 15 an attorney general taking over the prosecution. Yeah. It is um, and would be um, a first if that were to happen. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. <laughs> Extraordinary. Thank you. Um, I have a question about some testimony that the clerk of the Privy Council gave to this committee. Mm -hmm. I'm a little troubled by an inconsistency. I'll be honest, and I just wanted to get your take on this, and it's, it's not that difficult. It's not he said, she said this time. Um, the clerk of the committee told us that he learned that a deferred prosecution agreement was not going to be offered to SNC-Lavalin sometime after September 17th, sometime in the fall, he said, and he learned about it through a National News Watch story. Now, your testimony here tells me that he was sitting in the room for the meeting where the Prime Minister brought up the Deferred Prosecution Agreement. Is that your recollection that he was in the room September 17th and would have known that SNC-Lavalin had been told by that point that they were not getting a Deferred Prosecution Agreement because he was part of the conversation around that topic? Uh, the Clerk of the Privy Council would have known on the September 17th meeting because I um, specifically mentioned it um, to both he and the Prime Minister going into detail about the Section 13 notice that I received and that, and again, I was very clear that I had already made my decision around the Deferred Prosecution Agreement and not intervening. Thank you. And um, this committee uh, is here to study a number of issues and to probe the conversations that you had. Committees by nature tend to send reports to Parliament as a result of their their study. Um, I'm wondering if you would have any recommendations for this committee for their report in order to help into the future. And I'm not getting into any specifics, just having gone through what you've gone through, anything that you think we should be reporting into Parliament, that would be helpful to our colleagues. Well, now that you mention it. <laughs> um, I mean, I th this is a very serious question, and yeah. I'm going to try and give you, well, I'm not going to try, I'm going to give you a serious answer, and I've thought about this a lot. Um, I hope that the committee um, takes into, to your previous question, as much uh, information and evidence as, as you can. Um, I appreciate the study on remediation agreements, talking about um, a relatively old doctrine, mm -hmm. the Shawcross Doctrine. Um, I would think it would be a, a very useful study for this committee to look at the role of the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada and whether or not those two roles should be bifurcated. Mm -hmm. I believe, and I have believed this for some time, even before I became the Attorney General, that um, our country would benefit from a detailed um, study and consideration around having the Attorney General not sit around the cabinet table like they have in the United Kingdom. Okay, thank you. Is that it? You have uh, 10 seconds. That would be it. Take a <laughs> breath. Have a drink of water. Thank you very much. Thank Ms. O'Connell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you again. Um, I want to speak a little bit about uh, the Privy Council Clerk, Mr. Wernick, his testimony. And um, he spoke about the Shawcross, uh, the Shawcross issue. And in some of his testimony, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm sure we could pull up if you want the exact text. But he, he talked about um, Shawcross in the context of there's always conversations. I think you even acknowledge that there are legitimate conversations to be had for consideration. Um, and Mr. Wernick pointed out, and, and part of Shawcross, which I think is relevant here, and I'm going to quote, in order so to inform himself, he, in this day and age, it's also she, may, although I do not think 
he slash she is obligated to consult with any of his colleagues in the government. And indeed, as Lord Simon once said, he would in some cases be be a fool if he did not. End quote. So that's referring to Shawcross and what Mr. Uh, Mr. Warnick said. In your testimony um, today, you mentioned that uh, on September 16th, when there was meetings with your chief of staff or a phone call with um, Mr. Bouchard and Marquez, um, the comments were, and you put it in quotes, we think we should get some outside advice on this. Then on, again, referring to your testimony, October 18th, it was also Mr. Bouchard who spoke to your chief of staff and asked if we could get in a, the option of seeking external legal opinion on the DPP's decision not to an extend an invitation. Referring back to September 16th, there, because I, I heard your testimony that you said you had, had made up your mind on the issue and that you were not going to intervene. However, in that September 16th uh, commentary that you provided, it was expressed that they said they understood the individual Crown prosecutor wants to negotiate an agreement, but the director does not. So that somewhat indicates to me that even within the prosecution side, um, there was debate. There was debate on whether or not this was appropriate. And then, so is it unreasonable then if there's even still debate within the Crown Prosecutor's Office or whomever they are referring to there, is it unreasonable then to bring out other advice which was asked for on September 16th as well as October 18th to see what legal options there were since there was clearly... Um, within whether it was with yourself your office the prime minister's office within the prosecution there seemed to be disagreements or differences of opinions let's put it that way why would it have been unreasonable and then referring back to the uh, Wernick testimony and Shawcross in saying that you would want to consult as much as possible on these types of matters so if it if there were still some differences of opinions what would the objection be to bringing in another opinion, an outside legal opinion? Well, I, I think I'm, I'm fine with it. We're going over very similar um, ground here. Um, but I had made my decision as the Attorney General. I did not need external legal counsel. I did not need people in the Prime Minister's office continue to suggest that I needed external legal counsel. That's inappropriate. Um, but I will say, with respect to the conversations that you mentioned um, with Mathieu Bouchard and his um, remarks about um, a, an individual prosecutor um, as being different from that of the director of public prosecutions, I can't help but wonder why he would bring that up, how he would know that, how he garnered that information. It is entirely inappropriate for any member of the Prime Minister's office, and it would be entirely inappropriate for any member of my staff or within my department to reflect those conversations because I would have serious concerns, and I did at the time and still do, concerns about how that information was acquired and from whom. Thank you. So if you felt um, that that information was so inappropriate September 16th, did, it, did you consider resigning? Like, if it's moving forward and, and they continue, did you not consider resigning then? I did not consider resigning then. I was, in my opinion, doing my job as the Attorney General. I was protecting a fundamental constitutional principle of prosecutorial independence and the independence of our judiciary. That's my job. That was my job, rather as the Attorney General. And as long as I was the Attorney General, I was going to ensure that the independence of the Director of Public Prosecutions in the exercise of their discretion was not interfered with. 
Do you still have confidence in the prime minister today? I, I'm not sure how that, that question is relevant. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now go to Monsieur Paulus. But Monsieur Paulus, uh, Mr. Cooper has asked me to give him the last three Ooh. minutes of this five minutes, so I'm going to tell you at two that we're going to Mr. Cooper. Oui, merci, uh, Monsieur le Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Wilson-Raybould, on December 19th, when you received the call from the clerk of the Privy Council, Mr. Vernick, the highest um, public servant in the land, he said, and I quote, he wanted to give you context on this issue. How did you feel about that? Um, well, I believe that the, the clerk also made similar comments um, when he was before the Justice Committee. Um, as the Attorney General at that point, after four months of these conversations, um, well, actually not even after four months, after making my decision, I was entirely comfortable that I had the appropriate context in which to make my decision. Um, I do not, as the I did not, as the Attorney General, live in a vacuum. I have the ability to engage in, read papers, have discussions about the reality of SNC and deferred prosecution agreements. Of course, I was sitting around the cabinet table. Um, I didn't need any context. I certainly didn't need context about the exact same context that I was provided for or in four months previous to that. Did you feel that this was uh, an interference in justice, an obstruction of justice? I f it wasn't an interference because I never let it happen. There was, um, and let's be clear about that, um, there was a concerted and sustained effort to attempt to politically interfere with my role as the Attorney General. As the Attorney General, I did not let that happen. Merci, Madam. Thank you, Madam. Much, uh, Ms. Wilson Raybould, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a sad day. Uh, and I thank you very much for your candor uh, here uh, at committee. Um, going to the uh, Clerk of Privy Council, the call that you had on December 19th, was it typical to receive a call with the Clerk of Privy Council? Did that happen often? The answer is no, um, but I can't and I could endeavor to think further about this. It's not that I haven't had conversations with the clerk of the Privy Council one-on-one. -on -one. I did have a conversation with him on September the 19th one-on-one -on -one in my, my office. Um, I have known the clerk for many years and throughout the course of my being uh, a minister, um, we have had the opportunity to have um, conversations, but a, um, a direct conversation or a direct meeting is something that wasn't very regular. Right. Well, thank you for that. And in your opening statement, uh, you uh, characterized uh, the meeting by, by stating that, uh, quote, I was having thoughts of the Saturday night massacre. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Uh, well, I, I'll give a bit of a Wikipedia version of the Saturday Night Massacre, um, and perhaps people know what that is. Um, so the Saturday Night Massacre is something that's commonly uh, referenced in and around um, uh, uh, former President Richard Nixon when he, in the early 70s, asked his then Attorney General um, to dispense of a special prosecutor. Uh, the Attorney General said no and resigned. Uh, um, the President, the then President, then asked his Deputy Attorney General to do the same thing, and that person resigned. Um, so it's commonly referred to as the Saturday Night Massacre. Anybody can look it up. Um, uh, so <laughs> I, um, having said that to the clerk, obviously was having um, thoughts about 
um, what was happening, um, the potential for direct direction. Is that right? The potential for direction f coming to me from the prime minister and my having to consider resigning. So it was cer certainly a little more than... Last question, last question. It was, uh, well, I was just going to make a comment. It was a little more than the clerk uh, just checking in with you as he characterized it. The clerk was checking in with me on SNC and deferred prosecution agreements. Thank you very much. We now go to the NDP three minutes. Uh, Mr. Angus, is, 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 are you going to do this? Mr. Angus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wilson-Raybo. Uh, and I'm actually very honoured to be sitting at this table today uh, because what I feel we've witnessed is not politics. We've witness, witnessed a lesson in integrity. I think that the testimony that you gave today will be studied in schools for decades to come and Canada will be a better place for it. Because the greatest thing we can ask of any public official is to speak truth to power. And I really noticed that in your resignation statement. So I have a very short period of questions. I just want to make sure I understand the frame correct. Because it seems what we heard today is a sustained and constant attempt by very powerful actors in the Prime Minister's office who are ob obligated to uphold justice and the rule of law, yet attempted to interfere with the practice of the rule of law. Would that be a correct assumption from the testimony that you've provided to us? Uh, I, um, thanks for the, the comments and the, and the question. Um, again, I um, know that there was a consistent and sustained effort to attempt to politically interfere with my role as the Attorney General. And I, and I really want to say this, and, I, and I'll be brief. Um, I do not want members of this committee or Canadians to think that the integrity of our institutions has somehow evaporated. The integrity of our justice system, the integrity of the director of public prosecutions and prosecutors is intact. So I don't want to create fear that that's not the case. It is incumbent upon all of us to uphold our institutions and to uphold the rule of law. And that's why I'm here. Well, I thank you for that because I was really shocked when I read the testimony that you provided recording for Mr. Warnick, the clerk of the Privy Council, who was obligated to be uh, the nonpartisan voice of the civil service. And he said, I think he that would be the Prime Minister, is going to find a way to get this done one way or another. He's in that kind of mood. I want you to be aware of that. And then you referenced the Richard Nixon firing of the special prosecutor as a side issue. But would you take from that, he's in that kind of mood, and I want you to be aware of that, that you were being f given a direct threat regarding the Prime Minister? I believe that there were three occasions in that conversation where there was a veiled threat. Okay, thank you. I know I only have a few seconds left, but I've heard my colleagues in the Liberals today say, why didn't you resign? Why didn't you raise this as though it was your responsibility? And then why did you not get outside advice to help you change your mind? I'm really pleased to, that you say that these were attempts to obstruct and to interfere with justice, but the justice system is intact. My question to you is, are you worried that the Prime Minister's office was seeing the role of the Justice Minister as a figurehead that could be moved around, could be changed or interfered with based on the partisan or political needs of the moment? I, I'm not going to speculate on um, considerations in the Prime Minister's office or opinions. Fair enough. I just want to say, Mr. Exhausted Chair, you, I, just, uh, Mr. I want to move a motion. Mr. Angus, uh, you've the exhausted your time. Calls on the Mr. Angus, Prime you've Minister. exhausted your time. I, you, you, you're not, you don't have the I'm floor. moving a motion. I, I, I think I passed on. What? Sorry, I, I'm moving a motion, Chair. I, I had not, okay, so I had at that point already said, Mr. Angus, you're out of time. And my microphone was still on and I said I was moving a motion. I didn't hear you say you were going to move a motion. I heard um, you, I, I said yes. you were out of time. I was going to move to the committee to ask to the committee if they wish to go on to another round of questions. I will come back to your motion after we establish whether we want another round of questions. Okay. Folks, do you guys want another round of questions? Yes. yes? Okay, so there's a desire for another round of questions. Mr. Angus, what is your motion? I don't know if we need another round of questions. No, I think we're done. We're done. Yeah.
Well, so so. Couple things, you know, th th a couple of things. So just just for clarity, though, Mr. Angus, you're not actually a member of the committee. Mr. Rankin is here, so you can't move a motion. Let's, let's go with that. Number two, the is the issues with with respect to moving forward on another round. Um, if there's a disagreement with that, then we would have, I guess, to have a motion and a vote. Um, if we're not consensually moving to another round, do I have a motion to move to another round of questions, Mr. Boissonneau? Um, is there a debate on that? Is there is there any debate on that? All the, all, all, the, all those in favor of moving to another round? Okay, so we we're, we're agreed to move to another round. Now, um, the next round. First of all, Ms. Ms. Wilson Rebold, you have been sitting here for quite a while. Would you like a break? Uh, I'm okay. You're okay. But, uh, You're if okay. We, if we get to I, like I nine o'clock, I probably will have a different answer. <laughs> I applaud. Please let me know if there is at any point you feel you need a break. So the next round, which would be uh, going back to the way the first round goes, it's six minutes to the Conservatives, six to the Liberals, six to the NDP, six to the Liberals. Ms. Rate. Ms. Rate. Thank you very much. I, uh, I don't want to keep going over and over the same grounds, but if I could just summarize and you can tell me if I've got this right or, or not. Um, the reality is, is that for a significant amount of time, from the time you made your first decision to the time in which you were moved into Veterans Affairs, you had upheld the rule of law by withstanding the overtures and the entreaties of uh, various people within the government, within the Privy Council office, within the, the, uh, the staffing to the government. And as a result, uh, we can draw the conclusion that your movement, not out of cabinet, but your movement within cabinet was as a result of the fact that you didn't play ball um, with them and deliver what the Prime Minister wanted, which was a solution for the SNC-Lavalin political issues that he had before him. Is that, is that a fair summation? Um, I believe that committee members can draw their own conclusions, sure. and um, I will uh, uh, not comment on conclusions of committee members. Yeah, that's fair. Um, at the very beginning, I asked you about witnesses uh, that could potentially come forward. Of all the individuals that you have named, helpfully, and put brackets around, um, do you believe all of them would be able to give insight into what happened in these certain circumstances? Because there's conversations that they may have had that you weren't privy to that may help illuminate what was going on? I'll answer it this way. I believe that individuals that I've named in yeah. my testimony, um, uh, having been involved in those conversations or meetings, um, would uh, have perspective about those meetings. And again, um, I think the more information that this committee uh, has um, and testimony from individuals that were directly involved is important. Um, so not a trick question, but do you have any knowledge of the friendship and relationship between Ben Chin and the Vice President of Government Relations for SNC-Lavalin? Do you have any knowledge that they go back to um, the McGuinty government and were great friends there? In fact, they're relationship goes back further than, than their political interaction. Do you have any knowledge of that at all? I have no knowledge of that. Do you have any knowledge of the fact that Mr. Butts as well has a long-standing relationship with the VP of Governmental Affairs of SNC-Lavalin and back they too worked together in the McGuinty government in the province of Ontario for a long period of time and probably know each other? I have no knowledge of that. Did you think it was odd that the Chief of Staff to the Minister of Finance would be requesting meetings with respect to uh, your authority on deferred prosecution agreements or even in the conduct of criminal prosecutions? Was that a surprise for you? I, 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 I was aware of initial conversations that um, the Chief of Staff to the Minister of Finance had with my uh, chief of staff. Um, and I didn't consider it hugely problematic, but the sustained um, communication uh, I did find problematic and um, not sure why um, anyone from the Minister of Finance 
the Ministry of Finance, the Department of Finance, would be talking to my chief about something in terms of my role as the Attorney General. Why do you think that the provision that amended the criminal code regarding deferred prosecution agreements ended up in the budget implementation bill and, and not in your criminal justice reform bill? Um, this, the um, deferred prosecution agreements and providing an additional tool to prosecutors was uh, something that was being advanced by a number of ministers around the cabinet table, including the Minister of Finance. Um, I, of course, as the Minister of Justice, am responsible for the criminal code and as such um, was um, part of the documentation and the discussions leading up to and including the introduction of the budget implementation bill with respect to deferred prosecution agreements because I alone can change the criminal code. Right. And did you, uh, did your department or did your department uh, at the time have any input into the discussions around changing the integrity regime, which was uh, out of public works? Were you, was your department involved in that as well? Um, I can't be precise on the number of conversations that were had, but certainly um, the minister, minister Qualtro uh, was involved in the integrity regime. Um, my department uh, worked with uh, hers around consultations, but the extent of that, I know that it was not a Department of Justice lead. Yeah. Um, it was the lead of um, the PPSC. Last question that I have for you. Out of all of the lobbying that happened on this, including, admittedly, with our party, SNC went in to talk to everybody, and I believe my colleagues as well were spoken to by SNC. I don't see your name on the list of those who were lobbied. Were there any requests made by the lobbyists of SNC to come in and visit you and talk about the issue of deferred prosecution agreements, given that it, you're the only one that can change the criminal code? There was never a request. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Sahoda? Thank you. Um, Ms. Wilson-Raybould, I really do appreciate you emphasizing that our system is intact and uh, there is a lot of integrity in our judicial system. Uh, I know that, you know, after today's hearing, there are going to be those concerns uh, raised and you have testified to that. Uh, the Clerk of the Privy Council has testified to that. Um, but what I what I want to get into a little bit is is that issue of responsibility that you have in your role as Attorney General. And today, you know, we discussed, I think, at some point in November, it seemed like you had, you know, you were, had enough contacts made and your mind was made up. Why, if you felt the issue was so serious, why did you not uh, resign or pick up the phone and really have that serious conversation with the Prime Minister uh, at that point? Well, I, um, I made up my mind in September and I articulated that to the Prime Minister. Um, I felt no compulsion to resign because I was doing my job as the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. I had made a decision around um, my discretion and exercising it with respect to issuing a directive or taking over a prosecution around SNC and, and the Deferred Prosecution Agreement. Um, okay, so how about, how about on uh, January 7th, you said you had a conversation uh, with the Prime Minister about changing uh, your portfolio to Veterans Affairs. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, did you bring up your concern to the Prime Minister about what you felt uh, the reasoning was for, for the change? Yes. Okay, uh, but you still took on uh, knowing what you had known and what, feeling what you had been feeling. If, if, if interference was happening, if the pressure was so serious, and, and you had justified just now that the reason you resigned later on is because not that you did not have confidence necessarily in the prime minister or you wouldn't put it that way, but you didn't have confidence being at the cabinet table. Um, why was that decision made then and not at the time of uh, that you were offered Veterans Affairs? Um, so I can't talk about uh, any further about my resignation or any conversations or how I felt um, because that's not covered in the OIC waiver that's been provided to the committee. Um, but I did reflect on 
um, while I was still the Minister of Justice and Attorney General over um, beyond December the 19th and up to and including December 14th um, about um, my role, about my concern and my uncertainty around whether or not the government or the incoming Attorney General, and I didn't know who that was at the time and that's irrelevant, um, would enter into a deferred prosecution agreement with SNC. And as I said, if I had seen, which is required, a um, notice in the Gazette around a directive, um, I would have immediately resigned upon seeing that. Okay. Um, you, you bring it up the Saturday Night Massacre. I can bring up, uh, you know, we've had other attorney generals, a uh, specific one in BC, Brian Smith, you know, who faced, uh, f faced some challenges and what they did in their role, they felt their responsibility was to resign at that point. Did you not see it as your responsibility to resign if the issue was so serious? At the time, I, I did not see it as my responsibility to resign. I saw myself as the Attorney General of the country who was doing her job to ensure and uphold the independence of the prosecutor and uphold the integrity of the justice system and the rule of law. Okay. Um, in November 4th, you uh, you had your three-year anniversary of being sworn in. Uh, you put up a Twitter post about thanking the Prime Minister uh, and what an honour it is to be in this role. Uh, to me, you, you also posted up your oath of the Privy Council, and within that oath, uh, uh, it's taught... It said that I will treat all things to be treated, debated, resolved in Privy Council faithfully, honestly, and truly declare my mind and my opinion. Now, this is an oath you took, the Prime Minister also took. So in my mind, when I think about the conversations, I've never been there around the cabinet table, uh, I would think that as colleagues, you guys will have open discussions about uh, the interests and uh, acting on different files, making decisions, and the Prime Minister would be open and completely honest, just as you would uh, be to him uh, about what was happening. And in this regard, I feel like you had held back in your position, uh, even though the Prime Minister had mentioned on several occasions his concern about the public interest, about the loss of jobs. I can, without equivocation, say that I did not hold back as the Attorney General in this case. More broadly than that, as the Attorney General and also as the Minister of Justice, I always felt it appropriate to raise concerns, to engage in discussions and debate, and always speak, as I've said, my truth to power. I did that. In this particular case, I was entirely comfortable on September the 17th questioning the Prime Minister on whether or not he was politically interfering with SNC and DPAs. And he said no, and so did you believe him at that point? Because on January 14th, you took on a new role as another in another ministry. Well, as I said, I, um, I took him at his word. I took him at his word after I directly questioned him in September and took him at his word after I directly questioned him and Jerry Butts in January. I chose to take them at their words. And so on uh, January 14th, you also had faith and belief that there was no interference and that's why you carried on with taking on a new role? I had serious concerns about it. Um, but again, I took the Prime Minister at his word. Uh, so uh, thank you, Ms. Sahuda. We're going to Mr. Cullen, and I just want to just advise everyone that the NDP has advised me they have a motion they wish to put forward. After we finish the rounds of questions and we have no more questions, I will allow the uh, the NDP representative, Mr. Rankin, to put forward the, the motion, okay? So, uh, Mr. Cullen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wilson-Raybould, for your, uh, not only your testimony, but your endurance today mm -hmm. as we've, we've gone into some time. Um, it's... Uh, this, this, the directive you talked about, how we talk, Ms. Rate questioned about how rare it was and how unique it was. Can, can you say again that it has never been used in a specific case? Was that your testimony here today, that an attorney general has never used the specific director, directive on a specific case, like, as in the case of SNC-Lavalin? Is that right? That's correct. So not only is this tool incredibly rare, it has never been applied in the way it was being suggested by 
the clerk of the Privy Council, all the other people that consistently lobbied you to use that tool. They're asking you to do something essentially historic. The an attorney general has never issued a specific direction in a specific prosecution, nor has a attorney general in this country ever issued a directive, um, or sorry, rather taken over a prosecution. Right. It would be historic for it the first time. It would be historic. Time. So what you were being asked for is not only extraordinary in this case, you were being asked to do something that, un unprecedented. Is that fair? With respect to a specific prosecution, specific case. yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm a bit confused by this line of logic that I've heard my liberal colleagues just recently use. They're questioning essentially, I think, your integrity for not quitting. I thought your integrity was enhanced by not quitting, by staying there and, as you've just said, maintaining the rule of law. Am I? What 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 am I finding confusing about this? You should have quit when you were being pressured inappropriately consistently by some of the most powerful people in this country. You resisted that pressure. You said you were not going to give this plea deal, this special offer, and you stayed in the job. People are questioning your integrity for having taken that course of action. Do you, do you understand my confusion and why Canadians might be confused? I can say this. I have always acted with integrity, with purpose, and with principle. I was doing that in my role as the Attorney General when it came to SNC and um, the Deferred Prosecution Agreement potential. Um, I suspect that this committee will have discussions about the testimony <laughs> and uh, differences good. of opinions, but I also believe in Canadians and their ability to hear the words that I've spoken, hear the facts that I've expressed to make their own determinations. Okay, well, I think many of us are making our own determinations based on what we're hearing today. The, the ability to seek one of these special, I'm calling them plea deals, I'm not a lawyer, these, these deferrals, you, you, they can't be made for political reasons, is that correct? That's correct. It's illegal, in fact, to be, for a view to have made the decision based on political motivations. Is that it correct? It would be unlawful for me It'd to be, do that. It would have been unlawful for you. Is it unlawful for someone to ask you to do that? <sighs> to ask, to direct me or to ask Pressure me? you. I mean, this is there, there's a line that's being contemplated. First, when this story first broke, the Prime Minister said everything is false. And then there was no pressure put. Oh, there was some pressure put. Don't worry, the clerk says it was appropriate pressure. All pressure to do something that we've heard from your testimony today that had political motivations, which would have been against the law for you to do as the Attorney General. Am, have I said anything wrong to this point? No. Okay, good. Is it illegal for someone to pressure the Attorney General to offer a special plea like this for political reasons? Is it illegal for someone just to pressure the Attorney General to intervene on a case? In my opinion, it's not illegal. Mm -hmm. um, it is very inappropriate mm -hmm. depending on the context of the comments made, the nature of the pressure, um, the specific issues that are raised. Right. It's incredibly in inappropriate and is an attempt to compromise or to impose upon an independent um, Attorney General. So there was pressure put. <clears throat> there was veiled threats you talked about. You repeatedly asked those threats to stop, those communications to stop with you and your office. Is that correct? That's right. And it continued. You said, I'm not doing this. I've already made up my mind. I have, you have sound legal reason for your mind. You're upholding the rule of law. And the pressure continued. The veiled threats continued all the way through December. Is that correct? It continued. I wouldn't say that the veiled threats mm. continued throughout the mm. time frame. Oh. There was an escalation in terms of the pressure okay. or the attempts at political interference that culminated okay. in the meeting on December the 19th. So up until that meeting on December the 19th, starting way back in September, you had given notice, you've made your decision. The decision is already, the train has left the station. You're not going to interfere with the public prosecutor, the independence of the prosecution to do their job and uphold the rule of law. 
you ask for it to stop, it in fact escalates in terms of the pressure. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, so so an in independent, yeah, <laughs> the independence of the Attorney General's office. I'm just reflecting on the Prime Minister's argument about the importance of the rule of law in Canada when dealing with Huawei, and that the argument consistently made by this Prime Minister was he had no choice because he so believed in the rule of law. At the very same time, he and his staff, his key advisor, and the clerk of the Privy Council, and others in his staff from the finance minister on down, are not respecting the rule of law and your independence as the Attorney General of Canada. I find the contradiction, the hypocrisy of this situation breathtaking. And I've seen a bit from Liberal governments. I, thank, I, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Collin. Uh, so now we will go to Mr. Sassi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair. Now, uh, my first question is, uh, you had an opportunity to speak to the abilities and the discretion of prosecutors. Um, I want to ask you about the obligations of prosecutors. Uh, you're fully aware of the handbook uh, for prosecutors, um, and those are your duties and expectations that you are passing on to prosecutors. In relevant part of that particular handbook, it says, Crown Council must continually assess at each stage of the process whether the prosecution is in the public interest. So if they have an obligation to continually uh, reassess, would you mind explaining to us why it's your opinion that when you made your decision on September 16th, it wasn't your obligation also to continually reassess the facts? Um. I am provided as the Attorney General um, with notices by way of Section 13 in the, Dir in the Director of Public Prosecutions Act from the Director about issues of general interest. Um, we receive, I received when I was the Attorney General, many of these notices. Um, this is the Director raising, as I said, issues of general interest. Um, and saying that they are providing this information to me at the time as the Attorney General to um, do as I deem appropriate. Um, I made my decision based on information that I received from the Director of Public Prosecutions by way of that note. I did my due diligence. Again, was firm in the decision that I made. I have never said that it's not um, within the ability or the um, job or the discretion of a prosecutor to continue to evaluate the case that they have before them. Of course they can. It's the case um, in every prosecution. The prosecutor can act based on the circumstances, based on the facts, based on the input that is presented to them. I am not the prosecutor. I have the ability to be notified by the Director of Public Prosecutions by way of Section 13 notices. Thank you. It would seem to me that, uh, that everyone who, um, who has this responsibility has an obligation uh, to uh, look at, at the facts as they change. Now, uh, I had a question about timing. Um, again, if you could explain to us uh, why you did not bring to anyone's attention your misgivings about the legal process until after you had been appointed to another portfolio. I'm sorry, I, I don't understand the well, question. Um, I am not at liberty to talk about anything after I was no longer the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General. When I was the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General with respect to SNC and deferred prosecution agreements, I did raise um, my concerns about the inappropriate nature of the interactions that I was having. And, and when did you, did you raise this? from September the 17th through to including the December 19th meeting through to the January 7th meeting that I had. So all your expressions of concern are the ones that you have detailed in your, your opening statement? 
Well, I, I mean, I, I appreciate actually answering this question because um, I know that the letter from the chair was for me to come here and give my complete account. Um, uh, I have done my best to give my complete account, but there is um, um, due to time <laughs> in terms of my opening statement, I had to confine my comments to um, certain um expressions and meetings and details. That's not to say that it is a complete account of everything that was said. And um, certainly I have the inability to speak to anything that occurred after December the, or January the 14th. And could you provide us with the basis uh, as to why you think that everything that happened after you were appointed to a new portfolio is actually uh, cannot be waived? What is the obligation that you cite? Uh, I am, am not going to speak to that. Um, I um, have received the order in council and the waiver that's been provided to me to speak about matters that um, would be covered by solicitor client privilege and cabinet confidences um, to this committee and to the ethics commissioner for the time that I was the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada. And thank you for that. I guess just, I, I don't want to intervene, but it just to, to, I think that was, the question was so that the committee knows just on what basis, and, and, and I'm guessing that it's cabinet confidence because you wouldn't have solicitor client after you became Veterans Affairs Minister would be on cabinet confidence, correct? Is that what? Every conversation what? that I may or may not have had when I was the Minister of Veterans Affairs with the Prime Minister or not with the Prime Minister up to and including the meeting that I had um, with my then colleagues around the cabinet table would be covered by cabinet confidence. That, that's, I think, what he was trying to get out. Thank you. Um, so we now have a question. Do we move to another round, colleagues? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Agreed. So this round, the cons uh, oh, sorry. first, before I do that, Ms. wilson Rabel, do you need a break? I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to go another round, but um, probably after that, I will ask that but, but um, we reconvene now, at another time and so we can course. continue but the discussion. But if you need one now, I, 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 I'd be very happy to give you a, a, a 10 minute break. Would, would, you, would that be helpful in any way? Actually, I'm, I'd prefer not to have a oh, break. Okay. I, do, I do have to say, and again, I'm happy to answer questions, but the nature of the questions seem to be um, very similar and we're continuing to go over the same ground. If they're, and, and I'm happy to continue to answer answer um, those questions, but um, I just wanted to put that out there. But if there is another round after this one, I would um, ask the committee that we, um, that I be able to come back um, and answer questions. I understand. I understand. And we'll, we'll, and the committee will definitely take that into consideration on, on its decision after this round. Uh, but I think we, we can perhaps look at this being then the last round for, for today. Um, so uh, this round, is um, six minutes to the Liberals, six to the Conservatives, six to the Liberals, uh, five to the Conservatives, three to the NDP. Um, so, uh, Ms. Khaled? Uh, uh, Monsieur oui, Monsieur Fall. Oh, excusez-moi. Oui, oui, oui. Yes, um, J'ai promis, uh, oh, Monsieur Fortin était Monsieur à Fortin. nos réunions avant, puis il a demandé le temps de parler. On lui a donné, on lui a accordé trois minutes à la fin de la dernière ronde de questions. Um, so what I'd like to the ask the committee, I need consent of the committee. Do we agree that at the end of this round um, that we give three minutes to Mr. Fortin, three minutes to Ms. May, and three minutes to the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation for its first questions in Parliament in 50 years in a committee? <laughs> Is that okay with everyone? Is that okay with you, Ms. Wilson-Raybould? Absolutely. Thank you very much. So uh, we will start with the Conservatives. Oh. Uh, no, no, sorry, Excuse Liberals, me. Ms. Khaled, I'm sorry. We're here, round six, Ms. Khaled. Thank you, Chair, and uh, and thank you, Ms. wilson Raybould. We we really do appreciate uh, your patience and and uh, and you uh, continuing to stay on here, as as I I'm sure that Canadians have a lot of questions and uh, and and uh, to to get a lot of uh, a lot a lot of your truth out. Um, you had mentioned um, in in the the meeting um, with uh, Jessica Prince and, uh, and and the Prime Minister's Principal Secretary and, and Chief of Staff that when um, when your Chief of Staff left that meeting, she was very upset, um, and and with with respect to kind of understanding um, what that was uh, and and what what measures could have been taken at that point, um, 
you know, I, the the clerk said also, um, Mr. Wernick, um, that uh, in his testimony he'd listed out some of the the remedies that that were available. He he talked about going to the prime minister uh, and speaking and having that tough conversation with the prime minister. He talked about picking up the phone and and calling the ethics commissioner. And he said ultimately, as a last resort, resigning. And and I, I don't think anybody expected you to resign. But we're just trying to understand um, kind of the context and and how you were feeling as you were going through all of this. Um, so I, I, earlier in my, in, in my questions to you, um, I had asked if you had spoken to the Prime Minister from the, your September 17th uh, meeting going up to the time when, when, he, when he spoke to you um, with respect to your new appointment. Um, my, my question really is, why didn't you speak to the Prime Minister during all of that as all of this was building up, as, as, as you've indicated, as, as all of these things were happening, why did you not speak to the Prime Minister? Why did you not call the Ethics Commissioner? You're, you are concerned, and as you rightly should be, about the rule of law. Why didn't you take any of those measures? It didn't have to be uh, to the point of resignation. Well, I won't deal with it to the point of resignation. Um, but again, I, I did raise this with the Prime Minister directly on September the 17th. And... Um, from that point through to and including December the 19th, there was a sustained and continued uh, attempt to politically interfere. Those meetings consisted of uh, many people within the prime, prime Minister's office, including the Principal Secretary to the Prime Minister and the Chief of Staff in reference to the meeting that you talked about with my Chief of Staff, then Chief of Staff, Jessica Prince. Yes, she was upset when she came out of that meeting because of the um, continued and escalating um, pressure and interference that was placed on her to relay back to me as her minister from the principal secretary and the chief of staff. Those conversations included the principal secretary saying that this situation would not be resolved without some kind of interference. And the other um, statements from that meeting are contained within my opening testimony. It was my understanding after I had had the opportunity to speak with my then chief of staff that there would be potentially a meeting or a call the next day, because I was in Vancouver, with the clerk of the Privy Council and the Prime Minister. Um, so I was waiting to get a call um, from the clerk and or the Prime Minister. Um, that call happened with the clerk, who invoked the Prime Minister's name throughout the entirety of the conversation. That call ended the next discussion that I had, and everybody was going on holidays, I was confident in the knowledge that there would not be um, any interference with the discretion because I was the Attorney General and I'd made my decision. We all went on holidays. The next conversation that I had was on January the 7th with the Prime Minister where I raised this issue. You've you've been able to uh, to reach out to the prime minister in the past, um, but but I I still don't understand why you didn't reach out to him when this was such a, an important issue. It was not raised with the ethics commissioner uh, either. Um, but and and I uh, please pardon me. I I have not been able to 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 get clarity on this. Um, I I just want to flip to to one other thing that, that we have spoken about today. Um, and it is with respect to remediation agreements, which uh, which uh, my colleagues have, have addressed at length. Um, do you agree with, with remediation agreements in principle? I was part of a cabinet that brought in the additional tool to prosecutors um, that they could utilize, and that tool was deferred prosecution agreements. So you do agree uh, with deferred prosecution agreements in principle? I do not believe that my personal opinion um, on deferred prosecution agreements is relevant. Well, I, I think with the, the scope of, of the motion, um, it, it may be relevant uh, for us to consider. The scope of the motion? The, the whole reason that why we're here today. 
um, with, with the motion speaking specifically to understanding the nature uh, of, uh, of, of, of remediation agreements, of deferred prosecutions, uh, et cetera. Uh, and and I, I do believe that, uh, that you had voted in favor of, uh, of deferred prosecution agreements as part of the, the budget bill. Well, that's, a, that's clear. I already said that I did. I was part of a cabinet that brought this tool in, and Parliament passed the legislation, and the criminal code was amended in September of 2018. I would submit that discussions around deferred prosecution agreements um, are irrelevant to this discussion. What is relevant to this discussion and that's the discussion that we've been having now for some time, is the role of the Director of Public Prosecutions, the role of the Attorney General of Canada, and the necessary independence that is um, a constitutional principle for prosecutors to be upheld. I believe that is the relevancy of this discussion, not whether I agree or disagree or any member of this committee agrees or disagrees with the tool of deferred prosecution agreements. Thanks for clarifying that, Ms. Wilson-Raybould. Thank you very much. Mr. Barrett? Um, Ms. Wilson-Raybould, thank you very much for uh, your extended uh, testimony with the committee. Is it your assessment that the Prime Minister has been accurate and truthful in his statements concerning this issue? I, I'm not going to comment on uh, statements of, uh, of the Prime Minister or, or anyone else as um, to their um, validity. Okay. And uh, Mr. Chair, uh, we'll cede the rest of our time. Thank you. Thank you very much. If the Conservatives are ceding the rest of their time, that goes back to the Liberals. Who is up? Mr. Boissonneau. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Madame Raybould, j'ai une question pour vous en français. Um, et c'est la question, question c'est dans French. votre rôle In en tant role, que procureur général. Uh, est-ce que vous avez jamais, uh, quand vous étiez procureur général, est-ce que vous avez jamais reçu general? des conseils uh, des sources externes du gouvernement, comme des avocats et des cabinets d'avocats, sur les grandes questions uh, um, de, de, de loi ici au Canada outside, with ou des projets Canadian de loi? Law or bills? In my role as the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General of Canada, I have received advice from external lawyers. I have um, taken it upon myself to um, foster relationships with previous Ministers of Justice and Attorney Generals of Canada. I, again, feel it's very important to uh, have a diversity of views about particular mm -hmm. issues, and I welcome uh, feedback from individuals, particularly where it has to do with putting forward legislation and changing um, uh, the criminal code, for example. Thank you very much. You mentioned in, your, in the document at the beginning of, of this session, your testimony, that you conducted a period of due diligence. Could you share with us who you conducted, conducted due dis diligence with in this SNC-Lavalin matter? Uh, I don't feel it's appropriate to share that. But it's, the, the privilege has been waived, and so is cabinet confidence. So who did you consult with? Why I don't feel it's appropriate to answer that question is because it gets into discussions around the nature and the content of the Section 13 notice that was provided to me as the Attorney General from the Director of Public Prosecutions gets into topics that are right now before the courts. Okay, but back to my earlier line of questioning, which was this issue of, you know, the openness to receiving new information and making sure that there is never a final decision. Let's look at this a different way. What is the number of individuals that you consulted with during the due diligence before you came to what you have told us is your final decision, even though the law permitted you to continue to look at having a deferred prosecution agreement? And you have said very clearly that the principles of law indicate that you need to have an open mind before there is a final decision. And in fact, it can't ever be a final decision. So how many individuals did you consult with in your due diligence? Well, actually... Sorry to interrupt. With, with apologies to Mr. Boissonneau. Uh, the time. There, is, um, there was a, qu a question raised specifically about ex external references. Uh, the witness, Ms. Wilson-Raybould, said because it's sub judici, it's before the courts, she was unable to comment on it. And Mr. Boissonneau continued, we've heard... This is a totally different matter. Uh, totally no, different, you asked, totally you different asked, line. No, you were asking for numbers, you were asking Ms. for specific... Ellen, 
the yeah, issue of external me, I'm not guys, actually addressing guys, you, Mr. Boss. You know, I'm we, talking we, to the we, chair. We, I understand. So let, let Mr. Collin finish his point, and then I'll. So when a, when a witness is asked a specific question, and then the question is reframed, but essentially the same question, the witness has already said this is sub judice. We're now three hours, three and a half hours into this meeting. It seems strange to me that an argument that has been used often to prevent witnesses from testifying at this committee, sub judice, the, the argument, is now being offered I, up by the witness in front of us. And it's not being accepted. The, the questioning continues. And oftentimes, as you know, Chair, when a witness says, I'm unwilling or unable to answer a question, we as committee members simply accept it at that. So a couple of things. I don't recall any witness having been refused to this committee in three and a half years on the sub judici rule. So mm -hmm. that is not correct. Mm -hmm. With respect to Mr. Boston's question, he's attempting to rephrase the question in a different way. Um, I, will, I, I will alert everybody again that Ms. Wilson-Raybould made the point that the sub-judici rule applies to specific questions with respect to SNC-Lavalin, that we do not want to have an impact on the appeal of SNC-Lavalin on their questions of the remediation agreement, and therefore her specific interactions with the Department of Public Prosecution and others within the Department of Justice would not necessarily be... <coughs> You know, the committee can do what it wants. It's the master of its own domain. Everybody can ask those questions. There's, that's that's an, a, a restraint that we choose to put on ourselves. So there's nothing either unfair of him trying to rephrase this question. I, I'd encourage him to do it in a different way. Or alternatively, for the witness to refuse to answer the question on that basis. And and that's 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 where I think we should go. We have uh, two and a half, three and a half more minutes on Mr. Boissonneau's testimony, uh, Mr. Boissonneau's questions. Mr. Boissonneau. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> You, Ms. wilson Rebel, if you think he got his question finished, you're more than welcome to answer it. Well, I, I, I will say what I was going to say in, prior to the discussion of committee members. Um, Mr. Boston, I'm, I am not trying to be evasive. I take incredibly seriously my responsibilities as a member of Parliament. And to have conversations about what I did and didn't do around um, due diligence with respect to a Section 13 notice, um, I think that the, um, with respect, the committee should realize that at the time I was the attorney general of the country and to, which makes me different than anybody else with respect to that circumstance. And it, it would be very inappropriate for me, um, with respect to go into any of these discussions. I appreciate that. I appreciate the answer. And my question to you is this, once you made your final decision and you mentioned that in your testimony, does that, would you say then that your mind was closed to new information in a new context? I had made my decision um, where to not interfere with the decision and discretion of the director of public prosecutions. I am made aware as the I was made aware as the Attorney General about general interest prosecutions by way of Section 13 uh, notices from the Director of Public Prosecutions. I had made my decision on this particular matter. That is not to say um, that the prosecutor in this case or any other case does not continue to work on the case, to take in new information, to have discussions with whomever they deem appropriate throughout the course and the evolution of a prosecution up to and including a potential trial. Thank you. Can you tell us where you memorialized your decision to not proceed with a deferred prosecution agreement in this matter? Where I memorialized Like where you mem 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 made a memo or indicated that today's the day we're done, my decision's final. Where would you have recorded that? Um, well, this is not a direct answer to your question, but I take copious notes. So it's in your notes somewhere? Um, I am faced with many Section 13 notices, mm -hmm. or was when I was the Attorney General. A question for you then is, did the Prime Minister, the Clerk, or the pre PMO ever direct you to enter into a remediation agreement with SNC-Lavalin? No. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. We now go to the, uh, to the Conservatives. Uh, Mr. Cooper. Uh, great. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you again, Ms. Wilson-Raybould. Uh, a number of members opposite have uh, repeatedly uh, raised the specter of these conversations as uh, somehow being in relation to the 
public interest and, uh, and therefore somehow appropriate. And I just want to ask you, uh, are factors such as the Quebec election, uh, finding a solution for SN SC SNC, as the Prime Minister stated when you met with him on September 17th, uh, the fact that the Prime Minister is a member of Parliament from Montreal, uh, the fact that SNC Lavalin's council is not a shrinking violet, or as the clerk of the Privy Council informed you on December 19th, quote, I think he is going to find a way to get it done one way or another. So he is in that kind of mood, and I wanted you to be aware of that. Are any of those things appropriate considerations in exercising your prosecutorial discretion with respect to the public interest? No, those are not appropriate. Thank you. Mr. Cooper, uh, next is Mr. Rankin. Well, we've been here, Mr. Chair, for now several hours, and I think uh, I'd like to move the motion rather than take the time to do so later. I, wave, I would not use my time for anything but to make the motion at this point. The motion, there is no problem. But remember, we had said Mr. Fortin, Mr. Absolutely. May, and Mr. Weir. So, would you like to wait no, on like your motion? To, I'd like to move the motion okay. in the time allotted to me, and then I'd like to have a vote if there's a need to do so. And then, of course, we'll hear from the others as you've agreed, as we've agreed. Okay. I mean, that's it, fine with me. You have a right to move a motion within your time. I'm, I'm only pointing out that that requires the witness then to to stay here for those last questions as opposed Absolutely. to liberating Absolutely. This her. is a short a okay. short motion. And it goes like this, Mr. Chair. In the interest of transparency and accountability, I move that the Justice Committee call upon the Prime Minister and the Governor in Council to extend the waiver of solicitor-client privilege and cabinet confidentiality relating to the SNC-Lavalin issue so that the former Attorney General can inform the Justice Committee of any relevant information with respect to the period subsequent to her ceasing to serve as the Attorney General of Canada on January 14, 2019. In other words, Mr. Chair, we've got to a certain point and we've been told that thereafter we cannot ask questions and the witness cannot tell us what happened. I think the evidence is abundantly clear that we need to know that and therefore I'm moving that this committee request of the Prime Minister and the Governor and Council that that order and Council be altered accordingly. Thank you very much. Um, what I'd first ask is, does anybody need time to consult and discuss this motion in, within themselves, or are you, is everybody good to go ahead and debate and vote? I'd like to just pose a question. Uh, there, Mr. Ms. Khaled? If it's okay with you, um, can we just confer amongst our that's, liberal that's colleagues? What I was, that's what I was asking. So, can, can I can I ask the question again, Mr. Rankin? You you move the motion. Can we ask the last three questioners to go? No, that's fine. And I, then I, I and then have just a brief pause for the consultation. Certainly, I would just that, wanted to get their motion on the record, and I'm more than happy to consider it a notice of motion. But I would like to rec I would request that we come back to it immediately uh, absolutely, after the absolutely, testimony absolutely. today. Absolutely. So Thank what you. I'm suggesting is let let's have Mr. Fortin, Madame May. And Mr. Weir, get uh, their three minutes Certainly. in. Let the witness be liberated, and then we can come back to this. Yes. And I just have a brief. <laughs> I just Thank have you. a brief pause. The word "liberated" is probably not the right word. So, uh, so, so thank you very much. Um, who, who goes? Qui veut aller premier? Monsieur Fortin, première. Madame Way, uh, Monsieur Weir? Mr. Fortin first. L Ladies first. Okay, Ms. May. I'll go first. Um, Gayla Kessler, I want to ask something that's just very clearly, and then I move to a different line of questioning from what others have been asking. And that is, uh, first of all, do you believe that individually or collectively the pressure which, to which you were subjected contravened the criminal code? I don't believe that. Okay. Mike, there are a lot of power relationships we've been discussing, and most of the questions have gone to the power relationships around political actors. The chief of staff, uh, the principal secretary, the prime minister, your role as both two hats, judicial hat and cabinet hat. Uh, but there's a very prominent role being played by, I think, unusual actors in the civil service, where the power relationship is the clerk of the Privy Council is the boss of the deputy minister at the Department of Justice and down through the chain uh, with you essentially, I think, acting as a bulwark to protect the independence of the Director of Public Prosecutions. What I wanted to go back to in your testimony, there are a couple of places where you mentioned some things and I wondered if they were uh, concerning to you and if so, why. So in chronological order, you mentioned that on September 7th, 
the deputy minister was, was able to have certain sections of the Section 13 notice read aloud to her, but she did not want to receive or be given a copy of it. Was that in any way concerning to you? It's included in your testimony. I just wanted to pursue it. Uh, yes, that was a concern. And why were you concerned? Well, I, um, again, I, uh, as the minister, uh, as the attorney general, I worked very closely, not only with my chief of staff, but with the deputy minister. Um, and this applies to my then deputy minister and the clerk of the Privy Council when um, public servants get involved in political discussions. Uh, of course, I have concerns, and I believe it's inappropriate. So going to September 17th, you described the meeting which you had requested of the Prime Minister on a different topic was supposed to be a one-on-one -on -one meeting, by which I uh, infer you did not expect the clerk of the Privy Council office to be present when you went to meet with the Prime Minister. Is that correct? I didn't expect that. But I will, have, I will say that um, the fact that he was there, I didn't ask him to leave. Okay. So in the context of the pressure that was being applied and the political concerns that were being raised, I'm going to put forward a positive statement, see if you agree, that the appropriate role for the clerk of the Privy Council office is to support an attorney general who says, you're in a dangerous ground here, back off, this is political interference. The job of the civil service is to remain nonpartisan and give good advice. Did you think the clerk of the Privy Council was behaving appropriately in applying political pressure to anyone in this case? I did not believe that he was um, behaving appropriately, um, which is why I was very surprised when he raised issues of the Quebec election and a board meeting that was supposedly happening with SNC. Do you believe that the clerk of the Privy Council appeared to be placing your Deputy Minister of Justice under pressure that could have affected her confidence in her job security? Honestly, I don't believe I can answer that okay. question. And lastly, you said that you... you you got to wrap up. That's your last... You're, you're sort of over your time. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Monsieur Fortin. Merci. Thank you. Ms. Wilson-Raybould, I also want to thank you for your presence here today. And I want to underscore that Testifying like you have done today requires a lot of courage, and I appreciate that. Having said that, I have questions that may go in a different direction, but I'd like to get back to your uh, motivation for your decision. There are some things you can't tell us. I understand that. But my first question is the reasons why you felt that it was not appropriate to come to uh, an agreement with SNC-Lavalin after having looked at the uh, criteria of uh, Section 715 of the Criminal Code? And, and the question, um, all I can say with respect to the question was that I did not believe, based on the Section 13 notice that I received from the Director of Public Prosecutions and the due diligence that I undertook, that it was appropriate with respect to SNC to um, issue a directive and intervene in the prosecution, to intervene in the discretion that was exercised by the Director of Public Prosecutions. Est-ce que vous avez discuté? Did you discuss the reasons why you felt that this was not appropriate to have such a, an agreement? Did you discuss this with the Prime Minister or someone else in the Prime Minister's office, for instance? I did. Qu peut savoir avec qui vous... Can you tell us with who you discussed this? I, I discussed it with the Prime Minister, with the Clerk of the Privy Council, <laughs> with Elder Marquez, with Mathieu Bouchard, um, among other individuals, including the principal, well, indirectly, um, my chief of staff, Jessica Prince, discussed it um, with the principal secretary to the prime minister, as well as the chief of staff to the prime minister, as well as the chief of staff to the minister of finance. Et je comprends que vous... I understand that you feel that you can't tell us today what these motivations were why you felt that uh, there should not be any negotiation? Uh, I um, felt 
uh, I, I feel, I felt at the time, and made the decision that it was inappropriate for me as the Attorney General to interfere in the discretion that was exercised by the Director of Public Prosecutions with respect to SNC and the um, decision that was made to not enter into negotiations around a deferred prosecution agreement. Merci beaucoup. Monsieur Fortin. Mr. Fortin, Mr. Fortin, I'm sorry, but your three minutes uh, three hours and three, three hours and a half, and you can't give me 30 extra seconds. I'll give you 30 seconds more, just 30 seconds, so that everybody knows. I want to understand Ms. Wilson Rabel's testimony. It seems to be important for all the citizens to understand that aspect of the situation. This is uh, pretty surprising here. Now, I'm not saying your question isn't important. I'm just stating the fact that your three minutes are up. I'll give you 30 seconds more if you wish. Ms. Wilson Raybould, 30 seconds. I'm sorry, but your decision not to intervene, was it based on one of the conditions of application under the criminal code for negotiations of a remediation agreement. That's under the sub judici rule. I, no, I'm sorry, it's not. I wasn't asking her what the reason was. I was wondering whether that's within the criteria. She can answer if she wants. Thank you, Mr. S uh, Chairman. I'll allow my, Madam Wilson-Raybould time to answer. Thank yes, you. Madam Wilson um, Mr. Weir. Well, thanks uh, very much for the opportunity, and Ms. Wilson-Raybould, thanks very much for your uh, extensive and informative uh, testimony. I'd like to ask you to expand a bit on the idea of separating the role of Attorney General from that of uh, Minister of Justice. It seems that under our current system, the Prime Minister could choose to appoint two different people uh, to those posts. Is that what you would recommend, or do you envision making the Attorney General uh, an Officer of Parliament or somehow officially separating it uh, from the government? Uh, well, I, I, mean, I don't want to um, get too far in advance. I really hope that the committee will consider uh, looking at studying this. I um, always try to look for um, um, ways to move forward. Um, I, I think that it would be entirely appropriate for this committee to look at um, different models internationally. I mentioned uh, the United Kingdom, where the Attorney General is not a member of Cabinet. Um, the two hats that um, the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General wears here in, in our country um, are completely different, and I think there would be merit to talking about um, having um, Having those as two separate uh, individuals, obviously, um, after much discussion and study, uh, the prerogative of the government of the time, um, what they would choose to do in that regard, and the Prime Minister. Is that an idea you ever floated to the Prime Minister or to the clerk of the Privy Council office? I would, I would say no, because I can't remember a concrete discussion where we had that we had. Um, but there have been times where I have raised the issue internally when I was the minister with um, um, individuals, and potentially I could have had conversations with other um, other colleagues. Okay. Now, you were asked about whether you supported deferred prosecution agreements, and I don't want to push that question again. I do want to ask, though, if you could describe what the ideal candidate for a deferred pro prosecution might be? Well, I think that it's um, the the tool of a deferred prosecution agreement and um, considerations that uh, the director of uh, public prosecutions or prosecutors can take into account are uh, delineated and articulated within the criminal code. Okay. Uh, no, that's good for me. Thank you so much. So I, I want to take this opportunity to th thank Ms. wilson Rebold very much for her testimony. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. And, and, and now um, we are on Mr. Mr. Rankin's motion, and we've been asked for a short uh, pause to consider uh, discussion. So um, can, can I just uh, say the meeting is suspended for five minutes? Five minutes.
We have been listening for the last almost four straight hours to some stunning testimony from the former Attorney General and Minister of Justice Jody Wilson-Raybould before the Justice Committee. She leveled some uh, very particular allegations against the Prime Minister's office and some cabinet officials. She's shaking hands right now, as you can see, inside the Justice Committee room. No longer anymore. I want to read uh, the, the op beginning of her opening statement, probably most germane to the allegations that she made throughout this testimony and there was so much to unpack, and of course our power panel is standing by to do so. But she said, for a period of approximately four months between September and December of 2018, I experienced a consistent and sustained effort by many people within the government to seek to politically interfere in the exercise of prosecutorial discretion in my role as the Attorney General of Canada in an inappropriate effort to secure a deferred prosecution agreement with SNC-Lavalin. Within these conversations, she went on to say, there were express statements regarding the necessity for interference in the SNC-Lavalin matter, the potential for consequences and veiled threats if a DPA was not made to SNC. So essentially backing up all of the allegations that were made in the Globe and Mail initially uh, at the beginning of February and adding many of her own. As I said, I want to bring in the power panel now to unpack this. We're standing by. We expect to hear from perhaps Jody Wilson-Raybould herself, who could speak to reporters. You see her there uh, leaving the room. We're expecting to hear from the leader of the op official opposition, uh, Andrew Scheer, the leader of the NDP, Jagmeet Singh. And finally, the Prime Minister at about 8 o'clock is scheduled to speak to reporters. We're going to take you to all of those, uh, those uh, press conferences live. But let's start with the power panel. I'm joined by Chris Hall, Tim Powers, Kathleen Monk, Amanda, uh, Amanda Alvaro, and Connie Walker. Uh, Chris, I'll start with you. I don't even know what to, it, it, it was yeah, stunning. It, 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 it was more than I think than anyone expected. We knew that she had asked for this 30 minutes. We knew that she wanted to give her side of the story. Uh, I'm not sure anybody really expected the extent to which she detailed uh, what she called 10 calls, 10 meetings involving so many people inside both the Prime Minister's office and the Department of Finance. I'm, uh, I'm going to cut get, you oh, off because she she's is. here at the mic. Let's take a listen in. Well, I, I welcome the opportunity to, to go to the Justice Committee. I'm, I'm pleased that I had the opportunity to, to um, present my testimony and to answer, I think, was it six rounds or seven rounds? Um, uh, but it's important, and I was happy to, to be able to speak to them. Well, this will be able to be with in caucus since you can't really say you trust uh, you, uh, Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau. I am um, proud to be the member of parliament for Vancouver Granville. I was elected as a liberal member of parliament and that hasn't changed. Ms. Ms. But if, if you are kicked out of caucus, what will it mean? If you are kicked out of caucus, what would it be? Well, I don't anticipate being kicked out of caucus. I was elected by the constituents of Vancouver Granville to represent them as a Liberal member of Parliament. Ms. You were asking Rayburn. There was a recurrent. There was a recurrent. There was a recurrent question from the Liberals. It was asked of you at least a dozen times. And that was, and the Prime Minister raised this as well. And that is, why do you not resign? Uh, you were asked over and over, why did you not resign, faced with your disagreement about how you felt you were being pressured? And your answer again, if you can walk through. Well, I, I'm not trying to be evasive, but I. Um, want to say that my testimony before the Justice Committee um, speaks for itself. I know that everyone here will be able to have access to it. Um, the order in council and the waiver that was provided uh, is for me to be able to present to the Justice Committee and the Ethics Commissioner um, and in no other venue. Then, well, so you are trying to make a point. Well, this well, Wilson what, can, what, what, how, it looks like your truth doesn't match their truth. How much of a problem is that for the Prime Minister? Again, I uh, am not at liberty, um, to use a word that was used in the committee, to, to speak about this. My, uh, my order in council on the waiver um, only covers uh, my testimony at the Justice Committee and with the Ethics Commissioner, and I would ask everybody here to read my testimony. You you know, and that was Jody Wilson-Raybould, who just finished about four hours of testimony before the Justice Committee addressing reporters. She said she remained, the most important thing she said there, she remains a member, a Liberal member of Parliament for Vancouver-Granville. She was asked if she remained in caucus, and she said yes, and she said she also didn't expect 
to be kicked out of caucus, which is interesting yeah. to me. She is daring them to kick her out of caucus, and it's a move you have to wonder uh, that the government have to wonder why the government isn't contemplating that. Clearly, there is a major disconnect in stories, uh, but it could be a real damaging thing for the government when they've had a series of damaging actions. If they were to boot her out of caucus, because that almost validates everything right. that she said. The prime minister has got to find a way to say, "Look, these tensions exist. I've aired them. We'll find out if he does at eight o'clock." Can I just say this though? Um, she did what the she did in the immediate short term from a public relations perspective to the Trudeau Liberals, what a long-standing Gomery inquiry did to the Martin Liberals in the short term. Right now, over the next number of days, this is a kaboom moment, uh, and the government has got to find a way out of it to fix it if they want to make sure this doesn't drag them down. Amanda, how damaging was the testimony today to the prime minister? Well, I mean, I. It was certainly impactful, and I, I, partisan views aside, I can appreciate uh, the power of that testimony and certainly the problems that it now poses both for the government and for the PMO. That being said, I think there are a few things to consider. One is that there will likely be a lot of that testimony that's contested, and we saw that um, earlier last week when Gerald Butts resigned from his position as principal secretary, uh, categorically denied any allegation of pressure, and was looking to have the opportunity to defend his own reputation and integrity. So you can expect that one shoe has dropped, but other shoes will continue to drop as other people have things to say about it. Um, I think that there are also a few things, a few questions that simply weren't answered. And part of that was governed by uh, the Order and Council and some of the parameters around it. But some questions, especially from the Liberal Committee members, around why she didn't resign earlier, why that resignation came after what was perceived by some to be a demotion, um, what was the motivation behind the resignation and when it happened and why didn't she speak to the prime minister from that September date and the months that followed three months that followed in order to air some of these grievances so I think those are among some of the questions that will be asked in the coming days Connie what did you think well, I mean, I think that it's really raised a whole host of other questions uh, about, uh, you know, Jody Wilson-Raybould and her future, uh, you know, um, and what her plans are. Uh, and also, again, obviously, uh, you know, serious concerns are being uh, raised again about uh, this government's commitment to reconciliation. Uh, I think that it's fair to say she's receiving a lot of support from Indigenous leaders across the country. Um, this is, you know, something that, you know, I think it was maybe people were looking to speak or to get answers about her motivations um, and her integrity and I think that she really rooted a lot of that in her culture and in her experience as an indigenous person you know she talked about the teachings of her grandparents and her parents in her community coming from a long line of matriarchs uh, and as a truth teller in accordance with the laws and traditions of our big house uh, you know I think that that you know I'm really interested to see how this is going to keep impacting uh, you know, questions not just about SNC-Lavalin and this controversy, but this government's, uh, you know, most important relationship, as they've said, uh, with Indigenous people. And I'll remind our viewers that you're watching, of course, an extended edition of Power in Politics. We will be going live to Andrew Scheer, who's scheduled to speak soon. Uh, Jagmeet Singh is going to speak as well. And then the Prime Minister is set to address reporters at around 8 o'clock Eastern this evening. Kathleen, some of the most interesting details that came out today that I didn't think we knew before was, for example, um, Jody Wilson-Raybould's interpretation of why it became inappropriate and specifically implicating the prime minister in that mm -hmm. in that conversation in uh, in September when when she says he brought up the fact that there was a Quebec election Correct. and that he was an MP from Quebec and she delineated, delineated I'm sorry very clearly that that was a red line for her yeah it was a red line and she repeatedly said that that those kind of interventions again with the finance minister were inappropriate and she kept on telling the prime minister and others no and they they kept not not taking no for an answer and what we saw today from her testimony was not only her clarity, her composure, her capacity to deal with four hours of questions. Mm -hmm. We saw courage. We saw someone who was credible. That that and the thing is the Prime Minister now, in his statement at 8 o'clock, he's going to have to compete with that. And uh, what we saw, I saw a person today who I could believe. Mm -hmm. um, she was of sound mind. She took notes. She was She's very clear on that at the very beginning, clear. too. I have, she has a clear memory, she said, clear memory. and I took copious notes. I took copious notes. notes. She detailed the 10 phone calls, the other meetings. She she has she has texts with her chief of staff. It's, it's, it's clear now that the Prime Minister is likely going to have to testify. It's clear now the gag order on the, on the latter half 
staff, uh, um, her time between the shuffle and um, her resignation needs to be left. And it's clear that the Prime Minister's staff, all 10 or so that she named from, uh, will have to actually, in terms of that executive leadership function, will have to also testify. I, f I, I found it fascinating, Chris, and uh, I don't know if you agree, but the, uh, the big question I was left at was that time after she was Attorney General. Because mm -hmm. it did seem like there were, to Amanda's point, questions still about, okay, she says she took the Prime Minister at his word on January 7th when she was called it by him and said, I'm moving you to Veterans Affairs. She asked, does this have to do with SNC and a decision I didn't take? And he said no. Gerald Butts also said no to the same question. She said at the time she took him at his word, but then she she still resigned about a month later. And, and she, won't, she, she won't say anything about that, and she didn't during the committee, because she said that the, the privilege that was waived did not extend to that time. Well, uh, the privilege doesn't apply to the Prime Minister. He can say what he wants now. And I think, uh, as Kathleen has indicated, uh, after all of the explanations he's tried to give to this, he has stepped very carefully around attacking her or her credibility. Uh, I don't know how he doesn't respond directly to what she says by calling it either untrue uh, or by saying her memory Sorry. is not I good. apologize. I have to cut you off. Uh, Andrew Scheer, leader of the Conservative Party, is up at the mic. Let's take a listen in. Good evening, everyone. Justin Trudeau simply cannot continue to govern this country now that Canadians know what he has done. And that is why I am calling on Mr. Trudeau to do the right thing and to resign. Further, the RCMP must immediately open an investigation, if it has not already done so, into the numerous examples of obstruction of justice the former Attorney General detailed in her testimony. The testimony Canadians have just heard from the former Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould tells the story of a Prime Minister who has lost the moral authority to govern. A Prime Minister who allows his partisan political motivations to overrule his duty to uphold the rule of law. A Prime Minister who doesn't know where the Liberal Party ends and where the Government of Canada begins. And a Prime Minister who has allowed a systemic culture of corruption to take root in his office and those of his most senior cabinet and public service colleagues. Like many of you, I listened carefully to the testimony of the former Attorney General. And like you, I was sickened and appalled by her story of inappropriate and frankly bordering on illegal pressure brought to bear on her by the highest officials of Justin Trudeau's government. All to let a liberal connected corporation off the hook on serious corruption charges. Before Ms. Wilson Raybould's testimony, Canadians knew Justin Trudeau had engineered an unwanted, sustained, and coordinated attempt to get Ms. Wilson Raybould to change her mind and to stop the criminal trial of SNC Lavalin. Today, thanks to Ms. Wilson Raybould's testimony, we now know just how intense those efforts were. Ten meetings. 10 phone calls involving 11 senior government officials relentlessly targeting Ms. Wilson-Raybould over a four-month period with the sole objective of bullying her into bending the law to benefit a well-connected corporation. The details are as shocking as they are corrupt. Multiple veiled threats to her job if she didn't bow to their demands. Urgings to consider the consequences on election results and shareholder value above judicial due process. And reminders from Justin Trudeau to his Attorney General about his own electoral prospects should she allow SNC-Lavalin's trial to proceed. As Ms. Wilson-Raybould has so clearly articulated, the people Canadians entrusted to protect the integrity of our very nation were instead only protecting themselves and their friends. Let me close by saying that we have entered the final stages of Mr. Trudeau's government. He can no longer, and in good standing, with a clear conscience, lead this nation. As we enter a critical budget debate and with other pressing matters of public interest in need of action, Mr. Trudeau's cabinet must now find a way forward without him, and I urge them to do so. They have a duty to govern this nation, not help a disgraced Prime Minister hang on to power. But my message tonight is this. It shouldn't be this way in Canada. 
And it doesn't have to be this way in Canada. We should be a country where all are equal under the law, where nobody, regardless of wealth, status, or political connections, is above the law. And I believe we can be that country again. So you would not give me Justin Trudeau ne peut simplement pas continuer Justin de dominer Trudeau cette grande nation can simply not continue to lead this great nation now that Canadians know what he has done. That's why I am calling on Justin Trudeau to resign. Also, the RCMP must immediately launch an investigation, if it hasn't already done so, into the many uh, examples of uh, obstruction of justice that the former Attorney General basically detailed in her testimony. The testimony we just heard from the former Attorney General, Jody Wilson Raybould, told us about a prime minister who has lost the moral authority to govern, a prime minister who let his political and partisan motivations go before his duty to uphold the law, a prime minister who does not know where the Liberal Party ends and where the government of Canada starts and a prime minister who allowed a culture of systemic corruption take root in his office and those of his uh, ministers and uh, in the public service. Like many of you, I listened attentively to the former Attorney General's testimony, and like you, I was concerned by her story of inappropriate pressure and especially under the illegal pressure exercised on, against her by the highest officials of the Trudeau government. All this to allow a construction company tied to the Liberals to be led off the hook in a corruption matter. Before the testimony of uh, J Jude uh, Wilson-Raybould, Canadians knew that there would be an attempted and sustained attempt to bring Ms. Judy Wilson-Raybould to cave in and uh, end any pr criminal prosecution of uh, SNC-Lavalin. Today, thanks to Ms. Wilson-Raybould's uh, uh, testimony, we know to what extent those efforts were intense. Ten meetings and ten phone calls involving 11 members and senior officials of the government. This was unrelenting over a four-month period with the sole purpose of persuading her to change the law to, to benefit a well-connected corporation. The details are as shopping, as shocking as uh, the, the corruption is deep. Veiled attempts that she would suffer if she didn't uh, yield to their demands and uh, talk about electoral uh, consequences and the, sh the, the consequences for share values and Mr. Trudeau's uh, uh, urgings to Ms. Uh, Wilson Raybould about her on electoral prospects. As Ms. Wilson Raybould explained so well, the people that we entrusted to uphold the integrity of our country were simply looking after themselves. Please allow me to end by saying that we have now entered the last stages of the Justin Trudeau government. In all conscience, he can no longer lead this great nation. As we enter a budget debate that is critical, and as other key inter public interest questions have to be resolved, Mr. Trudeau's cabinet must now find a way out without Mr. Trudeau. I urge them to do so. They have the duty to govern this country and not to help a disgraced prime minister stay in power. But my message tonight is the following. We should live in a country where we are all equal under the law, and I believe that we can be that country again. Thank you very much. Aren't you going too far by us calling on Mr. Trudeau to resign?
What did he do that was so bad that you're asking the Prime Minister to step down? Well, because Ms. wilson Rebo's testimony tonight confirmed that a coordinated campaign and a constant and inappropriate campaign was launched to pressure her to change a decision and to interfere in a criminal uh, case. That is unacceptable, and it tarnishes the independence of our ju judicial system. You say, it was, you say it was bordering on illegal. Do you think it was illegal? When you look at what the law states about the impropriety of interfering and putting pressure on the Attorney General, uh, I believe there are certainly grounds there for a criminal investigation, and that's why I'm also calling on the RCMP to launch an investigation. What about Michael Warnick? Is many people in Quebec think it's entirely appropriate to press to save SNC-Lavalin jobs and save those corporate headquarters. The corruption charges aside, where does the Conservative Party of Canada stand on whether it's appropriate to extend a DPA now to SNC-Lavalin? It's, it's never appropriate to interfere in a criminal process. It's never appropriate to put pressure to try to convince an Attorney General who has already taken a decision on a matter to overturn a decision of an independent public prosecutor. And I am confident that Quebecers do not want to be used as an excuse for Justin Trudeau's corruption. C'est important de savoir que c'est jamais and to understand that it is never acceptable to interfere in a criminal case and to apply pressure on the attorney, uh, on the attorney to general to try to overturn a decision. And I am sure that Quebecers don't want to get involved in Justin Trudeau's corruption. Where exactly do you see corruption in the SNC-Lavalin case? And uh, how is the Liberal government con uh, corrupt? Well, it's really clear. It is clear that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, his, his key advisors, applied pressure by not taking no for an answer. And they use political excuses to justify their actions. That is absolutely corruption. To interfere in a criminal case and to try to undermine our in the independence of our, our justice system. To me, that is clearly corruption. What kind of difference do you think the Prime Minister... didn't just implicate the Prime Minister. She also implicated his chief bureaucrat. So what should happen to him? What should happen to Michael Warner? Uh, he should resign as well. On n'a pas encore entendu tous les acteurs dans cette crise. Le premier ministre, sa chef de cabinet, pourquoi demander sa démission? We haven't heard all the actors in this uh, case. The, the uh, ch uh, chief of staff of the prime minister. So why ask for the prime minister to resign now? Well. Uh, Mr. Trudeau, over three weeks, tried to hide the truth. Ms. wilson Raybould tried to expose the truth. It is clear that Mr. Trudeau is, is, uh, told things that were not true. He said initially that there was that all the allegations were false. She said Ms. wilson Raybould had never expressed her concerns to him. And now we know that that is false. So he breached the trust that Canadians had in him. It's very clear that Justin Trudeau and his chief advisors have been doing everything they can from the moment these allegations were brought to light to hide the truth. And Ms. wilson Rabel has done everything she can to expose the truth. Is this worth a non-confidence motion or an early election? Well, at this point, we're calling on, the just, on Justin Trudeau to do the right thing and to resign. He has broken trust with Canadians. He has been proven that what he has said is not true. And he needs to step aside. The Prime Minister has said that he did not direct her even today in her testimony, Ms. wilson Raybould said that he did not direct her and no one else did. So in the Prime Minister's mind, he's done nothing wrong. The PMO has done nothing wrong. It's quite clear, Ms. wilson Raybould said, that when the clerk of the Privy Council, when Gerald Butts, when Katie Telford was speaking to her, that she believed that, that was coming directly from the Prime Minister, that they were speaking for Justin Trudeau. And again, I go back to the fact that from the beginning, Justin Trudeau has tried to fool Canadians into believing that there was nothing to see here, that all the allegations were false, and that Ms. wilson Raybould should have brought those concerns to him. 
clearly she did clearly he has said things that we know now to be false he has broken trust with canadians and he needs to step aside but if he this doesn't resign and just waits for it to blow over might it blow over i don't believe canadians will accept a prime minister staying in office who has done this much damage to our independent rule of law we need to be very very concerned about the implications of this this is not Canada. You don't get to pick up the phone and use your power as Prime Minister of this country to get a deal for your well-connected friends. You don't get to fire someone who has stood up to you and has refused to bow to your political pressure and then put someone in place who will do whatever you want when it comes to our independent rule of law. We have to fight very, very forcefully to save our independence in our justice system. Ms. Wilson, she named it, she said it was 11 people in pressure. You said Michael Warnick should resign as well. Should all 11 resign? What do you think they should do? You know, I, I believe that there is more. there are more details to come out for sure. I believe we're starting tonight with calling for Justin Trudeau to do the right thing. He has been caught out saying things that simply aren't true. We now know that there is a, co a coordinated, sustained and unwanted campaign of pressure to try to bully Ms. Wilson-Raybould into overturning her decision and intervening and overturning an independent decision of a Crown prosecutor. That is unacceptable. That can never be allowed to happen in Canada. But are well, you to suggesting... follow up on that, though, there are important people. There's the Chief of Staff, as you mentioned today, the Finance Minister, the Finance Minister's Chief of Staff, a lot of senior people. So what should happen to them? Well, it's, it's clear that this scandal goes deep into this Liberal Party. This is a Liberal Party scandal. There were clearly many people involved at the highest levels in this government. This cloud of scandal, this taint of corruption will certainly cast a pall over many people in this government. We're starting tonight with calling on Justin Trudeau to lead by example and to step aside during these the, the, the clarify, subsequent I mean, just, investigations. Just to clarify, are you suggesting Mr. Lebedi was just put there to do whatever the Prime Minister wants? I point to Ms. Wilson-Raybould's own testimony where she indicated that her former Chief of Staff, who remained as Chief of Staff for Mr. Lermetti, was informed that he would be, uh, he would be briefed on the SNC-Lavalin uh, affair and that he would be made aware of the Prime Minister's expe expectations. So yeah, I, uh, I, I certainly well, believe that there are, uh, there are reasonable grounds to uh, believe that he was, uh, he, he was, that they were expecting a decision. I do point out that Mr. Lametti in the House of Commons denied that there were, any ever, that there were ever any communications about the SNC-Lavalin affair before he was named Attorney General or soon after. We now know that that is false well, as well. The we'll On the RCMP, you say that they should investigate. What precisely do you want the RCMP to look into? What is the problem to be analyzed? Well, there is a section of the criminal code on uh, uh, the attorney general uh, interfering. To me, it's clear that there is a basis for a criminal investigation based on Ms. Jo Wilson Raybould's testimony. Uh, obviously, uh, every, every political party is always concerned with. Uh, uh, with protecting jobs and ensuring that uh, uh, that people aren't unduly affected but based on the actions of others. However, what we're talking about here is the independence of our rule of law and the and and maintaining that separation between powerful politicians and interfering in court proceedings. None of us in any province in this country want to live in a country where elected officials, where powerful politicians can change court outcomes based on political considerations. That is something that we all have a responsibility to guard very forcefully against. You Thank you very much. Why do you want the RCMP to investigate in English, please? Uh, clearly, there are sections of the criminal code that speak to interference with the Attorney General in the conduct of her duties. Um, Ms. Wilson-Raybould's uh, testimony this evening clearly spoke to, uh, to enough of a base for a criminal investigation based on uh, what, uh, what she indicates happened. Et en français, pour le, le, le question pour les emplois, uh, c'est clair, c'est clair que uh, chaque parti politique veut trouver les solutions pour, et, et, et sont inquiétés par, uh, pour les travailleurs et, et on veut uh, regarder ces, cette situation. Mais, Chacun, euh, il n'y a aucun Canadien qui veut vivre dans un pays où les politiciens très, très puissants peuvent lever le téléphone et ingérer dans une poursuite criminelle. Et on doit être très, très, très euh, inquiété de le fait que ça, c'est que Justin Trudeau a fait. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much.
That was Conservative Party leader Andrew Scheer calling on the Prime Minister to resign. He says that the Prime Minister has lost the moral authority to govern. He's also calling for an RCMP investigation. His uh, press conference follows about four hours of testimony before the Justice Committee by Jody Wilson-Raybould, the former Justice Minister and Attorney General, in which she corroborated a lot of the allegations that first came to light in the Globe and Mail back in early February. You'll see two boxes on your screen right there. The first is uh, the shot that Andrew Scheer was just in, and that is where we're expected to hear from NDP leader Jugmeet Singh any moment. And in about 10 minutes time, 10 to 15 minutes time, in that other little box in the corner of your screen, we're expecting to hear from the Prime Minister. Let's listen in to Mr. Singh. Just heard today was explosive testimony. This was unprecedented. I believe Ms. Wilson-Raybould. If anyone heard her testimony, they would believe her as a credible witness who provided insightful, thoughtful, measured comments. The comments all point to the fact that the Prime Minister and his office were disregarding the law and willing to politically interfere in the prosecution of executives for a massive, powerful corporation. This all points to a government and a Liberal government and Mr. Trudeau, the Prime Minister, were more interested in helping their powerful friends than they're helping everyday Canadians who are struggling with housing, the cost of medication, the cost of living. This is unprecedented testimony that bolsters our argument and our call for a public inquiry. At this point, Canadians demand some answers to the questions that they have, and the only way to get to the bottom of this is a public inquiry that would have independence to assess the truth. So right now, it is so clear, given Ms. Wilson-Raybould's testimony, it was credible, and her testimony was explosive. She was a credible witness, and right now, it is so clear that the Liberal government, the Prime Minister and his office are involved in this testimony in terms of uh, political interference and uh, that uh, they were also ready to break the law. Right now, it shows that this uh, Liberal government and this Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, were more interested in helping their friends than helping ordinary Canadians. Right now, that is why we're doing what we, we already asked for, and we ask again that we need a national investigation. Does the Prime Minister have to resign? Uh, maybe, he, maybe he might need to. But what we need to do is get to the truth, and that's what a public inquiry will do. This is really cutting to the heart of our democracy. This is cutting to the heart of the question. You know, our government should be serving the best interests of people, of everyday Canadians, not their, their well-connected, powerful friends, and maybe we'll get there. But what we need to do is get a public inquiry to get to the bottom of it. Just one follow-up. Just one follow-up. Do you think follow -up. now the Prime Minister should be able to stay where he is? Andrew Scheer was just up saying that the Prime Minister cannot survive <clears throat> this, that he needs to step down immediately. This is the, what we heard today is, is explosive. It is incredibly uh, damaging. This is, this is shaking us all to hear what we heard today. It is shaking us all. And I, that's why more than ever, our call for the public inquiry is so important. He may need to resign because of this, but that's why our call for a public inquiry will get to the bottom, get to the heart of this, provide the in information that we need to make that determination. But at this point, yes, maybe. But well, that's why we're calling for a public inquiry. So today you're not going as far as calling on the Prime Minister to resign. That is true. Today, what we're asking for is a national uh, public inquiry because we need to get to the bottom of the truth. Canadians need to know the truth. Because it seems to us right now that this Liberal government and the Prime Minister want to make sure they help their friends rather than help everyday Canadians. So we need a national public inquiry. Why not call on him to resign? Because you said he's no, long, he's no longer, he lacks the legitimacy to, to, to continue? Well, maybe we'll do that, but it's so clear we need a public investigation to get to the truth. But right now, we need a, a national investigation to get to the truth. Obstruction of justice. Interference. Everything should be on the table. Absolutely, a criminal investigation is on the table. That's why before we called for an ethics commissioner investigation, that investigation is absolutely important. That is ongoing. We called for the, the work that's being done here at the Justice Committee. We're asking for a public inquiry. This is so serious. 
that it requires every tool in our toolbox to get to the truth because Canadians are left really reeling and shocked by the fact that this government is more interested, this Liberal government is more interested in helping their friends and willing to break the law, interfere politically from the allegation that we just heard, rather than helping families that are struggling. This is, this is damaging, damning stuff. So no, Mr. Singh, is there an argument to be made at all about the jobs at SNC-Lavalin? At this point, this is not about the jobs. Uh, right now, this is about a Prime Minister and a Prime Minister's office that is prepared to break the law that is prepared to politically interfere without any qualms about doing so. And it shows very clearly that this Liberal government and the Prime Minister are more interested in helping the powerful, well-connected friends they have. Friends, mind you, that donated massive donations illegally to the party. So that's what's at stake right now, is looking at the core of our government and whether or not this government is in any capacity able to defend the interests of people when all it looks like they're willing to do and prepared to do is help the powerful, well-connected. Well, you keep, talk, you keep talking about powerful, connected uh, friends. What about the 9,000 Canadians in Montreal? You're trying to get elected, uh, to get your MPs elected in Quebec. What do you tell those 9,000 employees who could lose their jobs? Well, all Canadians and all Quebecers want a just society. But right now, we have a prime minister and his office where their priority is to break the law and to uh, involve themselves in political interference to help their friends. It's indeed, uh, it strikes at the heart of our democracy. Well, they weren't out to help their friends. They were helping the 9,000 workers. Well, what we heard from Ms. wilson Raybo's testimony is, the question was, are we going to be re-elected? These were, quest these were political, partisan questions. There weren't questions about the common good. What we heard today were self-interest questions. So it was their own interest and the party, the interest of their Liberal Party. It wasn't, they weren't worried about uh, ordinary Canadians and workers. What we heard today was clearly partisan and it was unbelievable and so disappointing. Last week said right it was uh, nothing inappropriate was done. It was all of a board. Prime Minister says the same thing. So what are Canadians to believe, like when they see Wernick and when they see Jody Wilson-Raybould? Well, when we heard the testimony of Mr. Wernick and you compare that to the testimony of Madam Wilson-Raybould, she was a credible, thoughtful, fair witness, did, re responded in very measured comments and laid out in very great detail, not one or two incidents, but a systemic, a systemic approach to political interference and a brazen approach to the law that is, that is very deeply concerning. And at this point, we, we want to get to the bottom of whether this government is working in the interests of Canadians because it looks like they're just focused on doing whatever it takes to help out uh, well-connected, powerful folks, executives at the top, for their own political future. I had a question right here. Saying, we're, we're not just talking about the Prime Minister and, and the Chief of the, or sorry, the Clerk of the Privy Council here. We're, we're talking about 11 individuals that she named. She went into Absolutely. this committee with a laundry list of names. What do you think should happen to all those people on that list? Well, we should hear from them at the Justice Committee. We need to hear from each and every one of them at the Justice Committee. Um, and the public inquiry will get to the bottom of this. That's why the public inquiry is so important. It has independence. It's not limited the way our committee is, has some limitations given the, the liberal members who are, who are the majority and they just voted down a motion that you just all saw right now that they're not willing to, to do the work that's necessary. Mm -hmm. We've got great members. Marie Rankin, our, our member there, is holding it down. But we need to uh, push further and that's why the public inquiry is so important. We need to hear from each of these witnesses. We need to put pressure on the government to assure that each of those witnesses called to the Justice Committee. We can ask questions of them because this is cutting to the core of the purpose of government, which is to serve the people, not to serve the powerful and the, the well-connected. Is more credible than, uh, than the head of the civil service, which is supposed to be nonpartisan, uh, you know, not pick sides, non unbiased? I heard the partisan. Sorry, you, you find her, her testimony more credible than Michael Warnick's? Well, if you look at the, the testimony of uh, Ms. Uh, Wilson-Raybould, just on an empirical level, thoughtful, measured, uh, no exaggerations. She wouldn't go further than what she was able to say. It was very thoughtful testimony. At the end of the day, it, this is cutting to the heart of, of the, this government's credibility. Uh, and Mr. Wernick needs to be brought to, again to the, to the Justice Committee to answer for all the detailed evidence that she provided. At the end of the day, this is, this is very clear. 
There, we have a prime minister in the prime minister's office that seems fully single-mindedly focused on their own self-interest, willing to break the law, willing to interfere politically with the important job of the attorney general, which is supposed to be a nonpartisan uh, member of the, of, the, of the government that's supposed to work towards maintaining the respect and the reputation of the administration of justice. All of that has been called into question in terms of this government's priorities. This is very, very serious. But why do you believe uh, Ms. Wilson-Raybould more than you believe Mr. Wernick? Well, it's in the details. The details of uh, Ms. Wilson-Raybould's uh, testimony. It was incredible. She had notes, she had details, and uh, her opening statement was very detailed with uh, lots of examples of what was happening. It's totally different. If you, when you listen to Mr. Wernick's uh, testimony, well, the two were so different. So there is uh, no partisanship. Definitely, it was so clear. And it concerns me uh, extremely. If you look at the testimony between Mr. Wernick and Madam Wilson-Raybould, Madam Wilson-Raybould's testimony was filled with incredible amounts of detail, was uh, very measured. There was no exaggeration, and her declaration and her statement, which you can all refer to, has incredible amounts of information included in it. Comparing that to Mr. Wernick, there is no comparison. But you said he, you were asked if he, you felt he was part of Oh, yes. Uh, Mr. Wernick's uh, comments really call into question his, his lack of partisanship. Uh, from what we've heard, it looks like he was operating on behalf of the prime minister directly um, with veiled threats. Mm -hmm. This is deeply concerning. This is not how we expect our government to be working. Uh, this is why we need to get to the bottom of it. This is why we need... Yeah, Mr. Wernick as well. That's why the public inquiry is so important. That's why we need to recall him to the but Justice but Committee. you're saying he's partisan and he's not supposed to be partisan. You're saying he's acting under the orders of the Prime Minister. So my question is, if he's not doing his job, should he resign? That's a pretty clear it, it, No, it's, it's a fair question. And, and what I want to do is I want to get to the bottom of this. So I think he needs to be brought back to the Justice Committee and challenged. We've got now very strong evidence that was presented today, and he should be challenged with that evidence, and we need to see what his response is to that. Given the responses to those questions, yes, that might be the next step. Uh, the public inquiry might find that many people need to resign. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we're calling for the public inquiry, and that's why we're calling for those witnesses to testify at the Justice Committee, and we want to see Mr. Wernick testify once again. I guess I could ask Mr. Rankin a question. Yes. Um, you were in the room today. Yes. Um, Ms. Wilson Raybould <clears throat> testified for and answered questions for more than three hours. Yes, she did. Um, the NDP and the Conservatives have been pretty consistent in calling for Ms. Wilson Raybould to appear before committee. Yes. Do you think she should come back, or were you satisfied with the uh, testimony she gave today? She provided, uh, as you know, a 35-minute statement, uh, a long statement. I'd like to have a chance to go through it more closely. I, as you know, asked for the text to which she referred in the emails. I want to look at those as well. I want to have a public inquiry, as Mr. Singh has said, so we can really cross-examine her in greater depth. The rules that we have, as you know, seven-minute rounds, two-minute round. it's just impossible to do what we need to do. Now that we know what we know, if we believe her, and I believe her, we must have a public inquiry. The Prime Minister must testify under oath, and if we need to bring her back, she made clear she'd be willing to do that. What do you make of the role of the Finance Minister's office in this? It was Ben Chin early on with a lot of questions, and then Finance, finance Minister directly. Uh, do you have questions for him? Yes, and that's exactly why we indicated there's a number of folks that were mentioned in the opening statement. We want all of those named individuals to come to the committee and testify. We need to have them under oath, asking, and we need to ask them questions. Um, more than ever, it really, again, as um, Mr. Rankin has just said, as we've called for previously, more than ever, the public inquiry, the argument, the case for the public inquiry has been made so strong and so clear at this moment, and that's why we're calling for that public inquiry. Merci. Merci. Thank you. That was NDP leader Jagmeet Singh stopping short of calling for Justin Trudeau to resign as the leader of the Conservative Party, Andrew Scheer, did, uh, but instead saying that this bolstered the NDP's case for holding uh, their call, sorry, for holding a public inquiry into everything that's just happened. Just to recap, you're watching a, an extended version of Power and Politics, and I'm Vashi Capellas. You're looking at the doors there. We're expecting the Prime Minister to address reporters any moment now. We're told that he will make a statement first before taking questions. 
He sure has a lot of questions, I'm sure, uh, to answer that will be asked, given what we've seen today, four hours of testimony, nearly four hours of testimony from the former Minister of Justice, Jody Wilson-Raybould. She corroborated a lot of the allegations, mo all of the allegations, in fact, that had co first come to light through the Globe and Mail's reporting in early February, uh, most specifically that she did feel that there was undue uh, persistent pressure on her from officials in many different offices, from the Prime Minister's office to the Clerk of the Privy Council's office to the um, to the Minister of Finances, Finances, Minister of Finances office, uh, to intervene in that criminal case against SNC Lavalin. As we wait for the Prime Minister, uh, I'm joined by the remaining members of the Power <laughs> Panel: Kathleen Monk, uh, Tim Powers, and Amanda Alvaro. Uh, Amanda, I'm going to start with you. Uh, so we have a call for the Prime Minister to resign from Andrew Scheer, mm -hmm. and a call for uh, a public inquiry uh, from the NDP. Do you think a public inquiry is necessary right now? Well, for, uh, first of all, I think the call for the resignation is ridiculous. I, I, even the protagonist in this play says that this is uh, a political issue, not a judicial one. So in the course of her testimony today, Jody Wilson-Raybould concretely oh. said this is about... Uh, sorry, can, it's okay. We're just watching the prime minister walk uh, up. As soon as he goes to the microphone, not, I'll, I'll start. Okay. That this was not illegal, that it was inappropriate. Okay, and so here, he, here he is. Well, sorry, we're going to cut right to Good evening, right everyone. It's a <laughs> great pleasure to be back <laughs> in Brebeuf this evening because it always brings back uh, very nice memories. And I'm happy to have shown my uh, old school to my daughter who's here with me tonight. First of all, congratulations and welcome to our newest Liberal Member of Parliament, Rachel Bendaya. Rachel has been part of our Liberal team for years now, and she'll be a huge asset for our team in this important election year. A strong voice and a community leader, I know Rachel will accomplish great things for the people of Outremont. Tout comme Rachel, Tout comme Rachel, like Rachel les bénévoles the volunteers aussi will also have a key role, role to jouer. play. La victoire Monday's, de uh, soir, uh, Monday evening's victory was thanks to you. Votre passion, thanks to your votre patience, your et votre hope, travail and acharné. your work on relentlessly. Et je veux vous remercier and I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart. If we're here tonight to celebrate, it's thanks to you, so thank you, and uh, congratulations. My friends, this has been a difficult few weeks, and it's been difficult because we've had internal disagreements. Before I briefly talk about today's committee testimony, I want to remind people about a few of the great things that we've accomplished together as a team on the justice file over the years. We introduced medical assistance in dying. We legalized and strictly regulated cannabis in order to better protect our kids. And we implemented progressive reforms around criminal justice and sentencing. Le travail acharné du ministère de la the Justice relentless work of the uh, Justice Department will continue under David the prudent uh, governance of David Lamatte. It was important for Jody Wilson-Raybould to speak openly at the Justice Committee today and I'm glad she had the chance to do so. I strongly maintain, as I have from the beginning, that I and my staff always acted appropriately and professionally. I therefore completely disagree with the former Attorney General's characterization of events. Our government will always focus on jobs and our economy. We, of course, had discussions about the potential loss of 9,000 jobs in communities across the country, including the possible impact on pensions. My job as Prime Minister has always been to stand up for Canadians and Canadian workers. I want to be absolutely clear here. The decision around SNC-Lavalin was Ms. Wilson-Raybould's and hers alone. I want to confirm this again for Canadians, as Ms. Wilson-Raybould herself confirmed today. This decision is the Attorney General's alone. Les emplois et notre économie seront toujours Jobs and our economy will always be key issues for our government. 
we obviously had discussions on the potential loss of 9,000 jobs in communities across Canada, including the potential impact on pensions. In my capacity as Prime Minister, it is my responsibility to always defend Canadian workers. But I want to be very clear on this point. The decision concerning SNC-Lavalin was Jody Wilson-Raybould and hers alone. I would like to state that again to Canadians, as Ms. Wilson-Raybould herself stated today. That decision is the Attorney General's to make. I continue to maintain, as I have done since the beginning, that myself and my staff, we've always acted appropriately and professionally. I am absolutely not in agreement with the conclusions drawn by the former Attorney General. As we govern and make decisions for the good of all Canadians, we will always act within the bounds of what is appropriate. There is an officer in Parliament whose entire function is to look into questions of this nature. So I welcome the investigation by the Ethics Commissioner to clear the air on this matter, and it's important that we trust him to do his job. While this process continues, my steadfast focus will remain on Canadians and on governing in the best interests of people across this country. When I was door knocking here in Outremont with Rachel, we heard from parents who want to ensure their kids have access to good jobs, seniors who want reliable, safe, and affordable housing, students who are counting on us to protect our environment for future generations. And ensemble, and together, with the people in this hall, we will continue the work and to work hard to achieve our goal that is building a better Canada for all Canadians. Thank you for being here tonight with us. I would now be happy to take your questions. Hi, Mr. Trudeau, Pierre-Olivier Zappa. You are live on uh, LCN tonight. My question to you is quite simple, Mr. Trudeau. Who should Canadians believe today? Should they believe the Prime Minister, who has been maintaining for weeks now that there was no political interference, that there was no inappropriate pressure, or should they believe Jody Wilson-Raybould, the former Attorney General, who has directly implicated you today, as well as members who are very close to your entourage. I continue to maintain, and I, as I have done from day one, that myself and my team, we've always acted appropriately and professionally. I am definitely not in agreement with the conclusions drawn by the former Attorney General. And we have an ethics commissioner who is investigating exactly into that question. And I support her in that step. And I'm confident in her results. Well, Mr. Trudeau, the leader of the opposition, Mr. Andrew Scheer, called for your resignation. He said you cannot continue to govern in all conscience. And I'm supporting from his speech. What do you say to Mr. Scheer? Canadians will have a a clear choice to make in a few months between a Liberal Party that will always stand up to defend jobs, to invest in our communities, to create a, 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 a economic growth and investing in the uh, middle class, and the party that is still the party of Stephen Harper with his old way of uh, doing things, that is to attack and divide and to give uh, benefits to the rich and uh, hoping for growth that never comes. We will be investing and focusing on Canadians and on building a better world for them. Catherine Kovacs of Radio Canada, Mr. Trudeau, Ms. Ray Bowles' uh, charges, this, uh, accusations this afternoon are very severe in terms of the interference from your office and uh, that of the Minister of Finance and the Privy Council office. In the face of all these uh, accusations, is, Mr. is Ms. Wilson Raybo still uh, welcome in the uh, cabinet? Well, within the Liberal Party. Well, I haven't listened to all her testimony, and I won't decide before I do that. If you had it to redo, would you do things the same way? 
where we will always be there to defend jobs, good jobs in Canada, and create more, and we will always defend our institutions, as well as the rule of law in Canada. That's what we've always done, and that's what we'll continue to do. Hi, Prime Minister Vanessa Lee with CTV. Um, the Conservatives are calling for your resignation, and we're wondering if you think you should resign and if you think anyone in the PMO or Cabinet should resign. Canadians uh, will have a very clear choice in a few months' time about who they want to be Prime Minister of this country and what party they want to, to uh, uh, form government uh, in the general election coming up in a few months. There will be a clear choice to be made between uh, the Liberal Party, this government that has always invested in Canadians, that has created uh, record economic growth, record low unemployment, has consistently stood up for Canadian jobs, cons consistently defended Canadian jobs while defending our institutions and the independence of our judiciary. And on the other hand, uh, there is a choice of the party that is still very much the party of Stephen Harper, that continues to attack, to divide, to play politics with big issues, and to consider that the best way to create economic growth is still to give advantages to the wealthiest. We disagree. That is why we have been working so hard over the past three years to invest in Canadians, to support Canadians, and we've succeeded in creating the economic growth that we've seen, and we will continue to do. And can Jody Wilson-Raybould stay in the Liberal caucus, and will you allow her to run in the next federal election as a Liberal? Uh, as you might imagine, I haven't yet had the opportunity to uh, review her entire testimony. I will do that before making any further decisions. Hi, Alison Northcott with CBC. Um, you, Jody Wilson-Raybould referenced a specific meeting with you on September 17th. She, she talked about uh, feeling pressure to give SNC a remediation agreement, and she says that you referenced the uh, Quebec election and the fact that you were a Quebec MP. Uh, is that version of events accurate? My job as Prime Minister is to stand up for jobs right across the country, to make sure that we're creating good jobs, that we're growing, good jo growing uh, more jobs, and that we're defending the jobs we already have. Uh, I have done that and will continue to do that right across the country. That is a fundamental role that Canadians expect of the Prime Minister, and it is something I will always do. So, and, and how do you defend the conduct of your staff, given that she says what she experienced was completely inappropriate? I strongly maintain, as I have from the beginning, that I and my staff always acted appropriately and professionally, and therefore I completely disagree with the characterization of the former Attorney General uh, about these events. Uh, Chris Reynolds, Canadian Press. Uh, the Attorney General, former Attorney General, indicated in her testimony that there was information uh, between the January shuffle and uh, her resignation from Cabinet that the Justice Committee would consider relevant. Uh, I'm curious why you didn't allow her to be free to, to tell that, that story. Two of the fundamental pillars of both our justice system and uh, our uh, system of government are uh, solicitor-client privilege and Cabinet confidentiality. We consider that this issue before the Justice Committee and indeed before the Conflict of Interest and Ethics Commissioner is of such importance that we took the unprecedented step of waiving solicitor-client privilege and cabinet confidentiality to allow the former Attorney General to address this matter expansively and in detail. And that is exactly what she was able to do tonight. Lastly, I'm curious if the interactions between the Privy Council clerk and Ms. Wilson-Raybould, if those were appropriate actions for the top civil servant to take uh, with, uh, with the Cabinet Minister? Uh, the civil service in this country, which uh, functions uh, non on a nonpartisan basis, uh, is always focused on the best interest of Canadians, which also includes making sure uh, we're standing up for jobs, protecting economic growth. Uh, that is something that the clerk and indeed all civil servants are very much focused on, uh, and that is entirely 
uh, what they do every day, which is focus on what is right for Canadians while defending our institutions. That is something that this government as a whole takes very seriously and always will. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. That was Prime Minister Justin Trudeau speaking to reporters uh, in Quebec. He's with his newly elected MP there in the riding of Outremont. Uh, he addressed, of course, the allegations that we heard coming from the former Justice Minister and Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould during nearly four hours of testimony before the Justice Committee today. He insisted that uh, nobody in his office or himself had ever acted inappropriately. Uh, he was also asked if Ms. Wilson-Raybould remains in caucus, and to that he said that he had not yet listened to all of her testimony. Testimony, and he'd like to do that before making a decision, uh, not just be remaining in caucus, but whether she can run under the Liberal banner in the next election. And he was also asked specifically about a, a, a point that Jody Wilson-Raybould made around a conversation they had, the two of them, in September, in which she alleges he brought up the fact, in the context of the SNC-Lavalin controversy, or, or a decision, prosecutorial decision, that uh, he was an MP in Quebec and that the Quebec election was coming up. She had delineated that as a clear line of inappropriate behavior. Uh, and he did not answer that question directly, but said that his government is standing up for jobs and will continue to stand up for jobs. We are back with the Power Panel. You're watching an extended version of Power and Politics. I'm Bashi Capellos. We've got Amanda, Kathleen, and Tim still standing. Yes. Uh, uh, Kathleen, I'll start with you. So Andrew Scheer calling for the Prime Minister to resign. Jagmeet Singh saying public inquiry. Uh, Justin Trudeau saying, I'm not going to resign. No need for a public inquiry. Mm -hmm. The ethics commissioner is looking into it. Well, let's just break it down for a bit. I, I think in terms of the opposition reaction, action, um, not just because I'm a new Democrat, but just in terms of room to grow. I think Shearer really did overreach in terms of coming out right off the bat saying he should resign. Um, to have the process continue, to have the public inquire, potentially even an investigation um, by the RCMP like Shear had suggested, but to go for the immediate resignation, he has no room. So I, I think that Jagmeet was actually the stronger uh, response tonight. Um, it was interesting to me uh, that, um, you know, in her testimony, Jody Wilson-Raybould was asked repeatedly whether she had confidence in the PM. Uh, and while she never said yes or no, she did say she could no longer sit at that cabinet table. And he equally tonight in his uh, in his uh, comments to the press basically wouldn't actually it's almost like a game of chicken is what I'm trying to say <laughs> it's like it's like he's not gonna she she mm -hmm. won't step down from caucus and mm -hmm. he hasn't committed to kicking her out but it seems like that's that's the tea leaves that's in the tea leaves uh, this may be the only unanimity you get on this network all night I actually <laughs> agree with Amanda and Kathleen that uh, Andrew Shearer overreach I think he's limited the moves he has in the future but that's not as important as everything else that's happened tonight that's a strategic thing they're going to have to work on you let yeah. a scandal develop if you believe yeah. it's a scandal and you harvest uh, the fruit that you see coming from that um, the prime minister has clearly decided he can win a battle of credibility I yeah. think his words were I completely disagree with yeah. uh, his former attorney general it's an interesting uh, battle plan I mean there's lots of a pol polling data that would suggest he still has retained popularity uh, and has more popular than his leadership peers, but I think Jody Wilson-Raybould continues to grow in popularity. Um, I think the Prime Minister didn't really help himself by sort of switching into campaign mode tonight. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about Stephen Harper and there'll be two clear visions. I think that was a bit glib and not helpful. I think people wanted to see a more a, a Prime Minister who was dealing seriously with the issue as opposed to trying to, to spin it into a campaign matter now and go in full campaign mode. Really fascinating, though, I think he's channeling or trying to a little bit of Jean Chrétien. And this goes back to the old Shawinigan Fountain story that was part of the sponsorship scandal. Well, Mr. Chrétien got in heat because he called the head of the Business Development Bank of Canada. He effectively said something like the Prime Minister just did. Look, part of my job is to create jobs. And I'm not going to apologize for doing that. <clears throat> it's not a bad argument, but with everything that Ms. Wilson-Raybould has now said, and the detailed chronology that she's put out there, I'm not sure this Prime Minister is going to have the same success that Mr. Kretchan did in mounting that argument and winning an election. And it was interesting, Amanda, because like I said in the, when I was introing or, or coming out of the uh, Prime Minister's uh, remarks, he was, I mean, the, the difference between the, what we had heard before and what we heard today was that there were specific comments made by Jody Wilson-Raybould that did implicate the Prime Minister. Like, she said that when he brought up Quebec, when he said he was an MP right. from Quebec, that that crossed the line for her, and he didn't directly address that. No, he didn't, but he was strong 
unwavering, unequivocal in his position that he was in total disagreement with components of her testimony, particularly around the fact that she had been pressured by himself or anyone from the PMO. So that strong categorical denial and contesting what she said was, I think, what's, what most of us um, on the liberal side anyways expected from him. I think the other thing, the big takeaway is, you know, he talked about two things. One, he he reiterated the fact that she confirmed in her testimony that he had said it was her decision to make a loan. And he talked about sort of the page that's been dropped from this storybook over and over again, that if there, if there were discussions that were had, and if she saw them as inappropriate and others saw them as appropriate, those discussions were about jobs. How critical she was this... Just to interrupt for a second, though, she mm. was pretty clear that she didn't find the discussion around jobs inappropriate, so. right? Mm. She, she said that's okay within a public policy context, that that's actually appropriate to talk about. She wasn't disputing exactly. that part of the argument. She said when she started hearing that this is about Quebec and that there's a Quebec election coming up and I'm an MP for Quebec, that that crossed over for her. Well, I think also what she was saying, though, was that she felt that continued conversations about deferred prosecution related to SNC-Lavalin after she had, quote-unquote, made her decision was what she deemed to be inappropriate. And the question, I guess, would be, is it appropriate to continue to have discussions? Remember, she wears two hats. She wears a cabinet hat. And with that cabinet hat on, you have to have discussions around things like jobs and considering um, a counsel or, or external counsel's advice. So the question is whether it was appropriate to continue to have discussions about something as important as thousands and thousands of Canadian jobs. Hey, one quick comment from each of you. I would break it down like this, if you were to write it, you know, in a quick cheat. It was Jody Wilson-Raybould says, no, really, no. JT to J J Jody Wilson-Raybould says, but politics. And, and then JT staff come in and they say, but really, we could work this out. We could write some op-eds. We could, we could make all, all the problems go away. It, it's not enough. Today we saw sausage making in detail, political sausage making in detail in the Justice Committee uh, room, and it was offensive in many ways. And, um, and I think that the person who comes out of this looking the best is Jody Wilson-Raybould. She looked courageous. She was clear. She was composed. She had the capacity to deal with all those questions. I think that's good. She's a really hard witness to Tim, go against. Yeah, yeah, Tim, final word to you. Yeah, I was going to say, has he contained caucus? That is a big worry for yeah. him. And the second thing with that is, when are we going to hear from Dave, uh, David Lametti? Uh, by all reports, Mr. Lametti is a very credible individual. So what was he asked to do, or has he been asked to do, taking on that role, given that it was suggested to Jody Wilson-Raybould, as she reported in her testimony, that a new Auditor General, a new Justice Minister, might look at this differently? Well, hey, I'd love to ask that question to Mr. Lametti, if he'll come on the show tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I have to sincerely thank all of you for sitting here for six hours with us and sticking it out. I, I truly, truly appreciate it. Thank you so much to Amanda Alvaro, Tim Powers, and Kathleen Monk. We're going to head back to the House of Commons because Justice Committee MPs, as we said, spent about four hours asking questions of Jody Wilson-Raybould. What happens now? Who will the committee call next to the witness stand? Randy Boissano is an Alberta Liberal MP on the Justice Committee. Lisa Wright is the deputy leader of the Conservative Party and justice critic as well. And Murray Rankin is the NDP's justice critic. All three of them join me now. Hi, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Patrick. Long day for everyone. Mr. Boissano, I'll start with you. Do you believe what you heard from Jody Wilson-Raybould today? Well, look, it was the 30, over 30 minute opening statement, uh, four hours of testimony almost after that. Uh, I admire and um, look, we've worked together for many years in caucus and I uh, respect and believe uh, her feelings on the matter. Does that mean that you think that the Prime Minister's office, people in the Prime Minister's office, the Prime Minister himself even, the Clerk of the Privy Council, members of the Finance Minister's office acted inappropriately? Not at all. I think it was very clear when I asked her a direct question. Had the Prime Minister, the Clerk, or any member of the Prime Minister's office ever directed her to seek a remediation agreement with SNC-Lavalin? And her categorical answer so, was no. So to you, the only inappropriate thing that could have been done was a clear direction. The 10 meetings, the 11 phone calls, the uh, what she described as uh, consistent and sustained effort. It's to seek political interference? It's not up to me. That's it's not the inappropriate? The, look, we've had witnesses come and talk to us. We've had uh, the clerk come and talk to us and very clearly state that the threshold, you go too far when you direct somebody. Everything inside that line is public policy, public interest conversation, discussions in the public interest. You've heard it said here today, and just the Prime Minister said it recently, we're talking about thousands and thousands of jobs and why should the innocent pensioners why should the innocent employees why should the innocent suppliers pay for the wrongdoings of a few corporate executives the attorney general 
is to keep her mind open in these matters all the way through, uh, and no decision in these types of matters is final. And so I think what so we her, heard today... So the Attorney General's decision is not final? Well, that's what the law says. And what we heard today was some conflicting testimony around when she said jobs were okay, but then one of my colleagues asked her the question about when somebody from finance came and talked to her, that wasn't okay. So there was inconsistencies in her own comments today. So you don't believe her? I believe that she feels, uh, I believe what she feels about the matter. Uh, Ms. Raitt, uh, do you feel that, um, that you got all the answers you were looking for today? Do you believe what Jody Wilson-Raybould said? Well, first of all, I believe what she said. I believe that she gave as much information as she could, given the restraints that the Prime Minister put on her in terms of not being able to speak about anything post her moving from Attorney General into Veterans Affairs and then her resignation from Cabinet. She did testify that there were things that would be relevant for the legal committee to hear, for the Justice Committee to hear, um, if she were released from those. So I uh, obviously, I think um, definitely the, this should be revisited in terms of whether or not um, we're going to have that wave so she can come in and give a full testimony. Uh, but what I just heard from my colleague, um, regarding his interpretation of the law is both incorrect and shameful because it's the attorney... It's neither of those things, Lisa. It's How the so? It's the because law. The, it is not the law, Randy, and I'm going to tell you why. Because the Attorney General of Canada should not have undue pressure, nor should, be, should she be approached once she has made a decision. Sir. And over and over and Sir. over again, she told them, I've made my decision and it's done. And i got to tell you, there are parts of the criminal code that deal exactly with this situation that we have before us and the RCMP need to look into it and the Prime Minister who is at the heart, the centre and the brain of this operation has to step down. From a political perspective, Mr. Rankin, I mean, Ms. Wilson-Raybould was asked if she felt like the pressure that she fell under, that she alleges she fell under, constituted a breach of the criminal code. She didn't, she said it didn't, but she did say very clearly that it was inappropriate. What's the, what's the bar here? How should Canadians be judging this? Clearly, she felt pressured. There's no question about that. I think a reasonable person looking at all the phone calls, all the meetings, the browbeating, the, the fact that the people who work for the Prime Minister at the highest levels took her out and tried to change her mind, tell us in their, as an entirety that there has been an effort to interfere politically with the independent role an Attorney General must play. And in a democracy, I cannot overemphasize the importance of this. This is devastating, what's happened tonight. I hope Canadians understand that the line was clearly, clearly crossed. And we don't live in a banana republic. We live with rule of law. And that was her decision to make. And the Prime Minister wouldn't take no for an answer. What part of no didn't they understand? Mr. Boissonneau, was it appropriate of the Prime Minister to raise the specter of the Quebec election and the fact that he is an MP from Quebec in a discussion on SNC? I think what we heard from Mr. Wernick's testimony and from the witnesses that we had on both Shawcross Doctrine and Remediation Agreements is it's entirely appropriate to have robust conversations about a matter that affects Canadian jobs, even when it, can, even when it pertains to a remediation agreement. What and does the Quebec election clear. have to do with that? I, I take your point on I, jobs. I wasn't in that conversation. What I can say is that she was very clear today that neither the Prime Minister nor the clerk directed her in any way to enter into a remediation agreement with SNC-Lavalin, and she put on the record today that the Prime Minister said very clearly, this is your call, you're the AG, you will decide. Well, actually, but actually, all the other to, people... actually, just to be clear, she, she didn't say that. She, no, said, that, she said that at the outset of that meeting, he brought it up, and she asked, are you trying to politically interfere here? And he and, said, and no, he said no, 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 no. He did exactly. not say this is your decision. Then he got, but he said, then then he got, he said bucks, and then he got Katie uh, Telford, and then he got everybody else to, to try to beat her on. Uh, uh, Mr. Boissonneau, should, should she remain in caucus? Well, look, that's a conversation that she will have with the Prime Minister. We're all committed to improving the lives of Canadians like we were when we came here in 2015. I've worked with Ms. Wilson-Raybould. I've stated that uh, clearly on this program and others. We've done lots of great work together, and I know she uh, is proud to serve the residents of Vancouver Granville. Mr. Ms. Raid, I'm sorry, um, the interpretation by your, your colleague, uh, Mr. Boissonneau, uh, appears to be that, that there was no inappropriate line cross because this doesn't go into, it, it, it's not illegal. Um, is, you know, I, I get back to the point of how are Canadians supposed to judge this? Is this just about being illegal or uh, is there something that shouldn't sit well with them? Well, first of all, the fact that we have conflicting testimony from the Clerk of the Privy Council, from the Prime Minister himself, from Mr. Lametti as well, with what the, justice, the former Justice Minister said today is worthy of investigation. 
right? That's what the secondly, ethics commissioner is for. Secondly, I would say this, that I think my colleagues are forgetting that there are rules against intimidating members of the judicial system. There are rules against continuously and consistently asking over and over and over again the same question that they've been told no about. And indeed, the minister herself, as she then was, indicated that she thought this was becoming an issue where it almost became the Saturday Night Massacre. Which she still didn't to. resign, to be fair. She still didn't resign. Well, did you, if you heard the testimony, and she was on your program, Vashi, I know that, Mary Ellen, uh, 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 She what she said is clear. She was the only person as the Attorney General who was there defending the rule of law and defending the decision. She also said that if she left, she thought that the decision would have been changed and that would have been the wrong thing. And the Justice Minister, former Justice Minister, said exactly the same thing today. We can get into the nitty and gritty of all this, but I'm going to tell you something. The Prime Minister has not leveled with Canadians. That's he not has, true. He has, he said the allegations were false. Clearly, yep. the allegations were not false. He's not leveled. He's trying to double talk his way out of it. The only way not we're going to get to the bottom of this is full witnesses, yep. public inquiry, and the Prime Minister should do the right thing and he should resign. Mr. Rankin, you want to jump in there? He has to testify under oath. We cannot leave it to the Justice Committee. It's a good start, but you know, we tried to get a waiver of the, of the solicitor client privilege so that when the, the time after January when she was removed as, as Attorney General, we can't talk about that. She told us many times we can't talk about it. I want to know why Jerry Butts resigned. I want to know what happened at those meetings subsequently. Mm -hmm. And I think we need a full inquiry where we can put people under the oath and the, under oath, and the Prime Minister has to be one of them, and we get, Canadians have to hear the, the whole story. We saw it in Gomery. In Quebec, we had the Charbonneau inquiry. Anybody who went through those knows those are truth-finding exercises. Surely after today's testimony, by a credible witness like Jody Wilson-Raybo, Canadians are going to be asking for answers. I just have a, uh, a minute left, but Mr. Boissonneau, why did MPs, Liberal MPs on the committee, not support the motion to extend the waiver so that we can hear answers to all those questions today that we were not able to get? It's very simple, Vashi. It's not our call to make. It's, we don't have that power. We the asked Justice Committee doesn't have that you power. You can't just request it. No, I mean, it's, it's asking of the Prime Minister, it. right? I understand it's not. that problem at all. I and the ethics that. commissioner. The Hold on, let's let Mr. Boissonneau finish. Yeah. The ethics commissioner is the only officer of parliament, an officer, an office that we created as a parliament to make sure that there would be an officer of parliament to look into these matters. You the Warnick, Mr. Warnick has said, the Prime Minister has said, and the team have said they will cooperate fully, and that's the right place for well, these I issues to be. So do you, Mr. Decided. Boisson, as an individual, think that that waiver should be extended? I understand that you're saying, okay, fine, it's not the committee's job, but all the motion was was to ask for the Prime we Minister. But do you think that waiver should, do you think there are questions well, that still need answered? I voted against answer? the motion, and I, it was very clear that this was a historic waiver. Ms. wilson Rabel came and gave four hours of testimony today. She was very fulsome in her testimony. That's what Canadians asked, and that's what they got today. Wow. Miss, Miss Raitt, oh. the one question that Mr. Shear didn't answer was whether or not your party supports the use of a DPA for SNC. Do, do you? Well, look, the Attorney General, the former Attorney General, was very clear today when she said it was inappropriate for it to be given. And as a result, they're not going to be able to get a waiver as such. These hypotheticals, Vashi, are just serving to muddy the waters on policy issues that really are not at the heart of this. The heart of this is the fact there was political interference to stop a criminal trial. That's the issue, and that's, that's the thing that we're talking about today. The rest of it, you're just following along the lines of what the Liberals want us to talk about, which is a policy issue, and it has nothing to do with the fact that they have breached their fundamental duty of trust to Canadians. Well, well to be fair, we've asked questions about the matter at hand. That is the one question wow. Mr. Shear hasn't answered. Jobs well, I've answered it for you now. I've answered it for you now. It's an Ill illegitimate question when it comes down to the fact we're talking about trust to Canadians. Mr. Rankin, does your party support the use of the DPA on SNC? You know, I have to say the same thing. I wasn't there. I don't know all the facts. I know what the section of the law says. I know that the Wilson, Jody wilson Raybo looked at those facts and concluded there wasn't one appropriate in these circumstances. Yep. This is about a corruption by a Canadian company in Libya, bribery and the like. And there's a rule that says you can't look at the economic interests in Canada when we're trying to get at corruption abroad. Now, I have to look at those factors as carefully as the Attorney General did, the former Attorney General, to answer that question. But I agree with Lisa Raitt. 
That's not what this is about. This is about what we saw as an attempt to pervert the course of justice. This is an attempt to change the rule of law principles that govern our democracy. Not true. This is important. 100% true. Not at all. Mr. Boissonneau, sure. why, not, why not, if you're so confident and if the government is so confident in, in uh, your actions here, why not open yourself up to a public inquiry at the very least? Mr. Wernick was very clear. 37 years in the federal public service. There's no upgrade with a public inquiry. The ethics commissioner has the same powers as a superior court judge. He can call for documents, texts, know, phones, but emails. Of what he's, Mr. Boissonneau, the Everybody scope of what he's looking into is wrong. Mr. Boissonneau, the scope, one second, Mr. Boissonneau, the scope of what he's looking into is very law? narrow. It's he can call for documents and issue a very clear uh, opinion on what happened. With a $500 fine. <laughs> With not even That's a fine, Vashi, the, the Prime Minister design. forgives himself once again. That's what they want, a big circle. Okay, this discussion, I'm sure, is going to continue for many days. I appreciate all of your time today very much. Thanks, thanks to Randy Boston, Lisa Raitt, and Murray Branken. And thanks to everyone, of course, who has been watching online. We've been streaming our conversation. The, this conversation will continue on CBC Network, but our live stream is coming to an end. Thank you again to all the viewers on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook who have stuck it out with us over the past several hours. And to our audience right here on CBC News Network, please stay right there because this special edition of Power and Politics will be back after a short break.